Saludos, conocedores de la imaginación. Yo soy Robert Meyer Burnett, conectando con ustedes, los miembros de la singularidad Post Geek, y especialmente con nuestros amigos del mundo hispanoparlante. Muy pronto debutará Latin X-Men, nuestro primer programa en español, con Alex Montano y Roberto Suárez. Y quién sabe, tal vez yo los visite de vez en cuando. Sintonízate pronto con Latin X-Men, aquí en la singularidad Post Geek. Imagination connoisseurs, once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch The Designing Hollywood Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, The Designing Hollywood Podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it? Especially if you love the movies. Our observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Varus Militude, your Sommelier of Sci-Fi and Cinema, your Evangelist of the Imagination, and of course, the yet undefined existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I'm coming to you with a special late night Rob observations. You know, I had a hankering to talk about horror But I'm doing it alone tonight. I'm doing it alone. I'm flying solo because my compatriot Dave Parker, we 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 would have done a midnight metal show. Maybe maybe tomorrow night we'll do a midnight metal. Uh, he is at he's seeing Danny Elfman at the Hollywood Bowl tonight. Danny Elfman uh, putting together an incredible show that's a combination of his days as the front man from Oingo Boingo, obviously, and uh, his film scores. And he's rocking the free world at 69, man. And I talked to somebody who was at the show last night. My friend Dan Schweiger also wrote about it, and he puts on a hell of a, a hell of a show. But I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about horror movies and the horror genre, and I wanted to come on and I was going to do a show about the state of horror uh, last week. I don't know why it got away from me. It didn't do it. But this weekend, you know, there's a lot of <coughs> excuse me. There's a lot of horror going on. A lot of horror happening. Horror at the box office, horror on Netflix with the release of Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, his anthology uh, festival of of films from great directors all working today, and um, I highly recommend it. I haven't watched all of them yet, but they are a lot of fun. Now, you know, they might not reach some of the highs you want, but they are still... Uh, very fun to watch. A lot of great stuff there. And it's from Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro. What's what's not to love? Of course, also on Netflix is Mike Flanagan comes back with The Midnight Club, which I haven't seen, but uh, people have liked it, although it's been very mixed still. Flanagan's been knocking it out of the park. My friend Connie Sang watched uh, Doctor Sleep the other day, and she really loved it. Apparently, she saw Martyrs on Friday, but I haven't heard from her. Maybe that was the end of her, which is too bad, because I am very fond of that girl. But maybe Martyrs killed her. One of my most eagerly awaited shows coming from Netflix is from the makers of Dark, uh, 1899. I've always been fond of horror at sea. Um, <laughs> movies like Ghost Ship from like 1980. Uh, this looks terrific. They, of course, made the amazing series Dark for Netflix. The creators, the German creators. What is lost will be found. This looks like it's got 
maybe even a satanic cult in it. So count me in. Of course, Smile, been killing it at the box office. What's not to love about that? Uh, worldwide, it's made like $180 million on a $17 million spend. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. Also, I would be remiss to remind you that a horror film that I actually produced and Dave Parker directed uh, is available, The Hills Run Red, on a packed to the gills Scream Factory Blu-ray. The movie's only 81 minutes. It's short and sweet. But we created over eight hours of special features on the making of the film. And if, if nothing else, if you ever wanted to know how a low-budget horror film was created, uh, this, is, this is your movie. And um, this movie even costs less than Barbarian, both shot in Bulgaria. So check that out. Also, for you physical media lovers, I would be remiss to not point out that Brian Singer's The Usual Suspects was released in a spectacular 4K package this week. And for the very first time, the special features that Carrie David, Dave Parker, and myself produced, which have been out of print since 2001, are available on that disc. Very proud of those special features. Um, you know, we had, to, we had to drive all over the place to get uh, all the suspects. So check that out. But... There was a really interesting article in the LA Times about horror that I did want to share with you, and um, that's how I wanted to start this out because you know it, it kind of it's talking about the state of horror today. By the way, I apologize for the granny glasses; maybe they're slightly horrific, but um, my my little readers, my cheap readers, I lost my pair. I had to order more. I mean, I get them by the box full. It, Amazon for like five bucks. Hey man, for an old man with one foot in the grave, I still feel pretty good physically. I'm all good. Everything works. But the eyesight. The eyesight, I don't know, maybe LASIK. Or maybe not. Who knows? Um, crazy. But didn't have my readers, so I'm borrowing Elizabeth's. <laughs> they kind of look witchy to me. <laughs> anyway, let's get into this article. So here it is. This was in the LA Times in their Company Town column. This was published on Friday. Uh, Ryan Fogner, Fogner wrote this, staff writer. Zach Krieger's movie Barbarian already had to be brought back from the dead once by film company New Regency after its financing fell apart before the start of production. So <clears throat> the actor-turned-director was categorically not expecting a theatrical release for his twisted horror film when he finished shooting it in Bulgaria. But, unbeknownst to him, executives from the Walt Disney Company, which releases New Regency films, had seen Barbarian at an early audience screening in Long Beach and thought it was right for the big screen. The 4.5 million movie about a young woman who finds herself double booked with a strange man at a rental home ended up opening at number one at the box office and eventually grossed more than 40 million in ticket sales. I thought, best case scenario, I could get it on some streaming platform that'll get enough eyeballs on it so that somebody will let me make another movie in the future, Krieger said. So the idea that it's had this incredible life as a theatrical movie, I honestly did not dare to dream anything like that. The film is another prime example of the horror genre's stellar run of success this year and why some see it as a rare bulwark against the takeover of Hollywood by superhero films and other tentpole action movies. Yes, horror has enjoyed a long loyal has, en has long enjoyed a loyal audience, but 2022 has proved an especially strong year commercially for chilling flicks, producing hits including Universal Pictures and Blumhouse's The Black Phone, directed by Scott Derrickson, 160 million in global box office sales on a very small spend. Nope from Jordan Peele, 171 million globally, and Paramount Pictures Scream at 140 million. More recently, Smile, which was planned as a straight to streaming, and in case you don't remember, there it is. More recently, Smile, which was planned as a straight to streaming release until Paramount saw test audiences' reaction to it, spent two weekends at number one in the US and Canada and has collected one 
169 million worldwide so far. Now, this is, of course, remember, on a $17 million spend from the studio and probably double that marketing. So let's say they paid double, $34 million total. And it's it's made $170 million worldwide. That is a nice, huge profit margin. That is a, a big percentage. The profit there is bigger than a lot of comic book movies. Now, in terms of spend to gross and how much everybody takes home. Because remember, uh, you get half that. The studios take half that, split that money with the, stu- with the theaters and all that. But still, let's call it, let's just say they they spent a lot of money marketing Smile, but let's, let's call it $34 million. A $34 million spend total on marketing and um, making the film. And then they make $169 million, call it $170 million, split that in half. That's still a very profitable movie. And uh, that's obviously, that's what you want. Now, what's really interesting is Blumhouse has been making money theatrically for a long time, knowing that horror films make money. M. Night Shyamalan, essentially in director jail, the sham hammer had hammered his career into non-existence. He made the visit for Blumhouse. Blumhouse basically has a formula uh, when they're not making known IPs like Halloween. And their formula used to be you'd make a movie for five million bucks or under. But if the movie turned out well, they use Universal to release it theatrically. A guy like Lee Wanell, who cre- co-created the so- Saw franchise, his second film after Upgrade was um, The Invisible Man. That movie was made for eight million bucks and made over a hundred million. Now, what's what's interesting about about this is horror has never been in a place where it wasn't profitable. It's just whether or not the studios were going to release things theatrically. When I was growing up, the last 40, well, since 1975, I mean, if you go back in, in the, since Texas Chainsaw, even before that, there's always been horror films that have been successful. Um, the real key, at least in my, in my estimation, the real key to make horror successful is it has to have some kind of a hook that people will will gravitate toward. And what's really interesting to me is I've read a lot of horror novels in my life. I love horror as a genre. I love horror films. But I would say that I'm kind of snobbish about my horror. I have a lot of friends that'll watch anything with slashers or some monsters. Or, and while I've watched a lot of crappy horror films in my life, I prefer horror films that are really smart. I mean, my favorite horror film of all time is The Exorcist. My second favorite horror movie of all time is Romero's Dawn of the Dead. I love movies like Rosemary's Baby, but I also love films like Don Coscarelli's Phantasm. I do like fantasy horror when it's good. I like elevated horror. Karen Kusama's The Invitation I really loved. Of course, I love Martyrs. Loved Inside. These are recent horror films. Uh, David Pryor's The Empty Man is quite interesting if you haven't seen that. And there's been a lot of other great horror films. I mean, stuff like The Ritual that was on Netflix. I like that. Ari Aster's Hereditary and um, Midsummer are kind of derivative for me. I liked him. But there's been a, a Panos Cosmatos, who, uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow, he did Mandy. He's got one of um, the Cabinet of Curiosities episodes that's quite good. I've always loved David Cronenberg's work. As a matter of fact, on NPR, Bravo NPR, they had two critics talking about horror, and one of them brought up Cronenberg's film *The Brood*, which I think is a masterpiece in terms of 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 what low budget horror can be. I prefer, you know, more heady literary type premises behind horror. Sure, give me *American Werewolf in London*, but also give me something that that there's got there's, there's meat on the bones. There's so much of Clive Barker besides *Hellraiser*. There's so much of Clive Barker's work. I wished had been turned into horror films. Like, much of the Books of Blood, Rawhead Rex, Midnight Me Train. Midnight Me Train's actually pretty good. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff in the Books of Blood I would love to have seen turned into um, film, into horror films, but but hasn't. So anyway, let me go, let me go, uh, let me go back into this, this article. Uh, A24's, by the way, A24, obviously, known for their elevated horror films. Uh, A24's heady brand of horror also contributed to the momentum with Ty West's X and its sequel, Pearl, and the Gen Z satire, Bodies, 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 
all of which earned critical acclaim while doing solid business relative to many other indie films. Oh, um, yes, you, you yes, Super Chats and the tip feature is open. So if you want to join the conversation, you can that way. I, yes, I don't know why. Was it not Was it not open? Did it not seem that? You can leave tips or you can Super Chat. It should be cool. Uh, so their heady brand of horror also contributed to the momentum with Ty West's X, its sequel Pearl, and the Gen Z satire Bodies, 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 all of which are on critical acclaim while doing solid business relative to many other indie films. The hot streak of high-quality and profitable scary movies has made audiences and studios take notice, especially as rom-coms, R-rated comedies, drama, and original action films, Easter Sunday, Bros, Ambulance, all duds, struggle to convince moviegoers that they must be seen on a big screen, especially without A-list talent. That's a shift that was happening well before the coronavirus outbreaks and was accelerated by the shutdowns. Horror has been a rare safe bet for studios as box office overall has struggled to recover from the pandemic. See Robert Cargill, who wrote the who co-wrote the screenplay for The Black Phone, based on Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, Joe Hill's short story, credits a confluence of factors that have been building for the last decade. Greater mainstream acceptance of horror, the Latino community embrace of the genre, critical recognition of movies like The Witch and It Follows, and the blockbuster success of movies such as Warner Brothers' It. All of that came to a head during the pandemic, when it was simply easier to make smaller-scale horror films than other genres. Horror is the last remaining genre that doesn't require IP to be successful, and it doesn't require big names or big budgets to be successful. By the way, and it never has. Cargill said, It circumvents all the problems that Hollywood usually has with making films and getting them in front of audiences. And we just get this moment where horror is dominating, and in a way, that's going to open the door for it to be a major force in the community. There are multiple explanations for horror's enduring appeal in theaters. One is that scares are best experienced in a dark room with minimal distractions and as a group. I wholeheartedly believe that. Horror stands out in relief compared to other genres as an experience that people crave, said Abjay Prakash, uh, Prakash, Prakash, president of Blumhouse. They want to have a communal experience, and the resilience of the genre has been borne out throughout through performance. Another is that horror films allow audience members to identify with the characters and think about how they would react in threatening circumstances. One of the movies that helped reopen theaters during the pandemic was A Quiet Place Part Two, a movie with a conceit that thrived on the experience of having a rapt, silent crowd. It allows a more participatory it allows a more participatory experience for the audience, said Mike Ireland, co-head of Paramount Motion Picture Group. Horror also lends itself to marketing ploys that play well on social media, with marketers seizing on the iconography from the films. For Paramount's marketing executives, it was obvious that the signature image and smile, a person grinning menacingly at the camera, should anchor the marketing campaign. To promote the film, they sent actors to baseball games to smile creepily in the stands in the hopes of going viral. The first attempt didn't catch on because it wasn't clear what was going on. The company adjusted its tactics and sent actors again, this time wearing yellow smile t-shirts. This kind of horror marketing, by the way, goes all the way back to people like William Castle and movies like The Tingler. Read up on what William Castle did. He was a showman, P.T. Barnum style and he knew how to sell his genre movies. It's great when you have a really well-done, fun horror movie, because it just allows you to be creative in the marketing of it, said Paramount Pictures marketing and distribution president Mark Weinstock. To risk-averse studios, horror movies are also appealing because they are typically made with small budgets. That, in turn, allows the filmmakers, particularly up-and-coming writers and directors, to take creative risks. Filmmakers have been more inclined to imbue their movies with metaphors about deep societal and personal issues while still entertaining moviegoers. Problems of grief and gaslighting, think of the woman in the haunted house whom nobody in town believes, have always been subtext in scary flicks. The original Godzilla was essentially a long metaphor for nuclear peril, and George Romero used zombies for social commentary. 
In recent years, those monstrous metaphor themes have increasingly come to the surface in horror films, as exemplified by films Ari Aster's Hereditary and Jennifer Kent's The Babadook, and perfected by Jordan Peele with Get Out and Us. If you want to make a touching film about a woman's struggle with mental illness, it's hard to get people in the theater, Cargill said. But if that struggle with mental illness takes the form of the Babadook and is trying to convince her to kill her own child, all of a sudden, now audiences are like, oh, I'll buy a ticket for that. <laughs> Horror has gone through boom and bust cycles before. There was the slasher wave of the late 70s and 80s, followed by a boom due to the popularity of home video that allowed movies to make back their budgets more easily. But that also resulted in a glut of cheap schlock that sent the genre into a slump until Scream brought back slashers in 1996, followed by the Blair Witch Project found footage trope and the torture porn explosion with Saw and Hostel. Cargill worries that studios will take the wrong lessons from the current horror renaissance and start simply churning out lousy movies just because they can feature a scary face on the poster, the way the black phone and smile did. My chief concern now is that we don't allow the studios to go hog wild and destroy this beautiful thing that we've, we've got all of a sudden, Cargill said. We need to make sure that we keep focusing on entertainment and quality, and that's the one thing that I think we need to think about when we're talking about how great of a period of time we are in now. I cannot tell you how many articles that I've read throughout my entire life about the horror boom and bust cycle. I mean, I've been I've been really a a, a film fan now for forty five years. When as a, I mean, a real dyed in the wool studying film, reading books about film. You know, it happened around the time Logan. I was like nine or ten years old between Logan's Run and Star Wars coming out. That's when I really became serious about movies. And when we got a VCR, we were like the first family to get a VCR in in uh, nineteen eighty on our block, and I was able to start really studying movies and studying genres and acquiring horror films and things I'd never seen. There was no way for me to see them. But obviously, I would watch anything. I'd watch Hammer Horror. I'd watch classic Universal Monster Horror. I would watch Italian Horror. I would watch anything. And it was great. And the, the DVD explosion of the late 90s, early aughts was fantastic because you had everybody and their mothers starting video companies and making beautiful brand new transfers of of horror films that were I mean, getting Italian horror movies like whether it was Lucio Fulci or whether it was Dario Argento or whatever you were looking for and finding them uncut was really hard. And yet that was that was one of the great things about the DVD because DVDs were cheap and making so much money that you had all these companies rise up like Elite who was already doing Laserdiscs and like Bill Lustig's Blue Underground or they were they were coming up and they were they were finding these movies that you couldn't get in good condition that I was getting bootleg. I mean, I can't tell you how many bootleg copies of Suspiria that I had that were just terrible or, or things like that. But then you could you you could you could get the beyond. You could get Fulci's the beyond beyond. It looked great. And then that carried over into the Blu-ray realm. One of the things that you know, I'm still buying physical media. I mean, uh, I have a I was hoping I'd get it to show tomorrow, but Severin uh, just released a box set of movies I'd really never heard of, not familiar with, female exploitation films in this box, and I'm like, that sounds good, buy that. But now we can we can find all this stuff, and you can get horror films from all over the world, and everybody's, I mean, the boom in Korean horror has been spectacular. Um, monster movies like The Host, movies like I Saw the Devil, I mean, there's some great stuff coming out from foreign territories, so I'll tell you. Uh, it's a it's a good time to be a horror fan, but horror's never gone away. Whether it's literary horror, books like Stephen King, Clive Barker, and Dean Koontz, and Peter Straub, rest in peace, to all the modern horror authors, which I'll get to in a little while, but horror as a genre is a booming. And I'll tell you, one of the things I really appreciate is I like the fact that all of our lives are one step away from becoming a horror film. And I think that's why we identify with horror films so much. And I think this article nails it. You want to see horror films collectively in a theater. But nowadays, there's all this talk of elevated horror. And I, I, I you know, I look at hereditary, elevated horror without monsters in it, but where, I mean, the humans are the monsters, but they're, they're, they're highbrow in the sense that they, they feel like they could actually happen. Um, and one of my favorites of those kinds of movies is Karen Kusama's The Invitation. I love The Invitation. If you haven't seen it, don't read anything about it. Just... 
Just watch it. It's elevated horror, but all you need to know it's 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 about a dinner party. Um, it's it, it not a dinner party like the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover, or something like that. It's about a dinner party in the Hollywood Hills. It's good. But one of the great things I do think about horror now is that when a horror film comes out, it can have a really interesting concept. And that's what makes it fun to watch. It's all about the premise. Is the premise good? Is the premise something that interests you? And when I was a kid growing up, you know, I'd read the back of a horror novel and I might not buy it right away, but if the premise stuck with me, if they could sell me on the back of the book, on the story, and the story itself interested me, I'd be like, oh, I wonder how they're going to solve that problem. I'd go back to the bookstore and then I would buy it. And I found so many incredible horror novels that way. My favorite of all those books was finding Robert McCammon's They Thirst in paperback, which it looked like it basically had a uh, uh, the cover of it. It was supposed to be a vampire, but it was like the creature from the Black Lagoon crossed with, with a puffer fish on the original paperback. And I'm like, that's eh, just, I, I didn't buy it. I like lurid paperback covers, but I read the back and something about it stuck with me. It was one of those kick ass books ever. Uh, if you weren't reading horror novels, the splatterpunk movement of the of the 80s, if you weren't reading John Skip and Craig Spector's original books, uh, The Light at the End, The Cleanup, and their masterpiece, The Scream, yeah, you'll know if you read the book what I mean by that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of, lot of sex and violence, and it was great, and, and coupled with a great premise. Uh, they went on, they wrote things like The Bridge and Animals, and Skip and Spector, like, released a book from uh like every 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 year they'd come out like clockwork um there's a lot of other i was talking about a a book series i desperately want to see turn into a tv series i was talking to a showrunner friend of mine today they've been trying to do this for a long time they they can't make it work but maybe they can work make it work now joe uh the joe ledger series of books by jonathan mayberry cross between tom clancy and the x-files kick ass very they, they he jonathan mayberry takes very time-worn tropes, whether it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and genetic engineering or zombies or alien technology or whatever. He makes it very realistic and puts a military spin on it all. And it's fan-fucking-tastic. And it make a great procedural. Uh, they tried making it into a Monster of the Week procedural back 10 years ago. CBS did, and it was not good. Not a good pilot. But with, with shows like Bosch and now the Alex Cross series... Jack Ryan, I mean, you, you, and Jack Reacher, the way to do these books is to take a book and adapt, turn it into a 10 episode series. Why make a movie when you can turn it into a, a great streaming series? And that's what they should do with the Joe Ledger books. Please do that for me. Uh, our friend Cinema Gulp, um, Cinema Gulp sends in a super chat and says, They're not granny glasses. You're good, Rob. We put out three horror shorts this month on the channel. Would love to hear your thoughts on It Follows, one of my favorite horror films of 2010. Uh, you know, It Follows, I was really excited to see It Follows. And I went and saw it uh, Saturday morning. My friend Dave Hargrove and I went, and we went and saw the first show. I loved the first 45 minutes of it. I love the premise, and I love the first 45 minutes. It was great. But they didn't, they didn't know what to do with it. And for me, it was interesting because the movie actually, for me, completely fell apart. Um, there's a scene in a boathouse um, where something happens. And I realized that the filmmakers had this great premise and they didn't know what to do with it, nor did they know what the rules of their own premise were. And it, it went out the window for me. And I was like, God damn it, because I really loved the first 45 minutes. It was so creepy. And it's still, it's a good movie, but it could have been an all-time classic. If they understood what they, they, they don't, they had a great premise that they didn't understand how it worked because here's one of the things about, about horror films. And this is just for me, maybe other people don't care, but there's a lot of, oh, there's a bug right here. One of, one of my, one of my pet peeves is when, I mean, I don't mind nightmare logic, like in the Nightmare on Elm Street films or even in, in Don Coscarelli's Phantasm. But if your film is firmly set in the real world and then you have something horrific, supernatural encroach on the real world, I think it's really important that you 
understand what that is and how it works. And uh, I always give this this example because I want to. I've, I've talked about this before, but I'll say it again. The Ring, Ringu, the American remake. If you think about that movie, and I love the, I love Ringu. I love the uh, the Nakata version. I love the American remake. I think the American remake is really strong from the opening scene all the way through. It's a beautifully made film. Uh, really love it. But, but if you think about what's going on in that movie, now forget the advance of technology. Let's just, you know, late 90s, 2000s. Let's think about when it was made. That movie asks you to believe. Now, I'll, I'll believe that some fucked up girl was being tortured and she was evil or whatever, and she was projecting strange images from her subconscious onto a videotape. I'll buy that. Sure. But if you really think about what happens is with that movie. So if you watch that videotape, you watch the videotape, your phone rings. You get a phone call seven days. And you hear the spectral voice of Sadako or, or uh, 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 yeah, Sadako or Samara, 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 Samara in, in, our, in our version. And then seven days later, Samara, Sadako will come out of the TV or whatever and scare you to death, however that works. All good, right? When you're watching the movie, you're like, I buy it. Okay. But think about it. If you think about the logic behind this. So first of all, how does she know? Is she sitting somewhere in the afterlife? Is this is is there like, so whatever realm, whatever nether realm this poor dead entity is living in, she knows when you've used your VCR. She knows, and, and call it what you want. She's feeling the psychic emanations of your brain. The fact is, she has to be somewhere. And so then... Once she is somewhere, she's able to pick up the phone. I mean, this is just what happens in the movie. But if you really start to think about it, pick up the phone. And she she not only does she know you use your VCR, she knows your fucking phone number. Which is a whole different technological spectrum of things to understand. And is able to call you, which means she has a voice. <laughs> how, does an, how does an entity have a voice? How does a ghost have a voice? How do they have vocal cords? Doesn't matter. You go with it because it's the ring. Seven days. Okay. Well, seven days then I start asking myself, what about time zones? Do you know what time zone this person lives in? And does the seven-day clock start immediately when you finish watching the videotape? Or does it start at 12 midnight when the clock clicks over? Like when, are the, when does the seven days begin and end? I know I shouldn't be thinking about these things, and I don't. When I watch the ring, but when I walk out of the theater, I do. I'm like, wait a minute. And then not only that, she can crawl out of your TV. Well, how does that work? You know, and I know, I know you're all laughing at me thinking, come on, Rob, just go with it. But I can't, you can only go with certain things. And then it gets a little too ridiculous. The ring gets a pass because while you're watching it, you never think about that shit. It's, it's only until later, like, and with like J-horror, like the grudge, if something bad happens, all believe that a, that an evil spirit gets locked away in a house. Now, an evil spirit's just an evil spirit. I don't worry about what they eat. I don't worry about their non-corporeal existence. But I'll I'll buy into it. But you gotta you gotta make me believe. Like it follows, made me believe in what was going on. But then after the forty-five minute mark, when you get to this point. When you're the the when you're fighting this suddenly this thing that's happening it's now an entity that you fight. Well, where is that entity? And it just it made me realize the filmmakers don't really know. They had this great premise, but then once they got to a point where oh we have to have our main characters interact with our premise, and I think that's the big problem. A premise can be great from an intellectual standpoint. But when you have to realize it on a practical level, especially with horror, especially when you're dealing with creatures or things from beyond the grave, then suddenly you have to ask yourself logistical questions. I used to drive Dave Parker when we were making The Hills Run Red. I would drive him crazy. He's like, well, enough of your philosophizing. Unless <laughs> he got bad. He'd be like, it's just a killer, man. <laughs> I'm like, okay. But but I'm, I, I need to know the questions of logic. Like, I never ask myself those questions when I'm watching, like, The Exorcist. I get it. She's possessed by, well, a lesser demon like Pazuzu or the devil himself, as Damien Kara says. I'll buy that. 
you know, the corruption of an innocent soul, because that's the one ask. Once you've been possessed by the devil, yes, your head can turn around. Yes, you can split pea soup. Yes, you can throw grown men around a room. I buy that. I believe that because that's what the devil can do. But with anything, with any science fiction, fantasy, or horror film, you have to watch your asks. And when I mean asks, I mean asks of the audience. You have to watch out, man. Because if your asks get too much, it all collapses down on itself, which is a bummer. Uh, you don't want that. You don't want that to happen. You want the reality of the situation that you set up to remain believable. And I think the best horror films do that. I mean, Dawn of the Dead, you believe zombies will come back. Human beings, the bodies of humans will be reanimated. But that's not too much to ask. I'm like, that could happen. <laughs> but if the zombies, like they start pushing, if they can talk and you know, I was I was listening to one of the reviewers on NPR talk about warm bodies, which I really like because once you believe in zombies, then you can pile on and ask. You can be like, well, what if a zombie started to get back their intelligence? You know, Nicholas Holt, hey, maybe that could happen, you know, but you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. And Barbarian, like, is a movie that does a number of different things right, for instance. I mean, we all have fears about modern day living. What if this happened? What if, hey, what if you, what if you, uh, what if you were going to this big job interview and you booked a Airbnb uh, beforehand and then when you get to the Airbnb, somebody else is staying there? I mean, that's the beginning of a horror movie right there. Or it could be the beginning of a romantic comedy. You never know, but both could work. And uh, that's what makes it a good premise. And then it goes from there. Barbarian never, while it has a crazy way of telling its story, it never made you go, eh, that can't happen. I mean, you believe it, even though it gets pretty fucking crazy. You're like, okay, I believe this. But ultimately, great horror, like this article touched on, when you are reading a great horror novel or you're watching a great horror movie on screen, one of the great things about modern horror is that we all identify with the main characters. We're all thinking to ourselves, oh my God, if that was me, I would do this or I wouldn't do that. You are projecting yourself into a horror movie. That's what a great horror movie does. That's why you get scared, because you believe that it could be happening to you. And if it was, what would you do? And I think that all, I mean, all great movies do that. They're all, what if that was me, man? What did I, What would I do? And that's why I think some of the great horror, one of the most genius things, um, and the reason I'm convinced Stephen King became very, very successful, is he put the horror down the street. You know, it wasn't. It was no longer in the mountains of Carpathia or Romania or, or Transylvania. The horror was not taking place in some far off, isolated. I mean, it could take place in an isolated landscape, but it was taking place here. Like there are fucking serial killers in the middle of America that will find you and cut you up with a chainsaw and wear your skin. You know, and you could just be off on a little hoot with your friends, like in Texas Chainsaw, and that shit could happen. Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, and the things that Jeffrey Dahmer did, the dehumanization in his own mind that allowed him to do the horror, the perpetrate the horror that he perpetrated. Look at how popular the Dahmer series is. I mean, because the monster lived right next door to you. And the monster was so monstrous, playing with body parts, eating body parts, sleeping with body parts. I mean, fucked up shit. But there's no supernatural involved in it at all. Yet people are fascinated because we're capable of anything. And I think that horror has never, ever gone away. Horror will be successful forever. It just depends. You have to make sure that the horror that you've decided to gravitate toward or tell the story about, it needs to be of its time. And you need to tap into the zeitgeist of what are people scared of today. Uh, and and while that hasn't really changed that much, it is a factor in what, what horror films are successful. Uh, so Cinema Gulp, that's kind of what I thought about about uh, It Follows. I love the first 45 minutes, but I think it calls. I think it kind of falls apart. Uh, Shelcro uh, sent in a super chat, but, but retracted their message. Tom Jr. Jackson says, good topic tonight, Rob. Well said. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate you being here. I know I said I was going to start at 10, but uh, I was busy. Um, Take It or Leave It sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you so much. Um, hey, Rob. Chad J here from last night's live session. That was fun, man. You were great. You were a great guest. Still glowing from that, brother. Had an absolute blast. I saw Tar uh, tonight 
and that had a trailer for M. Night's uh, Knock at the Cabin. Looks strong. You excited for it? Thanks again. Uh, well, Chad J, last night was a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I am really excited for M. Night Shyamalan's movie, A Knock at the Cabin. It's based on a book called The Cabin at the End of the World. And uh, that was a one-sitting book for me. Not entirely successful, but I understand it had a great premise. Um, and the less you know about it, the better. But it was a one-sitting book for me, meaning I sat down and read the entire book uh, cover to cover in one sitting. It was that interesting. I hope the movie is great. I do. I hope it's great. It looks great. I want it to be great. I love when horror novels are uh, well, you know, well done. So um, let's see. There's some tips as well. People have been sending in some tips. Matt sends in a tip and says, thoughts on the second site, the Nightingale Blu-ray. Do you have it? I was lucky enough to work in the art department. Matt, I don't. And there are some second sight titles, that being one of them, that I have not purchased. Um, and, I, you know, it's funny you bring that up. I keep forgetting about The Nightingale. I really love that movie's rough. It is rough. I really love that movie. It's rough. But you know what? That's a good question. Since you brought it up, um, let's see. Second sight, Blu-ray. Let me see. Perhaps. Uh and I think they have a really nice um, box set of it. Let's take a gander. Uh, pre-orders and latest releases. Uh, boiling Point. You know what? I was going to order that. Um, Revenge. A Banquet. Ooh, limited edition. That looks tasty. Bull. I don't know that movie. Uh, Censor. Dog Soldiers I have. I got to get these. Uh, the Mummy stuff. Um, I'm looking for. Let's see. Monster, Walkabout, Drunk, blah, 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 Witch, Standard Edition of Raw, The Babadook. Where is The Nightingale? I don't see it. Um, I hope it, maybe it's sold out. Paranormal Activity. Um, wow, there's a lot of stuff sold out. Well, I'll have to look. Um, I should have got that Babadook Limited Edition, but I didn't. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah, the Nightingale Limited Edition is out of print, damn it. Out of print, out of stock, and out of print. Whew. Well, hey, at least you worked on a good one. I need to get that. Now I'll be obsessed. So, Matt, congratulations on working on the Nightingale. Um, I'll have to get that. See, you don't, if you don't buy Second Sight stuff, it's gone. Uh, Miss 50 and Still Metal. Fuck yeah. Uh, great topic tonight. Rob, being a longtime lover of Dawn of the Dead 1978, this weekend has brought much joy seeing new generations go to the theater for the 3D screening. Romero forever. Well, Miss 50, it's still metal. Um, yes, so for those of you who don't know, Dawn of the Dead was screening in uh, 3D this weekend. Now, I have to say I had a friend write to me and talk about how they really enjoyed seeing it in 3D. I saw it in 3D. It was That was actually done in 2013. And I did, I've seen that. I saw it uh, years ago, probably in 2013, 2014. And I saw Richard Rubenstein speak afterwards. And Dawn of the Dead is my second favorite horror film of all time. And it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, it's great to see people go see Dawn of the Dead in the theater. Although I've already heard a lot of people say, well, you know, Rob, the zombies and they're blue. And look, the, the Walking Dead, which essentially takes place in Romero's world, I can understand um, why people think that it might be a little dated because of things like The Walking Dead and the technology has increased so the living dead looks so much better now. And I get that, but it's the whole movie. It's the whole apocalyptic fall of civilization that I really love in Dawn of the Dead and I love the characters and all that. But yeah, people have been able to go back and see the movie in 3D this weekend, which is fantastic because a lot of people are seeing it for the first time. And I love that. I love that people are going to see it for the first time because the film holds up. It's a great movie. So... Um, Miss 50 and Still Metal, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. So, yes, and that's uh, very exciting. Uh, Shellcrow says, have you had a chance to watch The Cabinet of Curiosity? Fantastic Panos Cosmatos episode and some Lovecraftian adaptations, Lovecraft adaptations. Shellcrow, I've watched a few, including Panos Cosmatos' episode, 
which I really liked. I'm, I'm Elizabeth and I are getting through them. Uh, really enjoying the show. I, I think, first of all, it's beautifully made. I love the choice of directors that they've picked, uh, including Jennifer Kent. And, uh, and Panos Cosmatos, I mean, you know, Beyond the Black Rainbow, a, a movie that I owned on Blu-ray. It took me a, a long time to watch it, but I really like it. I'm a fan of Panos's. And it was great to see him included in this. I'm I'm really um I'm really loving the show. It's 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 very beautiful. Um it was great. So definitely worth checking out. I you know, I wish that they I hope maybe because it's Guillermo. Man, I'd love Criterion to do a full blown box set of the Cabinet of Curiosities. I would really um I'd really, really enjoy that. So we shall see. I'd love to see that. It'd be uh, it'd be good, but I wanted to now look at actual box office of horror films this year. So you can go to a site called The Numbers or the numbers dot com, and they have a list of horror in twenty twenty two. So I pulled it up. Figured I'd check that out. So if, I'm not going to look at tickets sold, but you look at the domestic numbers. For 2022, the gross. And this is just horror films. So number one is Nope, and this is domestically 123 million 277 thousand. I'll round up the numbers. Very very nicely done. I mean, Nope was probably more expensive because it was Jordan Peele's third movie, but still 123 million, very respectable gross. The Black Phone, again, a movie that did not cost a lot of money, uh, 89 million. That's domestically. Smile, 88 million. Scream, 81 million. Halloween Ends, which could have made a lot more money, but it was also released on Peacock at the same time, 57 million. Barbarian, a movie that cost 4.5 million, made $40 million. That is impressive. The Invitation that's recently out, 25 million. Not the invitation that I would recommend you see. I'm talking about a different invitation that was made from uh, in 2015, directed by Karen Kusama. Check that out. Logan Marshall Green, different from that invasion, but still the invasion, 25 million. The re-release of Jaws, and Jaws was released in 3D. The re-release of Jaws from 1975 made 12 million bucks at the theater. People like horror. Now look at this. A24 has released four movies this year, horror films, X, Bodies, 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 Pearl, and Men. And of course, X, $11 million. Bodies, 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 $11 million. Pearl, $9 million. Men, $7 million. These are not expensive movies. One of the big stories, of course, if you've been following it, is the partially crowdfunded Terrifier 2. Terrifier 2, which everyone is... Uh, they're shocked at the level of violence and horror, but I think it's kind of amusing. Terrifier 2, $6 million bucks. They never thought that. The sequel to Orphan. Orphan came out in 2009. They made a sequel to it. That made $5 million. And uh, then it goes down. The list goes down and, and lesser money. But, I mean, if you look at this, you have... there. There is a... There's 34 horror films at all levels and they've grossed almost 600 million dollars 600 million and a lot of these of course are low budget that is a pretty damn good sorry i'm, I'm ruining this uh, list here as i'm making it bigger so you can't see it 600 million that is an incredible result so horror has always been around um and good horror films never go out of style. They never go out of style. And look, even on TV, Hulu gave us a new Predator movie with Prey and just recently a new Hellraiser movie, bringing those franchises back, which uh, is incredible, um, So, which is amazing. Uh, Guillaume LaBelle uh, asks if I've seen George Romero's The Amusement Park. If so, what do you think? Guillaume, I have not, and I have it right here. I got the uh, the Blu-ray. I've never seen it as a Romero fan. It's I think it's the only movie of his I haven't seen. And I'm looking forward to it, but I haven't seen it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's very exciting. 
very excited by that, um, by the, the, the promise of seeing that. Scotty G sends in a super chat and says, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Uh, well, not, not, not really in my wheelhouse, but okay. Um, we shall see. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to complain about it. I also wanted to talk about horror novels. As a longtime fan of horror novels this year, there's Vulture did a list, and I wanted to show that the best horror novels of 2022. And again, you know, there's 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 the traditional horror novel has been sort of fractured as well, the way that that modern horror films are. But um, this is really interesting. This is really an interesting list. So this was in Vulture, um, and this was published recently, although I don't know exactly when. Uh, October 3rd. October 3rd. The best horror novels of 2022. To be a horror fan in 2022 is to find yourself at a feast after many years of famine. You are not just limited to writers named King, Straub, or Kuntz anymore. Horror fiction has come back with a vengeance over the past decade after a long fallow period, at least in mainstream publishing. With well over 250 new horror books published this year, including Stephen King's fairy tale, there's something for everyone. Whether you're looking for a gently creepy gothic tale or the most transgressive splatterpunk imaginable. Here are some of the best on the shelves. Now, I have to say, I haven't read any of these. And I saw this list, and I'm like, "Fuck yeah, man! I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive in." Um, Manhunt, in an era of cultural remakes, remixes, knockoffs, and infinite bland variations on corporate IP, it's all too rare to encounter a book like Manhunt, a true original that not only eviscerates an existing subgenre, gender-based apocalypse stories like Why the Last Man in this case, but it also plants a flag in its in its steaming corpse and says. This is the future of queer horror. Anger simmers, under, uh, simmers underneath every word of Felker Martin's prose as she tells a story of a trans woman, trans women and men fighting for survival after a plague transforms anyone with a certain amount of testosterone in their system into a feral monstrosity. In the world of Manhunt, the already life-or-death nature of the transition is taken to new heights. Protagonists Beth and Fran have to scavenge enough estrogen to keep from succumbing to the virus, while Robbie tries to forge a life in a state of persistent dysphoria since taking testosterone is a death sentence. The, their odyssey across a post-apocalyptic New England showcases an array of threats from feral men to militant turfs, self-loathing chasers to rich idiot survivalists. The book is timely, visceral, grotesque, unflinching, and unexpectedly fun, full of sex and gore and messy, beautiful humanity. Think of it as the road with a sense of humor and 110% more queer sex. Now, I got to tell you, right up my alley. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily the queer sex part of, let's face it, we all like that kind of, we'll watch any or read any sex, it's fine. Um, but what I really like about this book is, is you know, it takes topics of the day, it, it, it attaches, it attacks subject matter that we're talking about in our real world, and what a great premise. I love this idea. I got to get this book. Um sounds fantastic to me so yeah why wouldn't i why wouldn't i want to get that uh in, that was in february in march a movie called a movie called a book called a black and oh by the way that book was called manhunt it's by gretchen felker martin this book in march a black and endless sky by matthew lyons actually let me show you the cover so you can see it um there's the cover a black and endless sky Equal parts cosmic horror, road trip adventure, and adrenaline-fueled thriller, Lion's sophomore novel swings for the fences. On a trip through the mountains and deserts of the American West, semi-estranged siblings Neil and Jonah, or Nell and Jonah, find themselves pursued by a violent biker gang bent on revenge, an itinerant stranger who sees more than most, and the thing inside Nell that has decided to hitch a ride. Lyons is an engaging writer who doesn't shy away from his character's worst traits. Both protagonists are, to put it gently, a mess. But you can't help but root for them anyway. The pace is breakneck, the villain's deliciously detestable, and the action top-notch. Plus, you're in for some of the most viscerally memorable scenes of body horror we've read in a long time. I mean, come on. A black and endless sky? I'm getting that. I'm, I'm buying that shit. Come on. Um, I mean, this one's... All the White Spaces, Arctic Horror, The Hacienda, Magical Realistic, Gothic Horror. Hey, I'll buy that. 
Just Like Home. Uh, don't even know what that's about, but you're going home to take care of mother. Haunted house and true crime tropes. Why not? The Devil Takes You Home. Um, why not? About a guy who has to take care of his daughter by becoming a killer. I'm in. Uh, no Gods for Drowning by Haley Piper. Piper, who recently won the Bram Stoker Award for Best First Novel for last year's delightfully fucked up and tremendously imaginative vagina dentata mutant story, why did I miss this? Queen of Teeth is an undeniable rising star in horror and she shows no signs of slowing down with multiple books publishing this year and next. No Gods for Drowning is an audacious novel, a mind-bending blend of noir mythology, urban fantasy, apocalypse story, and murder mystery. In a city abandoned by the gods and beset by chronic flooding and monsters, a serial killer stalks the streets, streets leaving victims strewn in her wake, but she's just trying to help, really. When the gods start to return, however, an even greater mystery unfolds, one of cosmic significance. Fans of the unclassifiable and the weird should not skip this one. Uh, and this, hey, this final one, Ghost Eaters, a legitimately terrifying ghost story and also a thoughtful and smart, if grim, exploration of how addiction destroys lives. Ghost Eaters should make Clay McLeod Chapman a star if there's any justice in the world. After her ex Silas dies by an overdose, Aaron is offered a chance to speak with him one last time using a drug that allows for communication with the dead. There's a catch, of course, isn't there always? Which is why that you don't necessarily choose which ghosts you see or how long they hang around. And once they realize you can see them, they're not inclined to let you go. It's an intense, thrilling tale of grief and addiction and will leave you all too aware of how crowded America is with ghosts. See all this shit? I love it. All these premises, exactly what I want for my horror. And I'm telling you, horror is out there, great horror is out there, and hopefully they'll um, make some uh, movies out of it. Scotty G comes back and says, TM, TMNT, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles again. Hey, I'm a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan. Um, why not? Sure. Um, I don't know, Scotty G. You keep talking about T, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, that could be good or it could not be good. Um, I, I, you know, is there gonna, there's going to be a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm a fan, but what's so funny is, how Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles began as this hardcore, very adult uh, parody of what Frank Miller was doing, and then it turned into this kids thing, which is fine. But I remember when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles first came out, I'm like, oh, well, um, they've certainly changed the premise. But anyway, I mean, I don't know what you guys think of horror. Is there anybody out there who wants to come on the show and talk horror? Because you know, Whenever I do this show late night, I always want people to come on. Now, the great Dieter Bastion's out there, and uh, if he's out there, I'm, I'm going to send Dieter Bastion a link and see if he wants to come on. He probably doesn't. He always says, well, Rob, I need a, you know, I need time. I can't just jump on the show. And I'm like, well, Dieter, why not? Sure you can. I'm going to send you, if you want to, if you don't, hey, you don't have to. No pressure, Dieter. But um, uh, let's see, Dave Parker might come on too. Um, he said he would, if he's still on when he gets home, he might try and join. Well, he can, uh, I'm going to send a link to Dieter. Maybe he wants to come on a talk horror. What's, what's the German perspective of horror? I mean, you know, in Germany they have real cannibals, so you never know. I'll send this to Dieter. See if he wants to jump on and talk some horror on this Halloween weekend. And if he doesn't, Hey, he doesn't have to, but I sent it out and, uh, I'll see for a minute if he wants to come on, but if not, get your cameras ready. If you've never come on this show before and you want to come talk some horror, um, get your camera ready and make sure you're using a Chrome browser and all that and that you know what to do with it. Um, so yeah, and uh, we'll do that. But I'm just I'm really I'm really excited about all the horror that we're getting. You know, whether it's no in novel form, whether it's in TV series form, I'll tell you. Uh, Morehead, uh, Morehouse and um, or Morehead and Benson, um, the guys who made Resolution and Spring and Synchronic and The Endless. I'm a huge fan of theirs. Those guys, I love in terms of intellectual or interesting premise premises. They have a movie coming out called Something in the Dirt that looks like total Benson and Morehouse. I can't wait. They've been directing some TV now. And Synchronic, I think, had a bigger budget to start Anthony Mackie. It was good. 
I, I thought it was more interesting and the ending kind of petered out for me. But, um, uh, oh, you're, you're not talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You're talking about, uh, is that Midnight's Edge? You're talking about Midnight's Edge? Um, t- look at this. The spam bots are here. Hot photo of my sister. Well, come on, man. Hide user on the channel. You can't. You're out. You're, you're, you're out there, buddy. Um, you're deleted. <laughs> so, um, yes. But anyway, I'm a huge, huge horror fan and we're getting so much great stuff. And I, I, I see that as long as we, we are getting horror that's made by filmmakers that really have interesting things to say, and we're getting a lot of that. That's what I really like to see watching things like Midnight Mass and, and even when they're just trying to scare you like Barbarian, but if it's done in a clever way and when horror films can prey on the malaise or the, the fear of the modern age, I mean, we're, we're rapidly descending back into, I mean, let's bring back nuclear apocalypse with Vladimir Putin threatening nuclear launches and stuff. Let's bring back that. Um, I've got a project with the director of Tango Shalom I want to make called Exclusion Zone. That's 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 around Chernobyl about mutants. It's it's kind of like the hills have eyes. It's good stuff. We need to make those. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, as long as we're making good horror, I'm all for it. So yeah. Well, I don't know if Dieter's going to come on. Probably not. So I'm going to put it out in the chat. I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you guys see if anyone wants to come on. Now I would ask. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't been on the show before, if you have been on the show before, hang back. I ask that you hang back, um, uh, because uh, we want to get new people on that we haven't met before. Um, Eric Skelton sends in a twenty dollars super chat. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Rob, based on yours and Stephen King's advice, <laughs> I just read Ghost Story by Peter Straub. You gave me The Sandman, which I'm eternally grateful for, but geez, was Ghost Story too long and boring. And there were no ghosts. Um, wow, really? You didn't? You, well, you know, it's funny because maybe maybe it was a different time. Because I read Ghost Story, and the, by the way, that was made into a movie as well with a great cast. So, I mean, I like Ghost Story. I mean, I, I, I really love Peter Straub's writing. and But his best book for me was Shadowland. That book was incredible, but I can understand that. I mean, it's, it's you know, gothic horror doesn't necessarily play. I mean, I just like the whole story of these four guys, you know, the four old men and coming together and dealing with, dealing with their past. But I can I can understand. But when that book came out, it was very significant. So was his book, uh, Straub's book Julia, that was also made into a movie. Um, but I I can understand that. I mean, it is that book is from a different time, and um, it. It was, uh, by the way, if you have not seen it, I just watched it again. Um, The Changeling with George C. Scott. If you've never seen The Changeling, very effective, very elevated ghost story. Really, really worth uh, worth seeing. And if you've never seen it, it's really good. Uh, Peter Medak directed it. It's from 1980. And uh, you should check it out because it's really, really good. Um Oh, our friend James Wallace is uh, told him, it was uh, was uh, is saying to me that he has a good horror script. Um, look, you know what's really funny? He says his horror script. He was told that his horror script's too expensive. Here's the thing about horror movies: you can always make them cheaper than people think. And and I I'm more convinced now than ever that a lot of people who tell you things about how much your movie's costing, they really haven't made movies. <laughs> Because anybody that's actually made films, especially horror movies, you can always make them cheaper. I mean, you don't want to make them cheaper, but you can make them for cheaper. You just have to know what you're doing. And a lot of people don't. Well, Eric, I'm bummed out you didn't like Ghost Story. Maybe you like the movie better. The movie, though, isn't that good. So, I mean, I can understand. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't complain that you didn't like the book because to each their own. Um, and to be fair, I haven't watched it in or I haven't watched it. I haven't read it in a long time. Uh, it's been a long time since I've read that. But it's good. Um, so let's see. I'm going to drop in a link. And if anybody wants to come on the show, I'll bring him on. 
The link is in the live chat. And we'll see. We'll bring on you randos, you late night randos. What are you doing at 105 in the morning? Except come on this show. Why not? Make sure you got a good, again, a good camera and you want to talk some horror. I, and by the way, I expect you to bring your opinions. I want to hear what you love. What are some of your favorite movies? And uh, I'll judge you. <laughs> because why not? I'll judge you. And we'll see if anybody, we'll see if anybody does, if anybody takes me up on it. And, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to hear your opinions. Why do you like certain horror films as opposed to other horror movies? What are horror movies that you like that nobody else seems to like? Um, however you want to play it, I want you to come on and tell me what you think. Um, and we'll have a conversation. And if you don't want to come on, we don't have to. Because I pretty much, I just wanted to share that uh, my excitement with all of you, that horror is, is, it's never left. It's always been, it's always been here. It's always been something that people like. And we're getting a lot of great horror. Um, you know, somebody in the in the chat, cha the, 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 the live chat, uh, how do you say that? <coughs> and Fuego, and Fuego Entertainment. And Fuego Entertainment says, speaking of Peter Straub, how about the Duffers doing the Talisman on Netflix? Um, I I think that's a great idea. I, I think, look, Stranger Things is basically Steve, as a Stephen King novel. So I think doing the Talisman's perfect for them. I can't wait for that. I, I really thought that Stranger Things Season 4 was a real return to form for the show. I really, really liked it. I thought it was a really great, it was brutal, it was interesting. Really enjoyed it. Um... I'm a hustler. Said I'm a hustler. Says thoughts on Event Horizon. I really like Event Horizon. I just got the uh, the the 4K box set. Um, I think it's pretty good. It's it the climax. It kind of kind of burns out at the end, but it's still really interesting. It just doesn't explode into some kind of. They really needed. I mean, of course, there was that the mythical when they brought in the porn stars and shot all the sexual and horrible violence that engulfed the event horizon and they've never been able to find that footage i think they really need they really needed to go to hell you know you needed a full-on gigantic huge ending but other than that um i liked it i thought uh i thought it was good it, it's a lot of fun and you know what it holds up i mean some of the some of the effects now comparatively speaking the CG effects are a little weak now, but for the most part, I think the movie has great, it's got a great cast, it's got a great design. It's probably Paul Anderson's best movie. I, I enjoy it. Um, I wish we got, we could see what they, you know, the unrated stuff, but unfortunately they can't find, they can't find, um, they can't find it. It's funny, there's a lot of people saying, uh, Jeremy the Gent in the chat says, oh, there's somebody here. Wally. Wally's here. Hello, Wally. Hello. You sound go. Oh, you sound good. I'm bringing you on. You ready to talk some horror? Let's do it. Um. All right, we're gonna do it. I'm bringing Wally on. Um. Uh, let's see. Let me put Wally into the. I'm gonna put you in, Coach. Into the show. And uh, you look like you're gonna fit right in with our crowd here. Uh. All right, Wally. You are in the show, man. Welcome to Rob Observations Late Night Horror. First of all, how are you? I'm I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Now, where are you coming to us from? Uh, Los Angeles. Oh, you're in town. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Well, so give it to me. Give me your list. What are your top favorite horror films? So this isn't on a specific list, but tonight I was like. I want to watch something that'll give me some heebie-jeebies, uh, and uh, and I turned on Arachnophobia. Wow. Okay, that's good. And and I I have fond, terrified memories of that movie. I actually used to play football, and there's a scene in that movie where a football player, there's a one of the spiders, goes crawls into the helmet, and he puts it on, and it bites him and, and kills him mid tackle, uh, and. Uh, and as a kid, there was definitely a, um, uh, a a fear. I would look into my helmet every time. After that. <laughs> well, yeah. So, I mean, now how how much uh, of excuse me uh, 
I'm coughing. How much of a person's life do you think affects how they approach horror films or how they approach the genre of horror? I, I think it's a massive contextual part of horror. I think what you experience in life will shade the things that affect you in that sort of fear area. So if you're somebody that's always lived in a big city, maybe it's the middle of the nowhere out in the country horror that might have an even chilling a deeper chilling effect than, uh, than the other person or vice versa, uh, or things that are directly, I mean, as exampled, with the uh with the football thing like that that affected me years post watching the movie exclusively because i had a parallel path to a part or one of the scares in that so i mean i I think it's a very personal genre in that regard and i think that's a a big reason why it's so effective and and kind of time proof is 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 your the topic is is because there's always going to be something that we fear yes and i i Totally agree with you. Um, one of the things I, I've always thought, and I think this history has bared this out, is that the time with always sort of informs um, the horror that we're getting. I mean, the Vietnam era gave us everything from Night of the Living Dead to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And now, now we're getting with this quote-unquote elevated horror the, the idea that like with It Follows, you know, uh, a, it's a it's a spiritual venereal disease essentially, you know, and 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 movies like Kusama's the Karen Kusama's The Invitation and buying into trends or <laughs> something like that and where that can lead to. Um, where do you think what what do you think is the predominant? What is the horror of today? What is it that we are scared of in our social media world? I mean, I, you know, there's movies I really look forward to, like the Neon Demon, uh, Nicholas Wending reference movie that I just, I didn't love. I wanted to love it, but I didn't, I don't think it, it really had much commentary on its mind. It was sort of, we'd seen this before in other, I mean, all the way back to Eyes Without a Face. But what do you think that is is the hot button horror topic of today? Maybe it's something that hasn't even been put in a movie before yet. I think that's that's exactly it. I think we're at the precipice of starting to see a lot more of it, but I think the trend of uh, of isolation of you know of thinking that you know all your friends are who they are and everything, but then you do one small thing, maybe you didn't even do it on purpose or maybe you didn't even do it. But then all of a sudden now everyone has turned against you, people that maybe you thought were forever on your side. Yeah, I think that is a deep seated fear in our society right now. And I think that there's a lot of issues around that. And I think that's going to percolate into horror in the next five to 10 years. And I think there'll be some very interesting things. I mean, I would love to see an A24 style film that tackles some of the, the constructs of, of things like, cancel culture and uh and that sort of fear and isolation uh and, and even as a person that stands on the side that i think that they're the concepts of cancel culture aren't what people necessarily talk about and, and that's right. not what the conversation is about but even I, I just as a film fan know that that is a fertile ground for oh. artists to do some amazing things i have to tell you so today so obviously being on youtube and talking live is fraught with peril because you you can one you say one wrong thing and you can get in trouble from people and and like for me like I don't have a problem when if somebody wants I'll give you an example if somebody wants me to call them by a certain name or use pronouns or whatever I'm happy to call anybody whatever they want to be called and I'm very respectful of people's identities and things like that but if you say the wrong thing like for instance and I, it's been It's been very difficult because if you're talking about, say, a celebrity who identifies as non-binary, I don't know that person. So I only know that they are, they consider themselves non-binary through the media, but I don't, I don't know them personally. So I haven't heard that from their mouth. So if I'm talking about someone like, for instance, Ezra Miller, 
and we talk about it on the John Campy show a lot because of the Flash situation. And John and I are constantly talking about the fact that we have to be very careful. And I we do this in the same sentence. I've called Ezra Miller they, their preferred pronouns. But I've also, because you start talking about the Flash as a movie, well, the character of Barry Allen in the movie is not non-binary. So you say he, you know, and 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 I know it seems crazy, but yesterday on the midnight stream, I was talking about Emma Darcy, who plays Renera Targaryen in House of the Dragon. Well, they identify as non-binary as well. But Emma Darcy's playing Renera Targaryen, who, you know, obviously is a female character. So if you want to talk about these things online, and it's getting to the point where I get worried and scared that I'm going to offend somebody and because you, 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 you let things slip and people get offended and they can come after you and cancel you. And it's, it's getting more like when you're it, – it's just a weird thing, but I'm more aware of it. I'm more hyper aware of it than I ever was before that you – it's very difficult when you're talking about how you like a television show and you're reviewing a show and you're talking about the character that an actor is playing and if that character is female but the actor identifies as non-binary – you can screw up and people will get offended and angry with you. And and if somebody gets mad and angry with you, they can start a campaign against you and accuse you of all, all kinds of things, depending on how egregious they think your slip-up was. And it's something I never considered before, but it's certainly something that's out there. And I somebody wrote me this morning and said, you do realize that Emma Darcy is non-binary. And I felt really bad. I was like, oh. But if, what if somebody decided to come after you? What if there was somebody out there, the ultimate, um, um, call it what you will, social, social justice warrior? You know, call the movie could be called SJW, and it was somebody that went after some people for their transgressions against others and and used those things against you. I mean, that's like you said, you could easily turn that into your killer is a social, literally a social justice warrior that's going after people that have transgressed against. I mean, that would be the obvious slasher version of it, but you could make it a whole different, like what if someone's lose their identity or something? But I think you're right. The the can- cancel culture, we need the ultimate cancel culture horror film. That's my roundabout way of saying, I love your idea. I want to see it. I want to see that movie. Because the horror of living in this world is there. And um, you just never know. You The best intentions. But for me, right. for me, that kind of fear of, of I don't want to offend somebody like when I'm having a conversation, you don't even know when you're doing it. And, you you know, you want to be polite and you're open to people. But sometimes you say things and you might not even knew you, you did it. Well, I, 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 will, I will say that I think just in terms of, you know, the concept of miss pronouncing somebody i think the the issue is more with the people that do it purposefully i think that and right. i watched the john campy show and i i actually think that you're exceptionally careful about that and the fact and how you you play it and, and everything I, I don't i think you're pretty teflon for something like that and for instance you as a person volunteering the fact that when you find out that someone has a different preferred pronoun that you have you, you feel bad about it is a, is a yeah. thing but the movie because that's what we're talking about yeah yeah i mean i mean i'd still would love to see that yeah i would i almost envision like a drag me to hell kind of thing where if it happens upon you you're out is you have to somehow happen it upon somebody else like almost even it follows kind of thing yeah because it's because it's about the or or in the ring why here's this videotape watch the tape i I think that could be some really cool stuff and and some young hot up-and-coming your know, writer is going to figure out an awesome way to do that. And, and someone's going to give them 5 million bucks and it'll make 10 exits budget in the box office and it'll be great. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I think that that's a great, whoever fi- finishes or figures out that premise, it's going to be great because I think some of the best horror films figure out clever ways to deal with the fear of the modern age and figure out a way to create a great story around them. I mean, it's for me, I'm my big, the reason I was loved, Dawn of the Dead is because my big fear is the lack of civility, social social mm-hmm. collapse, the social construct where, and and you see it, you know, you see it in our world. You see how close we are to the precipice, and at any moment, 
our civilization. I mean, what happens one day if I, I, I wanted to, I always tried to figure this out. I could never figure out how to make it work as a whole film. But what if one day people just decided they're not going to stop at red lights? Just that. And it's a metaphor, you know, for the destruction of the social contra- construct. And, and, and there were just endless car wrecks where people were, and people were gunning their, their engines through. They're just, they weren't going to stop at red lights anymore. And it was like a thing to see if you could get through a red light without dying. Like our civilizations become so bored and people were putting their car wrecks on Instagram and dash cams. <laughs> and it was just, I don't know what the premise of that movie would be, but that was the idea that one day people just stopped. They just decided we're not going to stop at red lights anymore. No, it, it's not even just the site. It's, it's a TikTok challenge because <laughs> yeah. that's what people are, are going. I literally just read a news article today. That oh, is that a real TikTok challenge? People don't stop at red lights anymore? Not not exactly that, but there's a, apparently a TikTok challenge, and, and this has not been researched, so I'm I'm taking it on the word of the first thing I read. <laughs> sure. Uh, but the um, James is sorry. James, there's, there's a bit of a, hang on one second, Wally. James, I can we can hear we can hear us on your computer. I can hear the volume. Do you have headphones? I want to bring James on. Now I can't hear, but can you hear us? I think he's hopefully he's he figures it out. Hopefully he'll come back. Um, but yeah, they, apparently there's a challenge of people literally stealing Kias and Hondas, and and like joyriding in them. And apparently there was a, a car full of young kids, teenagers. You know, I don't think any of them was over eighteen, and they got into a terrible car accident, and only the driver survived. And that's uh, a, a an awful thing. But like those are the kind of news stories that once that starts percolating on people's feeds and people hear these sort of things that turns into this idea of like I mean TikTok challenges have always had these really dumb connotations like Tide Pods or you know any other dumb thing I you know uh cooking with NyQuil was a recent one too. And right. Just, and you know like I think there's something really compelling about the idea that there is a entire generation that is getting information or getting told or getting ideas from a thing that is misunderstood by everyone else that almost then makes it seem a little supernatural. Right. I mean, I, that's, you know, that's, I, I'm already, my, my mind is racing. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right about that. And I think that, you know, you don't want to be too, too overt. Like, like I really liked the idea of behind the purge. And some of those movies have, I thought, were were pretty good for what it was. Like one day, you know, for t- and and I'm sorry, but The Purge was a total ripoff of a Star Trek episode. And I, 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 I people, there was a Star Trek episode called Return of the Archons, where there is a a computer run civilization that they have this festival where between twelve o'clock and you know midnight and. Um, and the noon the next day for 12 hours you can this society that's so buttoned up can rampage and everybody can do whatever they want and they don't get into how extreme it gets but that's that's the and Kirk Spock and McCoy they roll in you know they're like what the fuck is this civilization that was the purge and I understand they probably it probably wasn't based on that Star Trek episode but Star Trek already did that but I like the purge I mean I love this idea that because that again, it goes back to that lack of civility. Because we're already, we're already kind of there. We're watching like the homeless population, the fact that and this is shoplifting has been been decriminalized. No, no, no. I I just deserve to get this. What if somebody start? What if there were people that just started going? How far are we away? You you read what happened to Nancy Pelosi's husband? Like some guy with a knife just came looking or a, a, a hammer just shows up at their house at two in the morning. And it's going to beat on an 80-year-old man with a hammer? Where's Nancy? I mean, I'm like, this is this is horrific. But how long before people just start coming to your house with weapons and saying, your house is mine? And they're willing to take you out. How long? I mean, if somebody came to your house, I, I had a, over the summer, I had a person come to my door and, and want to come in and have food and, and water and she was clearly not quite right in the head, and I had to I had to deal with it. 
and and you know I was tried I tried to be nice and I was but it was still we're there man and and where's that going to go and I think that the, it's a rich fertile ground for for horror films I mean you and we've already seen those movies like The Strangers Brian Bertino's The Strangers you know these these masked these masked people that terrorize this couple and I loved the greatest thing at the end it's like why did you do this to us and the answer was well you were home and that was it you know it was no i mean you'll you're terror you you could destroy someone's life the idea that you would destroy someone's life just because i wanted to put it on t- i wanted clicks on tiktok so you've left a family for dead and you've made videos and that's a, that's the only reason you know that's that's terrifying so i'm gonna bring uh james wallace into this chat to join us do you have any objections to that wally None whatsoever. <clears throat> but I like I like this. James uh, works in the industry, so I'm going to be curious to hear what he has to say. James, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. You sound great. Okay, good. Let me just put you in as well. Uh, I love when people say, yes, I can hear you, because that's what Ash says in Alien when they're out going to the Alien derelict ship. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, welcome to join Wally and myself. We have James Wallace has joined us. Hello, James. How are you? Good. How are you? I, I am good. Uh, now, let me ask you the same question. Horror films. What are some of your favorite horror movies and uh, uh, what what are some of the essential classics people need to see? It, it's funny because since it's Halloween season, I try to watch as many horror films as possible. And last night, I think one of my favorites, and it still gets me to this day, is uh, The Exorcist. And a kind of a funny story. Years ago, I was four, and my mom <laughs> picks me up from the babysitters. And, you know, God rest her soul. I mean, I question her judgment at the time. She was in her 20s. And what people don't understand is that back in the 80s, it, it didn't seem like the R rating really mattered to uh, young adults. And um, she picks me up and she's like, hey, do you want to watch a, a good horror film? I'm like, are there vampires in it? And she says, no. I'm like, but is it scary? And she's like, yes. <laughs> and um, we're watching and I'm bored to tears. And then the bed scene happens where she's that and, you know, all that and i ran out of the room screaming i was you know young child at the time i didn't want to sleep on my bed for a year i think i had to be convinced that there was no more there's nothing under the bed i wouldn't get possessed and it's kind of like for a little kid what a lot of people with regard to jaws when that came out people didn't want to go swimming and um and then i read the actual story of the exorcist uh, that I was based upon. And that freaked me out as a child. I was about 12. I I didn't see exorcist until I was an adult, the R rated version. Right. So it's my favorite. It's my favorite horror film of all time. Yeah. It, it, it's just, and I was surprised. Did you watch Wally? Did you see the show as well on um, shutter called 101 scary scenes by any chance? I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. And I was surprised they had The Exorcist like at number five. And their their number one horror film, I I agree with, but and then I read Rolling Stone came out with a horror list of films the other day. And I was like, it's it's so funny how diametrically opposed these lists were to each other, yet there's some similarities, so... Well, you know, it's it's funny to me because to me, when you talk about elevated horror, The Exorcist is to me the best example of elevated horror because the movie is really about a Catholic priest who's lost his faith in God, yeah. And, and in confronting, essentially, quote unquote, the devil, he finds his faith again. And to me, what's so what it's not just yes, the overt horror elements are there. And that's great. I mean, the the d- demonic possession, but it's done in such a. I mean, back in, in at the time, I love going back and watching news stories about when Exorcist first came out because, 
the documentary nature of it, Friedkin was coming off a of French connection. He wanted to, he used his documentary style that he developed. So there's like peak verisimilitude and it's, 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 um, well, I guess we lost Wally. He'll come back. Yeah, but, um, one sec. Oh, uh, but what's so great about that film is it, it, it doesn't use any, um, there's no, I mean, there's effects work, but the effects work doesn't go too far. It never leaves, it's always completely grounded. And even though her head turns around and it's so shocking to see the corruption of this, of this little girl. Yeah. And now, now people, it's, it's hard because the, the, I love the literary nature of it all. And the fact that it's, it's played so straight and the horror, I mean, it's, it is so blasphemous. Like one of my favorite things, I, I hate to admit this, but I love watching teenage girls react on, on YouTube when they make their reaction videos and they always at some point come up to the exorcist. And when they get to certain scenes, like the the masturbating with the crucifix scene, they all freak out because no one has seen anything that's that transgressive. I mean, people, you can kill people all you want, but when you combine blasphemy with sexuality and bloodletting and a and a demon. I mean, it's it's crossing a line. It's because it, it's moved out of the. There's no fantasy there. The devil, yeah. the devil. But what you're watching is is just physical corruption, and and it's 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 so horrific that there's very few times in the modern age where horror films are truly transgressive. I mean, there's weird stuff like Tatane and and. Uh, raw and and stuff where they've t turned cannibalism and things like that into more or or the weirdness of Tatane. but in order to do two true transgressive horror where people a 12 year old girl is violating herself in that way with a crucifix that shit's but but a lot of people it doesn't it doesn't get to them anymore you know, especially that was point of no return for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, and the whole, but the whole, even what she's saying, you know, the thing yeah. that she's so corrupted, and the the tone, it's the tone of that movie that also makes it because it's so, it has such pain and despair. I mean, Father Karras losing his mother, she was alone, and the fact that the demons like, you know, you left her to die, and he, it's yeah. it's such a great, and I love that shit. I mean, I love. And that film's actually about something, you know. It's 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 about, and yet at the end, it's hopeful because he retains his faith, and is able to save the soul of Ray, Reagan McNeil. I mean, at the cost of his own, but still, he's able to save her. So it kind of has a good ending. But here's the thing: it's fascinating. You you mentioned the ending just due to the fact that um, William Peter Blatty hated that ending in the film, yeah. and then I hate the new version that came out in 2000 i think that's blasphemous yeah i mean but i mean they'd shot that and and freed can put it back in to appease blatty and you can still as long as both of the versions exist you know yes, and, exactly. and and i don't like the spider walk sequence either because it's goofy it it shatters it it, it it's too fantastical and it shatters the mood i understand why they put it back in but i don't i think it's a mistake um, I, and that's a movie that you know like I said the first time I watched it I put it on at midnight I had the videotape I couldn't get past the Iraq sequence Yeah, I, I was 13 I was so terrified I'd never seen a horror film at 13 years old that had this relentlessly realistic tone it just got under my skin and I couldn't I'm like oh this is too sad I can't watch this I watch it the next well, day it's funny you bring up realistic one of the reasons I want to hop on was because you're talking about someone going through or people going through red lights. And a few weeks ago I was going to get dinner. I'm at the, the uh, stoplight and the light goes green. I get ready to hit the accelerator, but the side of my eye catches a car coming 50 miles per an hour, like in, I hit the brakes immediately and I could see the guy. He was inches from my grill. And I mean, I would have been pulverized if I just inched up a little more. And I was like, holy, I, I could have died. And that, you know, got me thinking. And then the next day, 
um, I was at a brunch and someone was like, how would you want to be celebrated if you died? And I'm like, wow, this is timely, <laughs> and this question. And I thought about it and I'm like, I would want uh, my family to watch movies I loved and were my favorite because I feel, and that's the thing with literature, with film, it brings us together in a sense over our shared, like either shared experiences or just experiences watching something and what it reveals about our humanity. And to me, I would be like, well, they could watch my favorites and then decide uh, why they were my favorites and maybe discuss them. And who knows? But yeah, I thought it was really timely. You guys brought up the, the stoplight situation. I'm like, oh, wow. And, the, and as horror, you relate to that. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I just uh, it, it, the, the, the destruction of I mean, I can't you know, the thing that that like I watch what's going on in, in Ukraine. You know, and the idea that there Ukraine is, for all intents and purposes, you, you know, Kiev is a it's a it's it's a European city, and the fact that they're being aggressed upon, that somebody is just like firing Iranian drones and taking out apartment complexes, like, and I for what reason, like for what reason you're 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 going after essentially people that are are your brothers and sisters and family members. They live next to you and you're going after them and you read what happened in towns like, like Bucha. I was watching this, this 60 minute story and, and the Russian soldiers were just, they were just taking random. I mean, it's a, it's a neighborhood. It's like, an, it's a, it's not like you think of some war torn, like there's no, no man's land and it's not trench warfare. It's people living in houses, you know, they just, and there was people that were, you know, they walked out of their houses and somebody just took them out. There was a guy with his family, his wife and his two daughters just killed. Uh, tanks blowing up civilians. And, and the, the, to me, that's the ultimate example of, of horror. But the question is, what are you doing? Like, like what, it, what is it you're trying to achieve? And the horrors, I mean, the, the whether you're going to believe it or not, I, I don't know because of wartime propaganda, but... The, the the use of rape as a tool of war, which has always been there, but the idea that Russian soldiers are being issued Viagra to to commit sexual atrocities against anybody, not uh. just women, but against children, men as well. And you know, you listen to that, and and the question I have is in the modern in the modern age, why? Yeah. why? Why would you possibly want to do this? I can understand you need you need land and you want to have a bread basket and you need resources and that's why you want to control these things but but the the destruction of of a city like i live in in i can't not help but imagine what it would be like to live in a city you know you're going about your business then one day someone decides you know what we're going to come into your we're going to invade your country and blow shit up destroy your 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 houses and blow up your apartment buildings and everything you own is going to be gone and you're going to have no power and you're going to freeze in the winter. Why? I mean, you'd think that we would have, we after thousands of years of warfare, that we as human beings would know better. And and the, I almost feel guilty about liking horror films when you read what, what's been going on. And, and it's not just, you know, whether it's what happened in Syria. You know, somebody brought up the movie, a Serbian film, and I own that movie. Um, that movie's not a pleasant experience to watch on any level. And I understand, I've read interviews with the director that he was trying to metaphorically show what happened during the, the Bosnian conflict and what happened you know, to the people there through uh, metaphoric means. And I, I can understand that, but it's certainly not, you know, you watch that movie and it's just beyond the pale. And there, there's no, I mean, I've, I, I watched it and bought it. I don't know what that says about me, but it was like, oh, I, I have to have all these extreme horror movies in my collection in case somebody wants to come watch one. Do you recall there was this Ingmar Bergman film called Shame about war? It was like they didn't, they, it kind of reminds me of what you described going on in current times. But in that film, um, it was uh, Max Fonsito and uh, his wife, 
uh, Liv, can't recall her last name right at the moment, but um, the, it, they don't really go into the circumstances of what caused this war, but it's basically what it's doing to people. Right. And that, you know, I mean, when you describe the Viagra, that, that just, that's so horrific to even consider and think. Uh, it, well, it just, it's disgusting. No, and and I the de I mean the dehumanization of of human beings, and that yeah. that is some of the very basis of some of our you know some of the horrors, the horrors okay. of war and, and and all this. But what what really gets me is the way that we have have now because we watch everything through the media. When yeah. you're watching something on television, and I'm watching Iranian drones destroy a, a, an apartment building where people live you know you look at it and we're removed from it because we're watching it halfway around the world and you're watching it on a screen but that was someone's house you know that was uh, now now what do you do like then what you know when your house is blown up or your apartment building is is blown up and there's all these people living in the rubble tr because where do you go you know you can't get out of the city and the real question is why is it like these are just normal people they're workaday folks that are just going about their business and yet everything they have can be destroyed and there's nobody well you're shit out of luck you know we just decided one day to roll in here it was a million and now you know they're talking about conscripting women you know they're men like i'm thinking who's going to be left in the so in the far in russia to just like like drive supplies to the grocery stores <laughs> like <laughs> and 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 where's that gonna go and for what reason like i'm i'm really i don't understand what do they think they're trying to accomplish i don't understand why he says that you know what this didn't work we're we're done and now are are they gonna pay for the ukrainians to build their shit back up all the power stations that are destroyed all the houses that have been lost all the people that have been random human beings that were non-combatants that civilian populations that were just decimated just because I mean that I can't think of much more horrific things than that. Yeah. And um but if you're going to make a horror movie, <laughs> you know, that's that's the I think that those are the things that it makes those that kind of thing more palatable. You know, horror films take our worst fears and sort of codify them into a into a story where we can grapple with these issues and not make it. So, look, the new on Netflix, the new German All Quiet on the Western Front film it's incredible. Like it's, it's incredible. It's got to be one of the best war films ever made. Um, and uh, you know that was that was when the original came out. The Nazis in 1930. The Nazis wanted the film banned, and they wanted to get rid of all the books. I mean, they did ban it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's just we haven't learned anything. Human beings haven't learned anything. And and that's truly probably the most. It can't get more frightening than that. You know that we haven't learned yeah. a thing. <laughs> and to pivot ever so slightly, but still yeah. very much on topic. There's um there's a film um, that I think captures some of the anxieties about that. Just you know, you everything around you is is kind of destabilizing, and also some of the governmental stuff on, on top of it. Uh, there's a Mexican movie called new order. I don't know if, Oh, I, I own it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about I on Blu -ray? Expect nothing less. <laughs> uh, and, 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 I, and I think as a movie, I think it's, it, it's fine, but what I, I, I went and saw it in theaters. Oh, um, I wish I had, I didn't, I, I wish I had seen it in theater. And I saw it an almost empty theater with a group of, um, I, I'm going to make an assumption, but I feel like it's probably a very apt assumption. Um, people that were from Mexico, right, in in the in the in the uh, theater with me, and that movie, which the first half is about a class uprising, and the second half is about the government response to it, which is all I'll say because if you haven't seen it, it's very affecting if you don't know what you're. Getting it's into. a really good movie. I really liked it a lot. But the walking out, hearing them talk about it not like this was this like for me this har harrowing experience of like oh my god i couldn't imagine but them talking about it is like yeah it's about right like 
what to like cemented that as a uh, a, a really good time capsule of a moment uh, in time, just in, in terms of that kind of the class anxiety, but then just the understanding that at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what happens with the class anxiety because the government might be so corrupt that the whole thing is even more fucked when it gets to that level of response. And uh, it, 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 the, the things I felt watching that movie were a lot of the things you were talking about um, with just like watching all this stuff. Um, in Ukraine, and uh, it, it, it's, it, I think it's cathartic what a film can give you the experience, um, but it's also terribly sad when a, when that kind of cathartic experience is then followed up a few years later by having to to now have some level of empathy for another group of people um, in a different way than you would normally have be, as humans to humans, um, and uh, yeah, it. it, it, it there that's that's a that's where art is the best when it can help us think about and process some of these feelings because then it makes us more human to think about it outside of just how one human can think about it yeah i mean i i used to be married i was married to a a, a ukrainian woman uh from kiev uh her last name was was shevchenko and her her like her family he was a, a a, one, a famous poet or something. And we actually met because over a period of about three years, I was working with this company that was bringing a Russian animated film, short films. It was a, a series called Masters of Russian Animation. And there were it was animated short films from like the last 50 years. And we were doing this in the late 90s. And I loved, you know, I loved Tarkovsky. I loved Russian films. I love Russian animation and... and um, you know, I've, 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 I had a great respect, and I, I, uh, one of my very first girlfriends growing up was Russian, and I was was fascinated the space program and everything, and, um, you know, I just keep thinking about now. I never got to Ukraine. I always wanted to go to Kiev. I wanted to go to the. Od you can't be a film fan and see Battleship Potemkin in film school and not want to go to the Odessa Steps, and, like stand there, and you know, <laughs> and and to to so it it bums me out that you know you read about the Russian oligarchs. And what they've done to the the country, whereas it, you, I would much rather see Russian films and and Russian animation and their space program and music and and you know you look at these these hawkish this hawkish behavior and you're you're like, what world do you think that we live in now, man? Like, why don't you want your people to thrive? Why why isn't your your film the Russian film industry was certainly making some pretty interesting science fiction films, you know, with some great special effects over the last couple of years. And like, don't you want to do more of that? Like, what is it you, you hope to achieve? Like, I don't, between China and Russia and this whole collectivist communist system, I still don't, I'm like, what do you guys want to do? Like, what do you, what, what do you want to, don't you want to accomplish anything? Or do you just want to perpetuate this political system that keeps you in power? But what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to make? And when you look at things that other people have made, like I just keep thinking about these buildings, like somebody designed that building. And there was a lot of people that built that building. And that building stands as a testament to human ingenuity, whether it's mathematics, whether it was the design of it, whether it was the aesthetics, all the things that went into building just one building. And you're just flying in Iranian main drones and blowing shit up. Without any, I mean, what about the poor guys and the men and women, the people that made that building, that lived in that building? Who are you to blow that building up? Fuck you. And, you know, it's it's the kind of thing where it really, when I think about it, I get, I, I, I really wish, you know, bring those people out. Are, are, do they have any value in the world? I mean, and, and what if that's another horror movie idea? There are people that just need to be gone. You know, we don't believe, if you believe in capital punishment or not, let's drag these guys out. But you can only shoot them once. You know, once they're gone, it's not, It's like, okay, then that person's gone and someone will rise to take their place. Like, how do you prevent that behavior? And that behavior to me is the basis of great horror movies. Like, these guys, the, 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 the people, the, suddenly those people in Ukraine that are, the, that are suffering, like, let's just fly an explosive drone into a building. And it doesn't matter whether there's a kid there, a mother there, a father there, a grandfather there, people that have had lives, people that have done things. None of that matters anymore. It's just like, yep, let's take that building out. 
And it's that kind of thinking that I'm just, it blows me away because you could be, you could be exterminating uh, the next great artist or the person that cures cancer or the person that their, 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 their descendants in five generations are supposed to do something great. You never know. And it's just this indiscriminate, I don't know, just bums me out. I don't mean to, I want to talk horror. I don't want to talk real life. I can't get bad, but I, it's hard to, by the way, I have a um, Groovy Don't Play says, hey, Rob, tomorrow I'm going to see how did this get made, the Morbius edition. Any ideas what Tyree's stuff was cut? He had a cybernetic arm during filming. I do not know. I, I honestly, Morbius, the way it turned out, is one of the great uh, mysteries of the modern age. How anyone decided that you have to make a vampire movie that's going to be PG, you can't have blood that's red. Um, I, I, I just don't get it. I don't know who greenlights these things, and they don't know what they're making. How do you, how do you, that film was clearly meddled with in post. And uh, it's like, were you not paying attention to the movie that you greenlit, that you shot? <laughs> like, when did you decide, uh oh, we have to change this into something it's not? I mean, the massive incompetence at certain levels of the business. <laughs> you know, James. <laughs> well, it, I just watched, um, it was a, it's this podcast called Inside of You. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was with director Tom Holland. And he was talking about how he got um, Fright Night. It was greenlit. And it was greenlit by someone he knew. And then midway through production, a guy calls him up. And he's like, you got to change the ending to Fright Night. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? Didn't you read it? He's like, yeah, I just got done reading it. Here, the film was already in production. Yeah. <laughs> and principal photography. And the original ending had uh, Peter Vincent turning into a vampire. He's like, the audience is going to get pissed if they see that so then he had to go back and change the ending and i i mean it, i worked on a production i won't say what it was but um it basically the page length was too much for episodic television and they two weeks before we start our principal photography uh the studio was like uh this is too long you guys need to cut out like 20 pages. And this, this was two weeks before we started shooting. So, you know, it, 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 uh, it boggles the mind. Yeah, no, I, I, I and I, it, 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 I mean, I'm going to bring on Wally. I got Dave Parker. Um, who's going to wait. He's waiting in the wings to come on. I don't mean to 86 you, but hang on a minute. But Dave and I, and he'll talk about this. You know, we made when we made the hills run red. There's a lot of stuff in there that is not in the finished film, <laughs> and it was apparent when our executive, when the the woman went and saw the movie, she said, "This movie, the studio will never release this movie. You you have this horrifying sexual violence. There's no way we're gonna put this out." And we're like, um, "I mean, it was you guys greenlit it," and and Matt Beerman, our executive, was like, "Yeah, you guys did a great job." <laughs> so then you have to you have to I mean Dave will speak to this more but it's amazing to me that we work in a business where the people that decide what movies get made don't necessarily know and understand or TV shows don't know and understand either the process or what is actually going to get shot even when they read a script they don't reading a screenplay has no I mean, I've read th literally thousands of scripts in my life. You can never tell from a screenplay the visceral effect a movie can have on, on an audience when it's finished. With all the music, with all the way it's cut together, it's very difficult to tell from a page how it's going to work when you see it all done. But that said, it's also amazing to me when people don't, they completely don't understand even though it was on the page, they had no clue or no idea. Wait a minute, didn't you understand that this is the way it was going to be? But because they, 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 in their minds, they can't envision how a movie's made. So there's people yeah. that can read screenplays, but they can't envision. Oh, the director is going to. You're going to see, like in a screenplay, it says somebody walks in a room and discovers a dead body, but it doesn't say how you're going to shoot that. So whether you see festering wounds with maggots crawling out of them. 
um, if, if you can't envision that that might be the way somebody's going to shoot a dead body, if it just says man discovers dead body, that's one thing. But when you finally see it fully realized on screen, then people are like, oh, I didn't know you were going to do that. So there's many people that can't, when you read a script in your mind to be an effective reader, you have to think about how it's going to be shot or how somebody's directing it. And I think that a lot of people don't understand that they don't have that skill set. So when they're reading a script, they can't tell what it's going to be when it's finished. And it's so maddening because uh, five years ago, I was a, a, a reader and judge for a script competition that basically um, the the uh, movie Daylight that was on um, Netflix. And the original screenplay was one of the best scripts I ever read in my life. And I would and basically the head of the competition, he and I almost optioned another script. You're talking about the pre- Jamie, Jamie Foxx vampire movie? Yes. Yes. Daylight or Day Shift. Day, day, shift. day shift. Day Shift, yeah. And Daylight's the a script, Sylvester Stallone trap. Yeah, Sylvester, a, yeah, I got it. Tunnel movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little confused there. One's not a horror and the other is horrible, maybe. But um yeah, it, it was a great screenplay. It was one of the best. And I've read like you thousands yeah. over the years. And I I wanted to I, I mean, I wrote the head and I'm like, hey, are you can we option this? And he's like, Oh, I already have. And then he sold it to the producers and we kept in touch about it. And you know, I was just so disappointed when I saw the trailer. I'm like, this is this they bastardize this great concept and yeah um, why well, uh, i mean it, 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 it happens a lot listen wally i before i kick you off and i'm sorry it was great yeah. to have you here do you have any final words about horror any philosophizing you'd like to do about horror films um no i appreciate it a and, I, and i'm happy to step aside for dave i can't wait to, to hear that part of this um but um Based on this part of this last conversation, I think the the one thing I wanted to just reference so it's in posterity on this forever. Yeah, uh, I I just showed my wife Little Shop of Horrors for the first time. The original and or the musical? The musical. Uh, and we uh, the only version I could find was the original version, not the version with the right ending. Right. Um, and uh, and then so I immediately went to YouTube to say no 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 this is how the movie is actually supposed to end. And uh, and watching it in that environment with someone that hadn't seen it before was just an amazing highlight to the fact that uh, sometimes studio executives just don't understand anything. That was like the ending that was, was originally shot. It seems like was probably at least 30% of the entire budget of the whole film was uh was the right and necessary and best possible ending and the one that we got was you know a very vanilla you know happy ending and and, and it, that ending endeared to an, a generation and that movie in the musical itself is is fantastic in and of itself but it's just to me that's always just the the shining example of just like the overreach of uh, of execs particularly when a test audience gets to see a thing like that's almost the i, I feel bad for Mencken and and ashman because the yeah. test screenings killed that movie and almost killed little mermaid too when katzenberg tried to to cut uh uh the song the the big i want song from that film so like they were dealing with that their entire careers it seemed but yeah it, when we're talking about you know, films getting changed or, or someone coming in at literally the last minute and saying, no, you have to change how this thing ends. Uh, my mind immediately goes to Little Shop of Horrors. And I literally yep. just had the experience of watching it with both endings back to back. And uh, I think that's actually a, a lesson that people should actually learn in film classes. They should watch that with the original ending and then the proper ending to show what can happen. Well, listen, man, it's good to see you again. And uh, you should come on the show more. It was a great talk talk with you. Absolutely, I, man. I'm going to. Uh, I will. I will. I, I hate to 86 you, but hopefully Dave is waiting to come on. But um, yeah, and then Dave will be here. All right, man. Have a good Halloween, Wally. It was good to see you. Say hi to your wife. You, show her some horror movies. Tell her uh, you're a good man. I said so. <laughs> she knows that Perfect. already. That's why yeah, she married but the, you. The, the validation's great. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> 
So hopefully Dave uh, is waiting in the uh, in the in the. He will be jumping in in a second. But it's good to uh, to uh, have you also here, Mr. Wallace, because um, you can talk the industry. But you know what I wanted to say. Um, so Dave, let's see. Dave said he was waiting. Let me make sure he knows. Uh, waiting. Real quick while he's waiting. Uh, I don't know if you can see behind me. Is but, that uh, is that Elizabeth painting? Yeah. I will tell her that you she will love to see that. Yeah. Um let's see. Dave Dave is here. I'm going to put Dave Dave his hair is on point tonight. Uh I'm going to uh go ahead, let me just uh, get up here and um mm, 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 and add him to this conversation. He just saw Danny Elfman, which is uh, exciting. Danny Elfman at the Hollywood Bowl, which I hear is an incredible show. I mean, to me, Danny Elfman and Oingo Boingo are like the mainstream horror band anyway. So everyone, I was talking about it earlier. Uh, why not give it yet another plug? Uh, the film The Hills Run Red, which... Uh, I produced, but Dave Parker really conceived of and created it. Even though we got the material, it, it's really his vision. And this killer baby face was all from Dave Parker's twisted imagination. And uh, Halloween's probably his favorite holiday and somebody I've known for 30 years. So welcome, Dave Parker. It's not Midnight Metal. It's it's Rob's Observation. So we're talking Harry Night Horror. And, uh, oh, how- yes, of course. Airy day horror. That's exactly uh, what we need elevated. right now at 2 a.m. Come on, dude. Elevated Come on, horror. Man. How are you? Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, man. It's great. It's James, great. do you know it's Dave? Sure have you, have the two of you guys met? No, no. we haven't. Okay. So, James, Hello. James, tell, I, tell Dave, tell the, tell the people at home what you do in the industry. Sure. I'm a uh, production coordinator and usually have to put out fires uh metaphorically um but you've worked on you've been doing it for years 20 30 years i mean you've got you've got incredible i mean i've been working in industry over 20 years now i think of it but um i mean you have an amazing array of credits you've worked on many different things yeah yeah over the years um but as coordinator just you know about 10 years as coordinator but um like but on a lot of big things you've worked with a lot of interesting yes. people yes. i just wanted to clear that up so now now we've had this yes. industry panel now now dave <laughs> yeah I, I will ask you i mean obviously horror is your genre yeah you, the monsters is the best halloween movie that's come out this season that's it rob zombies the monsters that's it that's the there's there's your answer there you go <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would ask you, what are some of your touchstones of the genre? What are what are for, your what, for Halloween? No, no, for no, no, no. Oh. Just in general, in terms of horror films in general, you know, what are some of your favorites, your go-to favorites, and why? Oh man, I mean, uh, it, a lot of it depends on a mood. I mean, sometimes you're sometimes you're in the mood for a little. Uh, Italian uh, splatter, so you throw on zombie or the gates of hell, or uh, and now you can get zombie in 4K. In 4K, uh, now I just alphabetized mine. Well, no, I know, but I mean, you it was, I remember, it is, it is glorious. glorious. It's glorious. Bill Lustig is doing the Lord's work, he is doing the Lord's work. (laughs) Uh, so sometimes, though, so that one, uh, just because of uh, you know, that one. It's just so outrageous, and it's and it still has uh, probably my favorite <clears throat> splatter effect, which is the the splinter in the eye. It's, oh yeah, it, it's kind of an unparalleled <laughs> sequence. It's amazing, um, but sometimes you're you want you know, you want to be a little highbrow, and you throw on Rosemary's Baby, um, which is another know. film I uh, it had I I love that movie. Yeah. Sometimes you want to go on a roller coaster ride and you want to just be scared and jump and you throw on the descent. So uh, that's why I, that's why I love that movie. I mean, I literally like that, that one's, that one's like a good five to six uh, chair jumper, uh, but, but not cheap, but <laughs> not cheap, not cheap. No, chair no, no. Jumps either. Um, I love that. A chair. 
Uh, so so that would mean there's five to six chair jumps where you jump out of your chair in the movie. Yeah, yeah. That's man. what a chair jumper is. Okay. Yeah. It sounds a little classic. That you know, that was your pants moment. Film directed by our, our friend Neil Marshall, who has an, a new movie coming out next week. That mm-hmm. film, I love The Descent. I think The Descent is it's a masterpiece. It and, is. And um, what I love about that film is all the horror is and the suspense and the tension is because we, the audience, places themselves in the position of the characters in the movie. Sure. You're yeah. like, fuck, if I was there. I mean, yeah, it's literally got monsters in the dark. I mean, but it's it's that position where I think anybody who watches that movie can totally identify with those characters and know the situation. What I love about that movie is it lives up to the situation that it presents you. It doesn't let you down in no. terms of the premise. It, it It takes that premise and delivers on it. And a lot of times, horror films don't do that, it, it, and they're disappointing. Well, actually, and it I, over-delivers. It delivers so much more than what you expect the movie to be because you really what you don't expect about the movie and what makes it so great is the emotional, uh, yes, co- the emotional content and the emotional stakes that are in the movie are are done so well. Uh, and and obviously, horror is always best when you, the audience, has an emotional connection to the characters and what's going on. That's why Jaws is so terrifying. That's why Nightmare on Elm Street works. That's why Halloween works. You know, you know, with these touchstones, that's why Chainsaw. I mean, Ch- Chainsaw is a little different, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because it's not like, oh, you really love these characters. Because uh, you really don't get to know them that well. Right. It, that one is more of uh, the, the, the dread and relentlessness from frame one until the end. It's just, it just nonstop. It just doesn't slow down. It right. just builds and builds and builds to this. So, you know, that one is, you know, on, on a whole different level. And then you get something that's fun and yet emotional, uh, like Dawn of the Dead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, one of the things, the thing about I love about Dawn of the Dead is it's, it, it is about the collapse. I mean, the opening of Dawn of the Dead, you're at a TV station – which is broadcasting, which is always so buttoned up, and it's always going by the numbers. And you're you're watching it stands in, the 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 TV station stands in as the rest of as civilization collapsing. When you're getting to the point where, even on air, it doesn't matter if a PA walks behind somebody. <laughs> really it, it puts side, a, yeah, yeah, it puts and 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 you're watching this. This is civilization falling apart. But it uses the TV station as a metaphor for everything that's happening in the outside world. And I I love that. I mean, and that movie it also has great. Even though it's a low budget movie, it has huge scope. You know, you've got the attack on the tenement building at the beginning. Then they're, I mean, again, they again, that was a time where their money went a lot further, especially yeah. when you were not in Hollywood. I mean, you right. could really do something. Um, and you know, others are trying to uh, constantly duplicate that. But the the one thing that he had was you know time. Yes. Even if he didn't, he had one point five million dollars, I think, ultimately to make that movie. But he had from November to January <laughs> right. to shoot it. You know, what, and, and even though they were only they only could shoot in the mall at night, they right. still had yeah. So it's crazy. Um. Anyway, so I mean, those are some of my favorites. <clears throat> uh, you know, but I mean, that's the thing, Rob. You know, you know, there's there's so many. That you know, uh, you want to go older. I love the old Universal films, the Universal monster movies. I love Val Luton movies. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, some of those are like I think way ahead of their time. Um, <clears throat> but then sometimes you just you want you want some uh, healthy junk food. You want something like you know Killer Clowns from Outer Space. You, I mean, it, the it all burning. Just on, the burning. It all. Just I love the burning. On, depends the first on your Miramax mood. movie. <laughs> but what is? Uh, What's your guys, since it's the Halloween season, and we've been, I, I, I know a lot of people have been watching, uh, I mean, there's been so much stuff that's come out this month. Yeah. New stuff. It's crazy. You well, have Hellraiser. <laughs> you have Halloween Ends. You have Smile. You had Barbarian a little earlier in the year. Uh, you had Terrifier 2. You have, you know, <laughs> Which has made $6 million in the theater. $6.5 million. Bucks. 
you know. Which yeah, is I was talking great. earlier about horror. That's what this started out as a, a whole thing about an examination of the current state of horror. And, and it, you know, it's funny, Dave. I was saying that in our lifetimes, mm-hmm. how many times have we read think pieces about horror is back? Yeah, low budget horrors burning up the box office. It's like it's never gone. Away. It's never gone away, and we it it only it's since when you have du- a... since the beginning of film. What was it like? Edison's Frankenstein, nineteen ten, wasn't that? <laughs> I mean, the first one of the first pieces of actual film recorded film was what a train coming at people. Mm-hmm. And they'd show in the theater, and people would get up and run out of theater. Horror movie. <laughs> right. They were scared of the train. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Can you imagine never having seen? Uh, I mean, we're not that far away from a time. It's only 120 years, but yeah. to 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 be scared of an image, but because no one had ever captured movement like that before, and you're sitting in a theater and you didn't know what it was you were watching, right? But I think that's the thing. That's that's the other thing. You know, they always say, you know, like. Years ago, like in 2002, I did this documentary with Mike Mendez called The Masters of Horror before the Showtime yep. series. And we profiled at that time uh, the ones that were considered the greats. It was Toby Hooper. It was John Carpenter. It was Wes Craven. It was Stuart Gordon. It was uh, John Landis was in there. Uh, Guillermo del Toro was sort of, he was Guillermo was the he was the 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 young new breed coming in right uh, for it. You know, at that time, he had done um, Kronos and he had done Blade Two, uh, so <laughs> it was it was pretty funny. Um, but they're always, you know, they always and talk mimic. about and and mimic and mimic. That's right. Um, but they also they always talked about you know uh, what that thrill is for them and and the audience and uh, the the audience is like looks at a horror movie as almost like the rehearsal for their own death. It's a way of it's a way of making friends with the the great unknown, and you know, holy shit, you know, what what do you do with it? So you go cathartically and you you test yourself, like you know, you push yourself to limits in a in a safe in a safe environment. Speak, but the thing is, uh, but but the true power of uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but the true power of uh, a, a great horror movie is that you don't feel safe in the director's hands. You don't know what the fuck they're going to do. And you get a last house and left. You get a chainsaw. You get a Halloween. You don't know that they aren't, you get a shivers. They're not you know, your friend. They're, they're not playing by rules that you're used to or rules of, you know, sophisticated, you know, society, respectable society. They're going against it. Uh, by the way, kinky sphincter sends in a super chat and says, Dave Parker is here. Fire. My cheeks are soaked. Mm. <laughs> and then uh, no. Eric, Eric Skelton says The Exorcist Jason Miller was from my Scranton Was my Scranton pal My cousin was Miller's bartender And was at Farley's the afternoon Miller died in the doorway Of a heart attack Jason Miller was a, two, was a true Scrantoneer uh, Scrant- <laughs> Anytime they mention Scranton I just think of the office <laughs> yeah, Scranton, Pennsylvania <laughs> Um, who also who also has a very uh, two uh, very uh, prestigious sons, you uh, know. Well, George Romero. No, 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 Jason yeah. Miller. Oh, oh, yeah. yes. I thought you meant. Sons. I thought you meant. Yeah, Jason Patrick, and then he's got yes. Joshua Miller, who was in Near Dark. Near Dark who also, that's... is then a writer now too. Yes, as a matter of so fact, Jason Patrick uh, from the Lost Boys. Joshua Miller. Oh, look at that cover. Isn't, Isn't that, that neat? Gorgeous. Isn't that cool? That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. A little German media book action. I think I, I think I know that artist. I think that's uh Justin Osborne who did that cover. Uh that's a good question. I do not know. Uh, thank you, Dieter. I, 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 thank you, Dieter Bastion. Dieter, you bastard bastion. Um, um but what else? Okay, but but well, James, did you have a point to make before I yammer on? Yeah, Please. no. Um we were talking about the descent and you brought up the rehearsal of death and whatnot. And I just wanted to know which ending you prefer, because oh. when I saw it in the theater back in 2006, you know, the, the American the, cut. Yeah. And then I get the DVD that year and I was like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? And I actually prefer the European ending just because to me it seems 
kind of the more realistic and here this character is okay with her fate in a way yeah i look i the the version i saw originally was the european cut that you know neil's preferred the director's cut yeah which has the yeah. the original ending on it so that was the one i was always used to before it ever came out in theaters here i i i before i even knew neil i had been tracking this movie it was getting all this attention and so i pre-ordered it from the uk got it here before it ever came out through lines get here so that's the version i always knew that's and I that was I how i saw it too in, in, i think it's infinitely more powerful that way and and then you can pretend that the descent too is just a dream she's having and it doesn't actually exist and stuff i refuse to see it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did by the way dave you're getting a lot of love in the live chat really nice thanks guys i'm yeah. so much more sober this year I <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to fall asleep on the stream. But I'm but I'm working on it. Yeah, we aren't going to go until 6 a.m. No. <laughs> because Connie's saying it here to keep us, uh, to referee us, thank no, God. No. no. <laughs> she might be watching. I love she Connie. Might. I know. Well, um, if she's here. Uh, she and I, actually, on. Connie and I went and saw. Um, Hellraiser 1 and 2. Yeah, we saw. They were actually beautiful prints of both movies. And the Hellraiser, yeah, sure. the Hellraiser print had a British classification on it. So it was a British. Mm -hmm. It was a British print, and then um, the Hellraiser too. I think Pete Atkins brought that tr the that print his. himself. Nice, and it was good. It was great to see those movies together. I mean, I'm a huge Hellraiser fan. I, I love I love those two movies. Uh, yeah, I absolutely do. Um, what did you think? Uh, I and I'm sorry because I I know I'm getting on late. Uh, what did you think of the remake or not the remake? The 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 the, 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 the reinterpretation. This sort of re booty do you know i i actually i i know i have to say i enjoyed it i i didn't okay. i didn't love it but i enjoyed it i think that the real i think the the real problem with here it's the same thing i think about everything it's not smart enough the first the first hellraiser is a smart movie clive barker who wrote the hellbound heart wrote and directed that film and i think that one of the things that i didn't the thing that I always got from the first Hellraiser is that you, the, the Cenobites are there when they're called and that it, it's humanity. Right. You have to desire, like, the, the great thing about Hellraiser is you've got this guy in Frank Cotton. He's so light, he's so, like, he's done it all. He's tasted everything, he's imbibed everything, he's fucked everything, whatever. And he's gotten to a point in his life where nothing... What he needs is he literally needs hell to satisfy his desires. And he's been chasing after this thing. He opens the lament configuration and the Cenobites show up because they were called. Because Frank Cotton wanted them to come. He opens up the lament configuration. They tear his soul apart. And then even then, he's like, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm going to escape from hell. And it's all a big, it's all part of this ongoing thing about his and I love that. I mean, but, and in this movie, I thought that was a little muddled that you had the, the, it misses the, the, the idea. I mean, I love the idea that the Cenobites and Leviathan and hell or whatever, there's something that humanity people are questing after. And, and this movie mm -hmm. played a little, I mean, I, I like the, the Lu Lucy Goosey with the rules. Yeah, it was Lucy Goosey with the rules. And I, I, I did love the idea that Goran Vilsnik, or I can never pronounce his last name, that he was a like he was like a hell fanboy. He was a Cenobite fanboy. He collected all the lament configurations and he stood around and got people to, well, what do I win? Well, do I win anything? Well, I do. You know? Yeah, but that's, it's so weird. That's the part, you know, in a way, I, I agree with what you're saying is because that's the part is like, you know, what was interesting and what was sort of unique was, uh, I mean, I, I guess you could split hairs in Hellraiser that, you know, Kirsty is in the hospital and she's playing around in the box and, and she opens it, but it wasn't exactly, I guess in two, it really it was said that it's not hands that cause it's desire. Like, right emphatically but i put those two together so often so i think that I, I always think that's sort of the same sort of thing so in this one the hell the sound bites were kind of slashery they just kind of show up and 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 his 
thing of having other people open the box, it was like, well, how is that a, a, a kick for you? you and, and and I thought that the fact that the boxes are trapped, they're trap boxes now that cut you open and your blood fuels the, I'm like, well, that's not fair. You know, it's, and I'm like, you're, I get what they're trying to do, but you know what? I, it, it bums me out because I feel that, that I know David Goyer wrote it and I can't help but think. No, that, he didn't. He, well, funny, he, he, he produced did, it. He, he, he produced it because, funny enough, one of the writers is on my trivia team. Oh, so. and and I, I mean, I don't want to disparage anybody, but I just think that I felt that the whole, the whole movie was like you have these characters that are addicts. They met, and they didn't do anything with that. You know, the idea that addiction was a big part of that, and there's been many horror movies. There's literally been movies called The Addiction where they 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 tie it to vampirism and all that. But yeah. that said, that said. All of the things that I could I might have problems with. I will say this: I really appreciated the serious tone of the movie, and I really appreciated the way the Cenobites were portrayed. And I really like. I think my favorite character was that chick that worked for Homeboy, that was going and oh, getting. Okay. I loved her, and I love when they went and found her in the asylum and everything. I just thought that it was. A, it was. I thought it was a good movie. It had the elements where it could have been a great movie, but I'll tell you one thing: it made me interested in the Hellraiser franchise again. Yeah, that's true. But uh, funny you mentioned that character because I, you know it was like that opening that takes place in Serbia, and she col- and she gets the box and everything. I was like, oh, you know, let's explore more of that. Let, you know, that's you know, yeah. who, who, you know, the journey of finding this stuff and everything else. I always thought like really fascinating to me. It's like. I'd love a Hellraiser prequel in a way where it is Frank Cotton's story. It's like, what led him to go search out the box? You know, what was that life? He was the guy that was making the movies in a Serbian film. That could be fascinating. <laughs> that was him. No, but I, I think that, look. And truly horrific, you know, in I, its own right. I think that one of the great problems with movies today is the people writing them. This is not a slam on your friends. I'm just saying that. I don't think people are smart enough. It's not that, you know, they might be, but, you know, when you have someone like David Gore, uh, you know, Rob, as you well know, you know, sometimes well, these guys just like, hey, no, this is how I want it. Well, yeah, and of course. yeah, And, and, I, then, I was, and yes. then it's like, boom. Okay. It's like, well, we <clears> think that's kind of stupid too, but, you know, David Gore is the one that's making this happen. Yeah. We, well, James yeah. was just talking about that earlier before you came on, right. you know, with, with day shift. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the thing. And you look, you and I know, you know, no matter how, you know, the, the good intentions and plans that you have for certain things and how much prep and work that you put into something, uh, things can change instantly when you're on set. Right. You know, yeah. The tone yeah, yeah. shifts dramatically, everything just by the by the whim of, of a person that you can't say no to. Yeah. By the way, I you just know. want to say uh, the Legolas became a member of the channel. And then Legolas sent in a super chat and said, I had Google Play credits, so I'll spend them here. Well, thank nice. you, Legolas. First of all, thanks for becoming a member, and uh, thanks for supporting the channel. And I like the fact that you're a cool Lord of the Rings character. So that's, And you, you survived the Battle of Helm's Deep, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but, there is, but there's Hellraiser for us. Let's move on to another <coughs> hot topic, Rob. Another hot. We got, we got to jam a lot in. It's been a long time, man been a long time it's been we haven't talked to in a while well yeah and and james has probably seen these things too yeah what, what is the next hot what is the next hot topic come on baby evil died a couple weeks ago oh god <laughs> halloween did, did it though and halloween did, and did no it. as long as there's money to be made evil will never die <clears throat> you know i but, have to um, say, I, I, I honestly i have to say this rob, rob, rob loved halloween I hated all three of these movies. <laughs> I mean, I hate saying I hated them all. I, 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 you know, one of the one of the things that's so great about and I've, people who've watched this channel for any length of time know that the very first piece of physical media I ever owned was Halloween. Oh God! I'm not going to yes. say it, Dave. I know you hate it most, I know, but uh, but I would time. say I I would say though that that Halloween, the original Halloween, is something that's been in my blood. I've seen it a hundred times. But what what is so great about that movie? is it's not histrionic the direction is very restrained believe it or not i mean dean cundy's 
observational camera work. Um, it has peak verisimilitude. There, it, 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 it's a film that is even though they shot it, it's very evocative of the of of the the time of Halloween, the mood. It, it, it's just it's a beautifully simplistic movie that barely has a drop of blood in it. Yeah. That is very 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 effective and at doing what it it's supposed to do. And to see what has happened, <laughs> watching Halloween, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends, it was so far away for me for what it was supposed to be. And the fact that there's this familial relationship or whatever, it's just, I'm none of it makes any sense. And I just, I don't care about any of it because it became ordinary. And it became nonsensical. And it became, it was no longer lyrical. It was not a, it did not have a fairy tale element to it. It was dumbed down and it seemed, you know what? It, it was generic. It was a generic film. I, the fir, the only thing I loved about ha the three Halloween movies was the opening scene in the asylum in the first Halloween, in 2018's Halloween. Yeah, but uh, even, uh, I'm sorry, I even had a problem with that. What well, fucking doctor lets you know some putz who runs a podcast you know uh, shout and scream at a yard working up the entire fucking inmates uh, uh, who are outside it's look like, give me a break i mean know? that was yes that was dumb but i i like the idea behind it first of all the, the michael myers character is what 70 <laughs> it's just like whatever hey danny elfman is 69 Nine. years old pal and how was the show by the way it was amazing it yeah. was incredible because it was a it was a mix uh it was basically uh if anyone saw his Lala Palooza set. Um so it's a combo combination of songs from his new album Big Mess, uh his film and TV score stuff, and Oigo Boingo. So nice. it's uh, intermixed throughout in in a in a very very interesting show and it's and it's the hollywood bowl man i mean it's like you know it's it's a great place to see something i wish we were we were a little far away i wish we were a little closer but what what am i complaining about it was like the ticket was offered to me and i'm like i wasn't even planning on going so uh, and, it, and 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 again because danny elman is 69 years old you know how many times are we going to see this right in, in in your life you know this is it, it was really incredible <clears throat> well, was i really i saw good. i saw oingo boingo twice the last time i saw him was at irvine meadows when, yeah i uh, saw uh, i saw well mike mendez and i who i went with tonight who's a fellow director horror director uh who has a new movie out look for it in festivals called satanic hispanics yes um, there's the there there there's your plug mike um and it's very good uh but we went to the very last show at the Universal Amphitheater in 1995 when Boingo retired. We were both there. Yeah, yeah, I didn't go to that show. We were, we were mega fans. We would go every Halloween. I used to, but when I first moved out here, I went to Danzig every Halloween, which was at Irvine Meadows, because then Boingo moved to Universal. And then one year, instead of going to Danzig, Mike took me to Boingo. I was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm not. I, I'll. I, uh, this is what I'll see every Halloween from now on. You know, around that time. And uh, yeah, so very special, amazing. If you if you get a chance, I I highly recommend it. It's it's really, you know, because it's it's for, it's for the old rock fan. It's for the new rock fan. It's for you know people who love great film and TV music too. Okay, now you guys, I'm gonna ask both of you this. Speaking of Halloween, you know, our boys over at Blumhouse. And and the director of those Halloween movies are now doing a Exorcist trilogy with Ellen Burstyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't care. Uh, Not interested. I, I Did just... you hear what she said about that? No. So, like, I was like, maybe there's some legitimacy to this since she's involved because she didn't do anything else with those movies. And she said, well, they offered it to, it was in a Hollywood Reporter um interview i believe she's like they offered it to me once and i turned it down but then they came back to me with double the offer and i realized that the actor's school needed another building or something reconstructed so i was like okay so she's doing it just for the money <laughs> at least she's honest I mean, 
I'm not surprised. The funny thing is, and she's well, ninety, right? Yeah, but to me, it's like, um, and they are literally shooting it right now because my friend Ryan Turk is in Georgia right now on on the production. Um, but what you know. Look, I'll keep an open mind and see it because, you know, if I hadn't kept an open mind, I wouldn't have watched the Exorcist TV series. And actually, both seasons of that are really good. Yeah, the first season in particularly is, is very good. But, but to me, it's almost like at this point, what more – I mean, the reality is there is nothing left to be said about most of these movies. There's certainly nothing left to be said about The Exorcist. Well, I think, you know, it's, what's interesting to me is that <clears throat> The Exorcist and even Exorcist Three. Uh, that William Peter Blatty directed. I, I'm a big fan of, of that film. And I just, I, I think that, you know, horror, one of the things about these horror remakes is horror does reflect the time in which it's made. And now applying the whole idea of, of resur- resurrecting IP doesn't necessarily always translate to horror. Because unless you are sort of cognizant of the fact that that horror reflects the time in which it's made unless you're going to infuse your movie with a little bit of 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 the of the zeitgeist of the time it just doesn't work the funny thing is david gordon green even when he was making halloween and halloween kills with the mob mentality of halloween kills and everything said hey, we were we were reflecting the times as they were well, you can argue that he did it well or not but that at least is his agenda i think the agenda of blumhouse is we are going to get the biggest titles in this genre that we can possibly get and do our spin on them because they are pre-sold and right. we will make money well that's that, right but that is the main motivating factor right which, or wrong but which is ironic because blumhouse has done some really interesting stuff uh unique spins on things like like lee wanell's invisible man, man or sure. Or, or even even Shyamalan's. Um, I, I like Split a lot, which was a continuation of his of his, uh, you know, Unbreakable right. thing. But 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 what's like going back and doing these? It, what's so funny because the modern the modern generation is has no attachment to The Exorcist. You know that movie came out in nineteen seventy three. They just know that it's a, you know in horror circles that's one of the big ones. The title is big. Right. They've all they've all heard the title whether they've seen it or not. Of course, but I would think that yeah. what I what I just do not understand is if you look at Smile worldwide, a brand new original title that came out of nowhere, first time director. That movie's made 180 million dollars worldwide, and sure. Uh, Blumhouse has not made that kind of money with an IP. I mean, maybe they did with the first Halloween. But Look, I mean, no, they they they've made more on that first one for sure. They made over two hundred million dollars. They did. They look. They've done well with with the. I don't know how this last one is doing, <clears throat> um, but they even did well on the last one, which was also a uh, theater Dane. and yeah, Dane did. peacock premiere. But they they. I mean, wouldn't you much rather Barbarians made for four and a half million, and then it makes forty million at the box office? That's a huge. That's a huge return. Uh, sure. I mean, but that was the way Blumhouse used to be. Now they're spending more money. It, it, look, it's it's the it's the new line scenario. You can see it. I know. They were spending low and 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 getting high return, and now then they started. Oh well, we want to be more legit, so we're going to spend more and more money and everything. And it's just like at a certain point, then they're going to you know they spent. Four hundred million dollars to get the rights to do three Exorcist movies. I mean, at that point, it's just like, why? Why? You can't come up with. You used to be able to come up with some pretty original things. And Look, it's like man, now you're not back in that. It's like, come on. You know, I think my my new go to Halloween movie is the Autopsy of Jane Doe. But it's okay. I. Now, lo- I, I love the movie. Lo- I, to me, the autopsy of Jane Doe has the wit and the verve of a great low budget. It, it, it has a it, it has a very simple idea, simple location. It's got two great actors, Emil Hirsch and Brian Cox, and actually three because the dead corpse. It's really scary. It's really it's good. Really scary moments in that movie, and it's for it's sure. brilliantly done. And I look at that movie. I think that movie was made for like one point five, something. And when you're when it, it was funny because that director is Norwegian, correct? Yeah. 
because one of one of one of the people who at least was in the room watching earlier was like had anyone has anyone seen any norwegian films and i was thinking well i like troll hunter a lot yeah it's not terrifying but then there's these other films that i believe are norwegian called cold prey they did three of them which is sort of a a ski slope slasher kind of thing but it's like those were really good so i don't know if that guy's there but yeah he just mentioned uh yeah but uh yeah autopsy of jane doe is it was a a really nice surprise because it was solid through and through. I, I I definitely check that one out once a year. Not it's not uh, like oh Halloween I have to watch it. Uh, there's others that are definitely <clears throat> my must go to. I just and, I, I, and I'm curious about that too. Like okay, Halloween is in two days. If you were gonna throw, say you were gonna throw yourself a little mini marathon, say like pick three movies and it had like that that give you the the Halloween season, the feels, and 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 everything, and you know, I, I would be curious to hear what your guys uh, like. Just top three picks of like if I was going to do a little marathon. James, how about you go first? Halloween, the fog, Halloween three. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, one of them would absolutely be the changeling because I just watched it again mm -hmm. and it feels like a Halloween movie. Okay. It's set, you know, they shot it in Vancouver, but it's set in Seattle yep. and it's set in an old, big, windy, dark house and it's a ghost story. Mm -hmm. And I think with, so that would be one of them only because I love that film and I, I, I accidentally watched it again. I put it on, I watched it for like two minutes. I'm like, and I kept watching it and I kept watching it. And I think Black Sunday, a.k.a. Mask of the Demon, Barbara Ooh. Steele, Mario Bava. I love that movie, and it has all so the... So Rob's going, so classy. Well, no, I mean, but but that's when you think... Of, to me, because you Rob, have... Rob, Rob, well, you know, guys, let me, let me set the picture for you. Uh, see, Rob uh, lights the candles in the, in the theater. Uh, he then goes and puts on his ascot and smoking jacket he pours himself a nice glass of port and then that is not true and then his terror begins no because dave <laughs> you got to go classic with halloween because it's halloween you got to have those classic elements and mask of the demon which i watched with elizabeth i mean it's got you know it's 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 got old dark it's, craggy it's funny forests, i agree with it's you. got I, a a demon coming back from the past, and I think that the third, the the third movie would third. have to be Vampire Circus. Okay, See, Hammer's Vampire Circus. All all old stuff, man. That's interesting. That's really interesting because I want to cure it. See, the thing is, like, but see, it depends what kind of a Halloween you want to have. Well, no, see, but that's a, no. But what I asked you and you answered it. That's your ideal sort of Halloween playlist. Yeah, because that's like, top you, three. You have pumpkins, and you've it, got it, it cover. You do where? Who's got? Where's the pumpkins? Well, no, but I mean, you you. Well, we have a pumpkin, but the the you 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 have to be. I mean, in terms of classical elements, to me, Halloween has an element of age to it. You know, it's sure. modern modern. If I was going to do something modern horror, like the autopsy of Jane Doe, is about a witch. So. To me, that would be if I was going to go modern. Like, if you said movies in the last ten years or twenty years, modern horror, I would probably go. I would uh, Pumpkinhead, Stan Winston's Pumpkinhead, The Autopsy of Jane Doe, and maybe Halloween Three. Okay, cool. You know, because. And by so the way, wanna... did you read the direct? Did you read the director who, who when he talked about Gr Green, when he talked about how he w wrote the original ending of Halloween Ends? Uh, yes. I'm like, uh, what the it, why it, the fuck didn't he do that? And it's funny because uh, he established those masks in his own movies. He kills. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, well, no, they were actually in. Halloween. They were in Halloween too. In, in, 20, really? in 2018, those trick or treaters do pass by. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis screams at them, says, "Go get inside." 
and they're they're there. So they they were established. So uh, I'll give them credit; they established things in the first that continued through. They yeah, but um, but <sighs> okay. So you know, my Halloween night, depending on my mood, but you know, I want to go a little. You know, I want a little. I want a little bit of everything, Rob. Got to get a little bit, a little <clears> bit of it. all that stuff. So I want to start with a short. So I would start with Disney's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, The Adventures of Ichabod. Okay, that's okay. Uh, see, I would, I would, I would give you that for for yeah, sure. I want to, I, I want to start there, and then, um, and then I want to go. Uh, you know, I'd even go. I'd give you, I'd give you a Baba because I think, I think the other thing that's fun about Halloween, you get a little, you get an anthology going on. You get, you get a, you get a good couple of stories and stuff like that. But I, so I would go Black Sabbath. Okay, it's cut because it's more Halloween to me than Black Sunday because it's colorful, it's bright, and it, you know it's scary in that way and it's got a vampire story and it's got you know this old you know psychic dude dead the you know the drop of water which is one of the most terrifying uh stories ever put in an anthology um and then uh that's for me to pick that because creep show actually is set at halloween yeah but that I mean that I would that's a good one. You know, but but I wouldn't want to do two anthologies. So then right. it's like so then okay, uh then I get my uh so is that two or three? That's two. So Ichabod and, short. and, and, and so the short. So I got uh Black Sabbath. Um I would I mean I would probably because it's Halloween, and just because I've seen Halloween so many times, I would probably go trick or treat, which is sort of an anthology, but it's not. But it is it it, it really captures. and it's in theaters this weekend for the first time, and it cap but it captures that spirit so yeah, no, it's good, um, yeah. And you know, then uh, and then if I'm going like doing a last one, like I, I'm going to go for you know something a little. Uh, tougher maybe a little little darker i you know i hmm it's tricky you know pumpkin head's a pretty good choice but i but uh, it's it's it's, neat. Got, it's got classic it's 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 it would be my trick see here's the thing i don't think most of the horror movies that i love are halloween movies right no, but that's why I wanted to specifically talk about Halloween movies. No, one that I think is really, it's not fantastic, but I really do love so much of it. And I think it's really underrated. And it's a newer movie. Speaking of the autopsy of Jane Doe is scary stories to tell in the dark. I love the feel of that movie. I think there's so much that really works in it. I really like, I, I, I really think that one gets like underappreciated. I, you know, I like that. I think that what's what's interesting is, I think when I think about Halloween movies, I like movies that aren't necessarily about Halloween, but that take place over Halloween, perhaps. Right. Like I believe that the autopsy of Jane Doe, that that Jane Doe was brought in on Halloween. They just I can't. I it can't was remember coincidental. If it wasn't. I can't no, remember it, if it, it was. It wasn't. It, it wasn't. But 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 well, it then, could then be. That doesn't count. No, it the, could be, but it doesn't count. But that. But what I mean is that <laughs> that movie. It, no, it, it's it, what I say that. Like for instance, as I a Halloween. Movie, yeah, I don't think like a, ni- a Nightmare on Elm Street does not take place at Halloween. I would not pick no. that as a Halloween movie. No, and, which is surprising though that they never used any sort of halloween iconography ever but i guess they were just like going no that's halloween's territory they got it fine who cares yeah yeah and i i think that 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 like i would say you know what phantasm could be a halloween movie i would give that a I, I and that's one of my favorite horror films of all time oh, i love that movie i, 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 I love, I love that series it. and i would say that phantasm because it could that movie's after all about well, a lot well, of tricks well then there's a I mean, one that is set on Halloween, which uh, was the the one the the earlier Coscarelli movie. That's the kids Dan, Kenny and, Com- Kenny Kenny and Company, Company, right? Which is a really fun one for kids. I would, you know, if you're looking for stuff for 
kids and that's the thing it's like i guess i like to keep halloween a little kid centric and yeah the monster squad know, monster <laughs> squad is great monster squad's a you know amazing movie yeah uh, night of the night of the creeps really fun too. night of the creeps is yeah yeah those uh oh someone just said drag me to hell i mean it, look well, now we're just getting into horror movies that we love right <laughs> that are just so so great and everything but uh yeah i like watching um not that it's a halloween movie but I do like watching the original Evil Dead this time of year. That's a good, yeah, it's a good, uh, that's a, that's a fun movie. By the way, you know, I, you know what? I can't believe I did not mention this. I, I want, I wanted to mention this early on. You mean the thing, my movie that came out yesterday? Yeah. No, I didn't mention that. <laughs> Would you like to mention that? No, go ahead and mention your mention. I'm going to pour myself a, 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 a refresher uh, while you mention. Okay. So what I was going to mention is, I like this trend and and Barbarian being one where the studio uh, is aware when a when a test screening happens. Normally, test screenings are, but the studios in multiple occasions now have seen horror films. Smile, Barbarian, and Evil Dead Rise, or Evil Dead Rises, Evil Dead Rise. All three of those movies benefited from great test screenings, and they were all films that were going to go to streaming. And all three of those movies, including Evil Dead Rise after the first of the year, are getting theatrical and very successful theatrical releases because of the test screenings <coughs> and the fact that the studio executives, the gatekeepers, so to speak, understood the value of those films. That didn't used to happen. And when we're yeah. seeing when we're seeing competent horror films, when the studios have decided the same thing happened to um, Blue Beetle. The fact that studios in the streaming era have seen that the films that they're making, which they thought were going to be streaming only, turned out to be better than they thought and obviously connect with audiences. The fact that studio executives are saying, well, wait a minute, let's put these in the theaters. Because as everyone knows, I am a proponent of that. Any theatrical, a successful theatrical run for a movie ups its value for its entire life. And if a film has a barbarian, Four and a half million dollars spend makes forty million. Smile internationally already at one hundred and eighty. Um, these low budget films, when they do well, their value is increased immeasurably by a successful theatrical run. And for studios to recognize uh, that these films have this potential is always a good thing. And I'm also the fact that Smile, first time director. Yes. And that's it, where that's where people can really, budget. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where that's where um, uh, horror can really really excel. First time directors can really make their mark in horror, as and this it's always been that way. You know, directors mm -hmm. can always launch, and and nowadays, you know, the what what I really like is that classical horror is not so much in favor now. But really interesting horror is like if you have an interesting premise, like like Happy Death Day. I like the Happy Death. I Day I really movies. like that movie a lot. I think they, that really first, good. I, actually, I think both are actually really interesting. They both they are really the sequel is they did the Back to the Future thing where they did it so different. I was like, oh, this is cool. It's not just a slasher thing this time. No. It was. I, I like that a lot. But it was funny because Rob, you know, I talked uh, after I saw Barbarian, and the thing is, is like. I remember saying to you, it was like, uh, it's not for me. I've seen too many horror movies. Uh, you know, right. and, 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 and we had this discussion because I was really kind of baffled why people loved it so much. I was like, because to me, it was like, uh, once it reveals what it is, I was like, that's it. I've seen this before. And I just had a problem getting over that. I respected and I was happy that it did well. Um, and I think that the the first act is, is for the most part pretty great, but I still think there's a lot of stupid things that <laughs> the characters do in it. Um, and uh, but I had a real I remember talking to you because I had a real problem because I was like, what what am I what am I missing here? You well, know? I, and and, the, and then you told me, and I understood it more. It didn't change the fact that the movie doesn't work for me. Well, once I mean, once there there is a people under the stairs element, <laughs> you know there yeah, there but don't is. Don't spoil it for people who just haven't seen it yet because it just went on to HBO. Right, right. 
I'm not trying to spoil it, but I'm just saying that yeah, I think even, even saying that it might throw people like, oh, here's where it is. But they're obviously we know that there's something yeah. underneath. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I, I have this reputation of spoiling everything recently. You, like, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't but I'm not, I don't not, do not that. Recently. I don't I, spoil <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but you just happen to say little things and like, ooh. Well, I, yeah, I don't, I get, yeah, I guess maybe. <laughs> but no, but I think that horror, look, horror is a genre, if it's interesting. My my whole thing is this: what I miss in horror is I miss the 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 like I love David Cronenberg, and I was really happy on NPR. They had these two critics. I didn't know them. They do a the they do a, they do here's what they do: they do a show. Uh, they have a podcast called Movie Therapy, which I've never heard before. And they were on NPR. They were talking about horror films, and I wasn't too impressed with their horror film knowledge. But one the guy there was a guy and a girl, and the guy. Um, he his last suggestion was The Brood, was talking about Cronenberg and The Brood. And one of the things about, so David Cronenberg, I love David Cronenberg. He was hugely influential to me in my early film-going life because he turned horror, I he had very conceptual horror ideas that he would turn into very visceral horror ideas and never more so much than in The Brood. And in the brood, the brood is a devastating movie about the effects of divorce on kids, and it's about it's about a man who is married to a nightmare of a woman, who goes out of her mind, and she winds up with this psychiatrist named Doctor Hal Raglan, played by Oliver Reed, and and in Cronenberg fashion, Doctor Raglan has come up with an idea called psychoplasmics. And his therapy consists of taking your trauma, whatever your trauma is, and working through it. And your trauma externalizes itself on your body somehow. And and a lot of the times it's devastating for people. Like their trauma becomes huge growths, cancerous growths on their necks. And um, I love this. I, I, I think this is such a great... It's conceptual. So, so is that what happened to the Troll King and the Hobbit? <laughs> I I don't know, but what I I love you don't know. I love Cronenberg's movies for that reason. It would take a really interesting sort of a uh, an intellectual thought experiment, and he was able to externalize those ideas and turn them into horror. Like that's a that's a that's a weird conceptual idea that he then gives literally he makes flesh. And I love that. And then, of course, his star pupil is this wife, the wife of our main character, this sad sack husband, Art Hindle. And um, um, the the uh, and what happens? I don't want to ruin anything, but it's quite interesting. <laughs> and it is. and it's I real, it's real. It's fun for the whole family. It's fun for the whole family. And it's it's a horror movie that I love. And I find it devastating, but it's also weird. And and I want to see more of that, that weirdness happening. And we've seen some of it. We we entertain and raw and there's under been the skin fresh under the skin. There's been some good stuff. There's some weird ones. They just don't make money, man. Well, I don't think they're the problem is they're they've got the great premise, but the people that are making them haven't thought the premise through. And Maybe. so we get like like I loved Swallow. The movie Swallow, but it really didn't go in. I don't I know what you're thinking? Don't uh, come, on. come on, jeez, man. Okay, fine. All right, Rob, it's Halloween. It's a party, man. Uh, give me so, so. Give me, give me a little. Give me, give me a trashy fucking title that you like. Stop with this. Uh, the brood and the mise en scène of it. Oh, come the, on, dude. You, the, you've. All, the, I said earlier before you were here that you always. You're like enough with the philosophy. Stop the Jesus. philosophy bullshit. Yeah, that was his thing on set. I was like, "What's the philosophy?" I go, the fucking guy with a mask trying to kill people. Fuck your philosophy. I'm not saying and I'm wrong, like, but listen. at the time it wasn't helpful. It's like I'm trying to make the night here, you bastard. That's What's true. The philosophy. It's true. That was uh, that was. I would be yes. I. <laughs> it's funny. I've had a. I've had a, a. A person, an individual, talk to me about being involved in a writers' room in a TV series. I'm like, nah, I don't think you'd want me there. Oh, honestly, God. Oh, I don't think you would. <laughs> like Nothing as long as I. Done. 
But I would well, love to have a camera there rolling while you were in the room. It would be well. No, I mean, I would just, I, I would just, you know, I would l- look. I think the very best television shows are are television shows that are smart, where the where the the showrunners know what they're making. I, and I agree I, with you. That's it. That's all. And and I think I I am a, I am a product. That's all I would do is ask. And it's very apparent. I think it's very apparent. And I I know a lot of people. We know a lot of people that work in TV. I've no. I've only directed five episodes of a TV a Skinamax show for. I'm an HBO approved director, but that's all. That was my only experience working in TV. But let me tell you, the stories that I've heard from many of our friends who work in TV. I mean, wow. I oh, just yeah. a writer's room. The I they're like com- there's there's com- in Hollywood there are the mo- the most disgruntled people are comedians. The second most disgruntled people are television writers. There's if nobody. Play, there's it, no more class if you play, of people. If you played it right, man. If you did it like Survivor, and you just learned how to like sort of like slowly glom on people, not say too much, just a little and stuff like that. You just coast on that writers' room money. Fuck that shit. Woo! The thing is, most of those writers don't know what the fuck they're doing anyway. That they're, they're they're all coasting off of however they got into that writers' room. Hey, no the, one knows the, anything. The, 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 William the, Goldman said that no one knows anything. Yeah, but he did know. Well, he wrote Butch Casting the Sun Hits Kid. Even he would say no one knows anything, including me. He's even said it. He admitted sometimes I don't know either. But Look, um, but you know what? Before we get into this, you know. Sorry, we don't. Yeah. Let's go back to the horror, Dave. Yeah, no, get, give me. Get, okay, now you know. Now you you've talked about your your highbrow, your elevated horror. <laughs> give me a give me a goddamn trashy title that you love. Just give me so that's pure trash, pure trash. Horror. You can't so Star Crash doesn't count. That's science fiction. I know. Tenebrae. That's not trashy enough. That's not trash. That's actually pretty cool. I like Ten. Okay, that's that's. It might be my favorite Argento movie. Love Tenebrae. Okay, it's great. <clears throat> um, trash, man. I'm talking. Okay. Oh, trash. I got it. I got it. You know what movie I fucking love? Basket Case. Humanoids from the Deep. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fucking go, humanoids Renoids from the deep. A movie that starts with the rape of a woman that carries through to the point at the end when she gives birth to the the humanoid hybrid human baby that tears through her. I mean, literally, it tears through her stomach at the end. Oh man! Humanoids yeah. from the deep yeah. fucking rules. And by the way, the rest of that movie is kind of beautifully done. Doug McClure. It's got a James Horner score. It's a beautiful score. I mean, despite the fact that there's literally a humanoid from the deep rape scene, that's kind of hot. I mean, you asked. You want to know? I mean, uh, that movie is trashy but awesome at the same time. If you, James, if you, if you kids out there movie. haven't seen Humanoids from the Deep, you are missing out because it rules. And it's streaming somewhere, guys. Tubi TV's got it. Probably beautiful HD master. Go check this movie out. Humanoids from the deep, baby. Yeah, James, trashy. Extra, mm. extra. I have that. I have a special yeah, edition of extra. Yeah, Rob. What that has a great think? birth scene in it too. <laughs> Another yeah, of a uh, full size man. Oh man, that scene's hardcore. That is a now, very. Now we're getting there. Now that is a very trashy. weird movie, James. I hadn't seen it, it in a while, so I, I was like, I remember I had the Thorn EMI VHS tape of that when it first came out. It's fucking weird, man. Thorn EMI. My former stepdad owned it, and I watched it like when I was ten or eleven, and I was just like, "What the hell am I watching?" Yeah, yeah. No, it's crazy. I saw. I finally saw that too. It, yeah, it's crazy. Now we're getting to it, man. Now we're now we're getting to the beast within. Oh, that's good. In, Paul we're Clements. Getting the, we're getting the street trashes. We're getting into you well, know, that's a Frank little and Hooker. Marcus. Those are that, those are trashy. I mean, Street Trash is a great movie. And so is Basket Case. Way. Basket Case is brilliant. It's a great movie. It's um, absolutely brilliant. Belial. Love it. Absolutely. There's the people are throwing out like pieces, pieces. You That's don't have to one. go to, to Texas to for, a to, for a chainsaw massacre. massacre. <laughs> Come on. Um, Starring Christopher George and Linda Day George. <laughs> um, 
uh, somebody's Michael Lynch is like, yes, Dave's back. That's right. Metal. Um, mm. and speaking of metal, I mean, look, I didn't want to bring it up because I mean, of course, I'm watching Trick or Treat from 1986. Sure. AKA Ragman, which you still have my Blu-ray. I do. You could have put it. You could have put it in the mail. It's right you could have put it in the mail. I I need to see you because I have to get the copy of Hills Run Red autographed for Dieter. Mm, just, just, just forge my name. I'm know. not gonna forge your name. I don't do that. <laughs> Fuck just, that. Just do it. Just go, Dieter. You're the absolute best. You trash panda. Love Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no, I'm not going to do that. I don't okay. do that. Uh, let's let's think of uh, Rob. Uh, did you know I wanted to do a prequel to Pieces set in in in, in um like uh, old colonial times? <laughs> no, I was Dave, gonna, I was I gonna did call not. it. I was gonna call it Period Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. Dave told a dad joke on Halloween. Let I love that it. Sink in. Wow. Actually, before it gets too late, we have to talk about my absolute favorite thing that came out that will always now be a perennial Halloween viewing. Okay. The what? best thing that Marvel has put out in 10 years. Oh, oh. Werewolf, Werewolf by, by night. night. Well, okay. You need to tell people that you're obsessed with Man Thing. <coughs> You've been talking about Keep Man wrong. Thing. Rob. Jeez, <laughs> you've. Been, I mean, stop it. You've been talking. About, <laughs> you've been talking about Dave, my giant Dave. sized man thing. Dave, like, just stop it. So just stop. My, oh my God. Stop. Just stop. Just it's it's something that's been on your mind. I've the man it. oh thing. It's, it's it's right it's for a very there. long time. No, but right you know, in all, in all seriousness, you have been you've been a you've been talking about man thing for years, and. <laughs> The character, the Marvel Comics man thing. I think the everyone knows one. Werewolf by Night, oh, yeah. you know. And I will say, I love and Ted because that is Man Thing's real name, uh, Ted. Ted Salas. Um, yep. I I would say that uh, to and this is not the first Man Thing movie. This is the second. You know, the <sighs> other ones. I know. I won't bring that. I know. I don't yeah. want to bring. But painful. But painful. I will say this: the depiction of Man Thing and Werewolf by Night was great. Yeah, people. I hated it because some people were calling it like you know, uh, you know, buddy, buddy Groot or something like that. They were just calling them like those you know, people another group. are fucking idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. Fuck. But them. the funny, it's it's just so. Do you know that can be built? An yeah. Animatronic. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's huge. It's so gorgeous. Do you know Man Thing came out before Swamp Thing? Yes, I do. These are things. This this <clears throat> try nose snuffle up against swamp monster has just never gotten the love until now. Now everyone's going, oh, we love Ted. We love Man Thing. It's great. And I've been like the one carrying this fucking torch by myself for twenty years, going this this Ke- thing. Kevin Feige produced a Man Thing movie pre MCU. <laughs> I know it was awful. It was awful. I broke my heart. We were in New Zealand when we found out one of the effects people had built that fucking man thing. They showed it. I was like, oh, "This is terrible." This is terrible. I don't even have to see the movie. It's awful. We were in we were on Narnia, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, we were working on Narnia, and that. Yeah, but uh, uh, but where will not like when we were like... playing Burnout in Omaru for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a video game, folks. That's true. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a video game. Um, <laughs> which we did not have. We didn't get. <laughs> Anyway, that's another story. By the way, the professor presents uh, sent in a super chat that says, "Here's his list: Trick or Treat, Halloween 1978, and A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Four. All right, it's very fun and colorful. That's uh, the Dream Master. Yes, it's Rennie Harlan's. Yeah, it's Rennie Harlan's because it's Dream Warriors, Dream Master, Dream Child, Dream Child. Yeah, yeah. Um." Good. That's a, that's a good fun. That's a f- good fun choice there, uh, man. This guy who's going under the name. Which you'll, it, look, we got Werewolf by Night, Rob. Next Halloween, I'm predicting Tomb of Dracula. Well, you know, with Blade coming out, 
I mean, Dracula and the appeared with the X Men. Oh, so, I know. He fucking bit Storm. Uh, yes, he did. He bit. He bit Storm, and, and that's that. Hey, kids, look up the Storm Dracula X Men annual cover because it's fucking off. Aw- I mean, uh, was that? Lot. I think it's Bill Sinkevich. Is, is that it, a? I think it, it might her? be. No, it's know. it's. Hang on. Uh, uh, allow me. Let me find out. I think it's a Bill Sinkevich cover. Uh, let's see. Uh, X Men. Oh, storm. Let's see. But uh, I'm saying, uh, yeah, I'm predicting. It's X Men Annual Six, and uh, let me just see as I'm looking. I'm looking at this cover. Is it Sinkevich? I don't know. Um, dude, it looks like Bill Sinkevich to me. Yes, yeah. yes, it is. And allow me, I will. I will throw get this. I'm going to throw this bad boy up, and you can see. And okay, so in the 70s, kids, what uh, many people don't Actually, know, it was in the 80s. It was in the 80s. This this part, right? This well, no, this in this was 80s. in the 80s, but but in the starting in the 70s, 70s, right? Marvel licensed literary. I think Dracula. They didn't have to. Domain. They were all public domain. Right. Well, Frankenstein so, monster. Werewolf no, but but like Conan, Conan the Barbarian. Oh right, um, yeah, they yeah, did get some. Yeah, and there were some, and, and like John Carter of Mars, the Ed Grice Burroughs estate. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so. um, uh, yes, I will throw this up. This is not the cover. I, I mean, I was I re- misremember them, but here I'm going to throw this up so you can see. But yes, Dracula was a character in in Marvel, and I'm just curious: are they going to? You know what are they going? That's why you know Blade fascinates me so much because what are they going to do? How are they going to um, save it? Uh, well, well, yeah, like, well, not save it, but I don't let, think we need. I don't think we need another Blade right now. I don't think we need a Blade movie. I don't necessarily think so either, but it could be cool. Look here, so here is here's the X Men cover. Um, this is after I thought. I thought I don't know why I remember this. I misremembered it. Um, as as Dracula biting Storm, but this is post Storm being bitten, and so this is a Bill Sienkiewicz cover. Um, this is from 1982, and uh, it's actually from November of 1982. So it's going to be this cover is 40 years old, um, which is crazy. King size annual. You've always loved things that are king sized. I wish I had something king sized. Oh, I have this angle Gi- though. Giant size. I'm more into giant, giant size. Giant size, right? Giant size. There you go. But no. So this is um, <laughs> uh, uh, Chris Claremont wrote it. Bill Sienkiewicz. Yeah. And Dracula and Lilith. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, that was great stuff. And uh, you know that's the thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Man Thing. And the whole Werewolf by Night, they've introduced the supernatural realm. We had Agatha Harkness in WandaVision. But how, yeah, but this is really monsters. Yeah, how are they going to... And, and you saw the monsters up on the, the, the monsters that were killed? Yeah. Up on the... Like, there's a huge supernatural component. And my question still stands. When Thanos snapped his fingers, were vampires dusted too? Were the supernatural entities could I Ghost mean, Rider? I mean, vamp... Are. Were were they? We don't know. I, I mean, I I would think some were. I don't I, think all non magical, you know, only you know, mag, only. Well, it's hap- but, but that's that, the but thing. I mean, if it was people, that, that vampires would vampires are the undead. They're not alive. The thing is, what's interesting too, well, and that's a good point. But what also people don't know about Man Thing by even watching this is in the comic books, he plays an incredibly pivotal part. In something he, because he's the guardian of the nexus of yeah, all realities. Yeah, he's the nexus of all realities. And so are they going to use him in the – this is what has really bothered me about Phase 4 of Marvel. It feels like I never the, – the from the end of the of Iron Man 1, the post credit scene is Nick Fury talking to um, Tony Stark about the Avengers initiative. Right. So all of the Infinity Saga felt like it was leading – it was all of a piece – yeah, now everything seems loose. It's uh, all, all loosey goosey. I have no idea. Like, for instance, okay, we're gonna meet in Wakanda forever. The Talakan, you know, Namor. They control the sea or whatever. 
have they gone to the Indian Ocean and checked out the celestial that was bursting through the earth? Yeah, no shit. In Eternals, like, like that would have left a huge void. Did the ocean fill that void? Like, and, and when you see Arishem the Judge talking in space, who's bigger than the Earth, there's no mention of it. Um, it, it feels like there's nothing. There's nothing that has been happening. Oh, well, um, we see the we see a celestial and fucking Thor, blood and thunder. well, yes, but that's that's not on Earth. I know it's and ridiculous. It, too. It, it, it's like I hated that. That was the only Marvel uh, movie I absolutely like hated. I hated. I, I mean, I I don't hate all of it. I was just sort of head scratching with that one. But, a little but bit we have no there. understanding. There's no you, you have Egyptian gods fighting in Moon Knight, eating people's souls on the streets of Cairo. There was apparently a mass casualty event where ha- thousands of people died. Because you saw their souls coming up out of their bodies, being eaten. You know, bottom by... line is, I think, Mar- look, they've lost. They, the, the 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 streams have gotten loose. They've gotten, you know, it's like you know, it's like Ghostbusters. The 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 storage space like it, it got turned off, and things are just floating all around now. Now you have zombie taxi cab drivers. But what is the what is the cosmology? What is it all? And I think the the real the part of the reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe became successful was the intertwined nature of their large meta story, and I feel that in Phase Four they've completely abandoned that. I feel like nothing connects to anything else after Loki, which ends on a positively universal apocalyptic note with all the. And I've made the case that what if all of the movies in Phase Four that we're watching take place on different Earths? There's a there's a there is an I mean, argument maybe. there is an argument sure. to be made that we're watching and and if you're leading different up to universes Why Kang not? Dynasty and Battle World and Secret Wars you could do all of that but it's like you can bring it all together somehow and explain it that way that would be interesting but they haven't done that and I think that no. all these movies like look I want to know what the where's the situation where's Earth right now does anybody seem to care that there's a giant alien celestial no, that's I don't frozen know why. in the ocean in Earth. It, like, do the do, do the nations of the world care? I don't uh, care. Does, you know why? Why? Because we're off by night, and 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 Ted are like going to get sushi. That's all that matters. <laughs> and and it's funny because in the chat, uh, uh, Bartholomew Omac, I, I can't even, whatever said. It annoys me that Marvel have made Werewolf by Night really a ripoff of Universal's Wolfbane. It is so, well, the special is so not the Wolfman uh, movie. Uh, and they may do Dracula all before Universal sort out. So, look, the problem is this. They spend all this money on these Universal horror movies uh, and no one goes anymore because the general going audience doesn't care about the old monsters they don't care they don't well you know, i like mean the invisible the invisible man worked because it was a modern day totally new adaptation and here, then here's, get people here's a halloween beer for you cheers there, oh pure um, um yeah. but then you get then you get people complaining the, the the invisible man did something really cool something you know different with it and everything else and they go oh well he's not really invisible he's wearing a suit well it's like oh what because yeah you can you know inject yourself with drano and turn invisible come on Come on. Come I love on. when we get all sloppy late at night. It's fantastic. It's not that sloppy. I'm just ranting. That's all. Mm. I'm just a ranter. No, but I look, what I want from the MCU is what I what I love about the MCU is I love the <clears throat> MCU nature of it all. And I thought they did a fantastic job. And the culmination of Infinity War and Endgame are was unlike anything else. Yeah, no, and you watch those films earn I love both of those movies as one entity. And I, I mean I, I st- every single time I watch the beginning of Endgame when Hawkeye's family is dusted and it cuts into Mr. Fantasy playing over the Marvel logo, mm-hmm. that shit gets me every fucking time. And it's amazing how much those movies work and how they've <coughs> earned it all. And I look at phase four and I there's things I've liked more than others. I mean, James and I have talked about She-Hulk uh, She-Hulk is a show that felt like it had different people working on every episode. I'm like, uh, what is? There is no cohesion in either the concept or the execution. I've never, I've never seen a show. I really liked the first episode. 
I'm like, this episode's really, really good with Hulk and She-Hulk, and I, I liked all that. None of it held together. Why is Titania in there? The final episode when you're dealing with, uh, like, what is any of this? And and uh, the only thing about She-Hulk that I loved is the fact that you watched Daredevil walk the walk of shame. I thought that was genuinely hilarious. But the rest of it, I'm like, what is this? What is this supposed to be? How am I, as an astute viewer of the MCU that's been watching the MCU since 2008, how am I supposed to, what am I supposed to take away from She-Hulk? What have I learned? What statement are you making? And I feel that the people that wrote that show didn't know. And, and they did from one episode to the next. And I hate that. We have such great television writing, whether you're watching Vince Gilligan with Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, whether you're watching, you know, The Soprano, what, even Ozark, the, uh, the, all the, we're getting such great TV to see something that isn't great, that should be, that has an established lore and literally is the most successful franchise in the history of Hollywood, which is the MCU. To see things that don't work is maddening. And Phase 4 has been full of stuff that's either half-baked, it was affected by the pandemic, or or the people, and this is what I really hate to say it, the people that are working on these projects are not talented enough to be working at that level. They've gotten their jobs for whatever reason. They were hired, and I get it. I under, I get it. The problem is they 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 can't they don't have the chops and that's happening too much in the industry for for various reasons and there's a lot of people getting a lot of jobs and i get it and we all understand why and that's fine but they can't deliver and when they can't deliver uh it's going to come up to a time where well we tried this you know we tried the we tried this but mm, you know we need to go back to people that know what they're doing and it's problematic. James, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Because I worked on something, I, I won't say, recently where um, for a line producer, they went with a younger fellow, somebody that didn't have enough experience. And then the studio realized just looking at his budget, this guy doesn't have enough experience. So they brought in somebody who did have a lot of experience and they lost, they lost time due to that. But the studio realized at the 11th hour, we can't work with this person. They're too young. They don't have enough experience. And it's costing us money. Mm -hmm. And it's about money in the end. And that, that's the thing. If these movies and shows keep flopping the way they, like Interview with the Vampire. Have you seen it? The AMC version? Yeah. I was so pissed off watching the pilot. I was like, "I'm, I'm done." Well, uh, that to me, to me, Interview with the Vampire is a perfect example of it's. You already had a concept. Call it woke. Call it what you want. I mean, the vampire concept is a is a proxy for sex. You know, the the seduction. So if you're telling a story where you're just going to finally make Louis and Lestat lovers and and you're, you're looking at this going, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose of the entire story is that if you're going to just, just say there, if you want to make a story about two men falling in love and ha living in the, first of all, they moved it from the antebellum South to 1910. Yeah. And... and it's they're vampires that can also fuck like rabbits whenever they want. And I'm like, okay, you, you entirely defeated the entire purpose of the story. The vampire myth, it, it's a proxy for sex. I mean, yeah. and if you want to just go full on the homoeroticism of the relationship between Louis, it's like, did you guys read the book? Yeah. Did you, did you read the story? Like I, I watched the episode cause I love fucking interview, interview the vampire. Yeah. But but if you want to turn you you've turned the it's like you shipped them, you shipped Louis and Lestat and turned them into lovers, when that was implicit in the novels, but it could never happen because one, neither the whole point about vampires is they're also beyond gender, 
Yeah. You know, they don't care. And that's the whole thing about about like the hunger. Marion yeah. Blaylock doesn't care whether she takes a male lover or a female lover. She's yeah. just lonely because she mm-hmm. lives for thousands of fucking years. And her lovers, she finds somebody that she can hang with for three or four hundred years and and turns them. And she's beyond sexuality and gender. She's a fucking immortal. Yeah. And and so that's all part of this. And so when I was watching Vampire I said, I'm like, okay, you guys wanted to make a show about two guys in love and show a lot of gay sex or whatever. I'm like, fine, do that. But why do you pretend? Why not just make a show about two guys in love? Why do you have to go adapt interview with a vampire and change it all? Yeah. You know like, why? You well, know yes. why? Uh, well, I know. So I just disagree with be, it. Yeah, but you can't get angry about it because you know why. It's a title that people know. Mm-hmm. They're going to watch that more than two men and one queen mattress. Well, well, uh, b- and 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 also they <laughs> change, two, or just call it two men and a queen. But, but the they queen ch- is the but they changed the character of Claudia. You know, they made her nineteen, and it's like. You, yes, you, because in this day and age, you can't do a fucking creepy thing with a young fucking girl. Yeah, but it, it wasn't sexual. It was the young girl liked to kill and drink blood. Well, yeah, but you know what? They don't want a young girl right. connected so, to a show with a bunch of dudes So they make Interview the with a Vampire, episode. and they change it all and yeah, make it you know, bad. But, but you know why? I know. But that's what I find but fascinating. But you know what's not bad, Rob? Werewolf by Night. That's not <laughs> Yeah, wrap it around there. <laughs> That's true. You know what Dave. else is not bad? You know what else is not bad? <clears throat> Though I've only seen one one episode of this, but I've heard very good things about it. Is Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities? I watched the Graveyard Rats that Vincenzo uh, yeah. Natale directed. Yep, absolutely uh, fantastic. The, no, really I loved it. I'm loving. I'm loving the. I watched um, Panos Cosmatos's episode, yeah, and I it's it's. Uh, you did watch it. No, no, I have to watch. Oh, it's yeah, it's it's good. I mean, he the got, show well, is he so... got he got like the best of the best directors. Yep, out there right now, budgets that are more yeah. than any of us have. No, you it's, and me, it's, Rob, at least have ever seen. No, it's it's beautiful. That's what I want to see more of. You know, I, I what I can't abhorrent I, spending. I am tired of seeing <laughs> talentless hacks <clears throat> injecting their own sensibilities into things that aren't theirs. And, and okay, let's well, talk about I, first and I, foremost I, I, about I'm Star sorry, Trek. Rob. I'm sorry, I won't Rob. bring up on Halloween. I was just trying to do something different with the Puppet Master movies. Okay, I'm sorry, Dave. Why right? don't you talk about it? Dave? You have you Dave directed a feature film. Uh, well, it's is, not. Well, let's cut. Let's cut. It's not a feature. Come on, film. you want to it's, talk it's, about it? It's it's fifty nine minutes. It's the thirteenth in the Puppet Master series called Puppet Master Doctor Death. It is basically a slasher movie with a fucking killer puppet that looks like Eddie from Iron Maiden. Um, and it's out now on <laughs> but, Full but Moon. That full sounds moon fucking awesome. What you just it's said. Out, it's out now on Full Moon streaming. There's a couple little surprises in it. It's done for no fucking money. It was the hardest thing that I've ever had to direct because there was no crew, no money, no time it was it was it was absolutely brutal and very very hard to do but uh uh some people are enjoying it it's out on full moon now uh and yeah it's a little slasher movie with a little puppet that looks like eddie from iron maiden there you go in an old folks home running rampant in an old folks home but i mean where's the downside to that colostomy bags a plenty <laughs> Well, there's that's the one thing we didn't have in there. We should have didn't have time. Clotomy bags are way too complicated and technical for us to pull off at the time. But that, uh, no, we, uh, but you know, look, I did it. Uh, do uh, it's it was tough. I, I don't know. I, I have no objectivity about anything I do. Again, I'm selling it really well. We had no money, we had no time. Yeah, Dave, you're uh, really a. Uh... Getting everyone no, I, to but, wanna... but I'm sorry, I can't. I, but you know, but if you if you if you're a fan of these puppet master movies and stuff like that, and the stuff that Charlie Band does, we try to do something that was a little different and and, and kind of cool. And stuff okay, I think it's cool. Check this out, everybody. Here Not it is. Been... Here's the poster from the puppet master, uh, Doctor Death. There he is. What a great ad line. The doctor is 
The doctor is in sane. Come on, dude. That shit's dope as fuck. Come on, man. Millions. The doctor is insane. insane. Come on, there you go. And uh, oh, and that's the, that's the old poster that actually is the old poster because he doesn't look like that fucking potato head thing there. He looks much better now. There's a there's a uh, an updated version of it. Uh, pretty much pretty similar though so but yeah he looks different now he looks know, much just... better he looks much better than that poster guys well uh here's a here let me let me go to so you can see this live dave uh so here here's a live output from the stream and here is is this not the still here's the old dr death right there i don't know if that's the way oh so that's the way he used to look so how Look, a cursory glance on the internet's getting me the way he used to look. I don't know. Well, goddamn, just go Puppet Master Doctor Death movie. You'll you'll get there. Let's see the the newer. It doesn't matter. Anyway, guys, it's on Full Moon streaming now. Guys, check it out. It'll be on Tubi soon, I think, for free. Um, doesn't matter if you buy it or watch it. I don't make any money from it anyway. Uh, but Charlie Bang gets to like you know. Yeah, the point is, we up. have a real director who just just has a new horror film available as of Friday. If you want to know when we were talking, when we were talking like trash, there you go, guys. Served on a platter, a Halloween, just like in Solo. (laughs) Not the Pier Paolo Pasolini's Solo. Solo. If you kids haven't seen Solo, Solo, you owe it to yourselves to watch. You know, it's funny when I was kids. Do you like corn? (laughs) Then you'll love Salo. When I was uh, when I was growing up, the guys that that I worked in the video store with that that showed me things like I drink your blood and Texas Chainsaw, they would not show they would not show me Salo. They wouldn't good because they they didn't want to be arrested. Yeah, well, it wasn't until like I was in high school that I got to go to our landmark theater. I took all my friends. I said, "Hey, we're, we're going to see Salo." And uh, how many of those friends did you keep? Afterwards? Well, they they all knew. I prepped them. Oh, I prepped oh okay. Them. I, they knew what a, they were seeing. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, shit in this. It's a scatological uh, <laughs> study in in, in yeah, romance. It's a dinner scene. Yeah. Jesus. Well, although I do have the laser disc. <clears throat> oh, I'm sure, and the Blu-ray <laughs> from Criterion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that That's was true. the first Criterion disc I ever got back in? Hey, Dave, you know our uh, special features, our special features we did for the usual suspects are now out once again. It's not for, horror. Hey. For the first time in 21 years. Did you know that the Hills Run Red just recently was on sale at the Scream Factory October sale for $14? And yeah, you bef- would get six and a half hours of special features. Before you got Rob, here. Uh, look, here it is. Here's what. Uh, you know what, Dave, Dave? I cut you off, Dave. Yes. I didn't inflate it to eight hours. You, if you think about the original special features, I, I know don't. you don't. I do because I made them. If that, if you include those and the commentaries, it's eight hours. Well, I actually, without me being in them, they couldn't have been made. That's true. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm That's kidding. true. It's true. Um, They're great special features. You have your own. Uh, you have your your own. Uh, uh, your own feature about showing us the set. It shows yes. how you dug a trench. Did anyway. it show the trench? Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you never watched what I made. I did. You I never did. never watched the I, No, features. I did. I did. I, look, I, I watched I'm, what you I, made for that disc. I, I'm old and feeble now, Rob. Yeah, you wanted to know what shit we were talking about. Yeah, but you, like, got, God the, damn it, I you got the cre- cre- you got the great Cruella de Vil you know, look. It's good. I, I keep wondering where I, I, I right wonder now, where the I'm, dogs I, are, I, man. Where are they? I, where are the Dalmatians? I, I, Rob, I'm so disappointed in you being a comic book fan that you didn't recognize that I was Andrew Bennett, I vampire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I think you look like uh Emma yeah, Stone. No, well, which is pretty good. Pretty good movie. Better than I thought it would be. Anyway, James is like, what the fuck am I into right like, now? Jesus Christ. <laughs> what am I in? Hey, uh... we, we all we should do uh, all three of us. We should make a feature. I got a feature. I've been working on it, James. I'm adapting. I'm finishing up the, the mm-hmm. script, the notes you gave me. I'm telling you, I'm going to make that. I want to make it for 20 years. It'd be fun to make. Awesome. It'd be cheap. 
Yeah, it could be done. It has to be done in Seattle, though. And well, Washington then go, State then is a terrible film commission. Terrible. Well, then, well, then you know. But you um, I have a question, though, for the both of you. Uh-oh. Um, mm. No, it's, it's not that. Um, Just twice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> fucking guy, fucking guy, you fucking guy. <laughs> Have you, you you read House of Leaves? Right? I did. I did read House of Leaves. Yes. Do you think that could be a Netflix series or something oh. that could be <clears throat> oh, created? Right yes. For that medium. Yes. In uh, success, it would be tough to do yeah but i think it would be great i love that book yeah it's a great book but it's so uh, I, I, it's so complicated I yeah mean, it's it, complicated yeah. The, the way it's formatted it's complicated it's a, yeah it's a, it's, it's a tough read just just trying to figure out where to read on shit it's no, yeah it's but i think it could be done book. i mean it's you know there's a reason why like griffin and sabine had never been made those griffin and sabine books about their but House of Leaves could be done. I mean, I, I would love to see that done. Last Werewolf could be done. What well, do that's think? my favorite. Yeah. That I do not understand why uh, RSA really Scott um, and Associates. I'm sorry, Rob. There's a Scott Free uh, in the chat. Uh, Tinder Hot X Y Z Bested Dating Adult Site told me I, I I need to go click on this. Thing. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh. Yeah, we get a lot of those. A lot of the yeah. See, see, see look at that Tinder. Look, they all oh, they've spammed. They oh, oh, they're gone now. <laughs> no, there's still uh, Tom Junior. Jack. Tom's like, <laughs> are you guys ever gonna go to bed? No. For him, it's like six thirty in the morning. I don't care, Tom. Just stay up. <laughs> what? What? You really need to see Dieter and him talk about? Well, oh, this is the Blu-ray I bought this week. Yes. Hold By the way, the, near dark again, and then your show's over. <laughs> Let's get physical. Just hold it up. Done. I, I didn't. All, all my discs come Monday. I've got nothing to show tomorrow. Oh, I do. Guess you're gonna have to show something. You have to show your pumpkin then. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna go to theater on Halloween? Go see a movie or anything like that? Well, we we're we're working. No, he's not. <clears throat> John Campy gonna... show. Oh yeah, Mr. Mr. Halloween. Fucking Canadian fascist who doesn't believe in Halloween. He believes in Halloween. Yeah, he doesn't know a horror movie. It smacked him upside the head like a flounder. No, he loves the descent, dude. John I loves the descent. Yeah, he he probably just saw it last week. No, he no He loves he's... he loves, you know, the, 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 you know, he, he loves likes, the descent. He, he only knows Canadian horror movies and he's probably never seen or heard of the Changeling. The descent of the Kim descent is British. I know that, yeah. So okay, so there's one, and he likes uh, behind the mask. Yeah, there's two. Wow, I'm sure he j likes more horror films. We just don't talk that much horror. On he the does show. It, Well, he doesn't watch movies. He so, does. Yeah. He sees all of them. All of them. He sees. Well, he watches horror films. He likes what he likes. You know, like anyone does. That's you can't true. expect people to be as well read as far as film goes as we are. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but well, why not? No, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> um, Dave, Bill Barkley says you're on a roll, man. You're on a roll. Poor I'm, I'm, the on, Islamics... I'm, I'm on a chair, actually. <laughs> uh, what about Creep? You mean the Radiohead song? No. Oh. The movie by, uh, is it Christopher Webster? I haven't seen Creep, Creep. with, with uh, Franca Potente in the subway. Yeah. Yes. 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 What? A, that, there is a, I, it's Christopher I, Smith. It's not yes, Christopher Webster. I have Creep is a seen, really great movie. I have seen Creep. <clears throat> Why did, Creep, you know, Creep is like this really cool, like uh, if Richard Lehman wrote a movie about some crazy dude in the subways. and, and You know, you know who was in here earlier was Ray Garten, our friend Ray. He's great writer check out his stuff he's got a lot of great books that are now being like reprinted and and, and put out there guys. did you hear he's, what he did did you hear what he did uh no he dedicated the re-release of crucifix 
Well, it's called crucifix. To you? To me. Aww. That was like the nicest That's thing so I've nice. ever anyone's ever done for me. So for those of you who don't know, Ray Garten, who is a friend of this channel, I don't know if he's still in the chat, he probably went to bed, um, yeah. wrote a lot of, I would consider him a splatterpunk writer. And, and he was an author that I discovered in the pages of Fangoria. When the first thing I ever read in Fangoria was Nightmare Library, and um, um, he wrote a book called Live Girls, and that was the first Ray Garten book that I, it, Vampire Strippers, uh, that I ever read of his. And what was really interesting about Ray Garten is that there was a book that was published by Dark Harvest that he wrote called Crucifax Autumn. And he ran into uh, ran into some controversy because the character um, performs an abortion on a, a, a pregnant girl with his tongue, a creature, and uh, it terminates her pregnancy. And uh, some people thought Mr. Garten went beyond the pale with that. Um, you knew it's that's that's your catchphrase tonight, man. Beyond the pale. Beyond the pale. Beyond the pale. Uh, and so. Uh, they had to release, if memory serves, I mean, that's why I got to have Ray on the show once. They He had to release a version of it that was cut down, but my Dark Harvest edition is not cut down or something, you know? Um, it's always better to be uncut, Rob. <laughs> what are you saying? I, Dave, I'm, I'm a Jewish boy. What can I do? You know, um, apparently not too much, a lot less. Well, um, so there you go. But Ray, uh, Crucifix Autumn is being reprinted under the title Crucifix, and he said that he dedicated the re release. Congratulations, that's actually really, that's a really cool, pretty thing. cool, Le right? Like, totally legit, very, very cool. Yeah, totally I mean, I, I've been a big proponent of his, and I, I don't know if you can see. Up on the wall, I have many of Ray Garten's uh, hardcovers. There, some up there somewhere. So there you go. Um, hey, before because it's late, and you do it? have a show. You do have a show in the morning. And, yeah, and uh, I got to go I finish wanted, this wall, uh, landscaping wall tomorrow too. Oh, and I, I definitely want to like be respectful, but um, I don't know how many. No, you I, don't. I, well, what are you talking about? Shut, you shut, don't want to be respectful. Shut you. Shut you. <laughs> Um, but I did want to say I don't know how many people actually like who are actually watching in the chat or anything else give two shits about this. Remember, anything there's 214 else. people. Watching no, but this I don't right know now. how many like like were watching when we would watch because you know you're getting a lot more viewers now than any 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 uh that we ever got. But that's great. That is not true. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, Rob, Dave, um, September. Do you remember? I met and hung out with CK Smile. Yes, from uh, and, Chaosium. From Chaosium and and Valerie and Greg, the drummer and one of the guitarists. They were out here in Los Angeles, and I hung out with them for a couple of days and everything else. And very uh, cool. That's very cool. It was, it was awesome. It was amazing. It was really great. Um, and next week, November fourth, their new album, The Third Eye, comes out. Wow, that's the day before the 5th of November. That's very cool. Remember, uh, you can count. remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason. Are you going to do the landscaping show, Landscaping with Rob? I could. You should see the wall we've built. It's pretty great. We're tearing the backyard. Would you like to see the wall that he built? Yes. Uh, this, is the raw, this is the wall that Rob built. Mother, do you think they'll drop the bomb on me? Uh, Mother, do you think I, they'll try and break my balls? Accident Ooh. seller. Send in a, accident seller. Mother, send should in a I chat. build a wall? Rob, accident seller. Send Hush, no, baby, baby, don't you it's cry. It's not a Halloween song. No, but it's it's about a wall. Uh, uh, it's from but, an album called The Wall. Yes. Accident seller sent in a super chat. He did. And accident seller says, Watched Halloween Ends. First of all, thanks for supporting the channel. Um, Thank you. Watched Halloween Ends. Only rad thing was the music and the staircase scene with the boy at the start. I laughed so hard. 
<laughs> Boy, by the way, I love your channel. Accent and collar, you'll fit right in. Of course, at the beginning of Halloween ends. There's something a, a, really funny that happens. A neglectful babysitter, or was he? Wasn't he? Neglect he wasn't I, neglectful. Well, that's, I, that's, but I was just trying to not spoil I'm it, Dave. You wait 10 years. This is the Halloween 3. That's what people of are saying. Of, thir of, her of third Halloween. <laughs> that's, that's what people are saying. This it a, will not. Rob, you wait 10 years. This movie is going to be the third in this Halloween movie series. First of all, can I just say, I loved Tommy Lee Wallace's Halloween 3 the first time I saw it at the Crossroads Cinema opening night back in 1982. The first time ever, ever I saw yeah. your movie. Do, 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 do. Come on, man. I, look, Stacey I'm Stacey Nelkin, got, I'm still fantasizing about her breasts. Look, I am. And it's been uh, how many I'm years? I'm waiting. 40, I'm wait, 40, I got the 40 4K, years? I've got the 4K of Halloween 3. So do season I. Season of the Witch. So do I. And I'm waiting to watch it. That's going to be one of my Halloween movies. Waiting. On, on Halloween. If you're a pink, I'm, I'm continuing the wall thing. Um, Dang. Waiting. Uh I look. I think Halloween Three is a legitimately great fantasy film. Rob, do you know what I would do? Not that James you asked, but I'm glad that Halloween. you did. I'm glad that you asked that you didn't really care about to know. But I care. If I, if 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 if, if Malika Cod, if Malika Cod now because uh, Halloween is free and clear from Blumhouse, and they will be making more guys just because of this one ends. But if if he came to me and said we need to uh, we got to restart this we got to do this over Halloween you know or Halloween would... three no you know what I would do I no. go you make you remake Halloween three and you make all the robots Michael Myers well, that's a good idea now. What I would do is, I would if, make. If a anyone steals it, if I see any of your motherfucking names on that fucking script, I'm coming after you because I know it's here. Well, Dave, <laughs> you know it's really interesting because this is a very intimate, closed uh, environment where no one's yes. watching, and no, no one will ever happened. hear what you've had to say or care. Show. That's or the care. one thing I can always care about. You no know what you what care. you you didn't mail it to yourself and not open the thing you didn't no. register it with the WGA I, I you didn't, didn't copyright it with the copyright oh, office. Oh, by the by the way, I I just learned this uh, watching listening to McGarris's podcast that he did with Tommy Lee Wallace two weeks ago. Tommy Lee Wallace has a book that is coming out on October thirtieth or the thirty first. I think it's the thirty first. It gets released and it's a memoir about making halloween 3 from the very beginning all the way through i guess up until now and it's sort of like do you know and acceptance. does it talk about the nigel neal draft of the script absolutely yeah he talks about that uh even on uh mixed podcast they talk about that quite a bit yeah I, by the way i've met him uh he's the nicest guy in the world we met him together we were down in you santa did? monica i think at some was it uh an av AF, and, yeah, FM AFM thing party or something. or something like that. Yep. American Film Market party or something like that. And then we met him, and he, at that time, it was before this whole Halloween three resurgence. We both told him how much we loved it, and he was very surprised. But true. such a really nice guy. You know, he directed the original It TV series with Tim Curry, which yep. also would be great, great Halloween watching. If you look, if you're looking for stuff for Halloween to watch and everything, you really probably should get Shutter right now. They've got the original Salem's Lot miniseries. They've got Shutter's uh, amazing. They've got oh, Shutter's a lot of great incredible. Stuff on there. Incredible. I love Shutter. And Shutter they put all awesome. their shit out on Blu-ray. They do. They do. Rob, the, more, do you... the Mortuary Academy, great anthology that came out through Shutter. Really yeah, I've stuff. got Dieter got me that one. Uh, what you, what were you gonna say, James? Do you understand what I mean when I say that Halloween three is the James Bond of the Halloween movies? Yeah, absolutely. Oh like the plot everything he's this womanizing doctor he's oh it's yes no you're you're, you're, you know, you're absolutely you're, totally and then and, and then dan o'hurley he is a bond villain yeah with a plot to and destroy the world in there. now if you were going to remake that who would you cast as cochran now peter weller you're going with a white guy you're just going with a just a white male another white male 
Well, yeah, because they're the I was they're, gonna go, they're well, evil, if I was bad gonna do, people. All white was, men are if terrible. If I was going to do that, I would fuck fuck Peter Weller, Pierce Brosnan. Well, oh. on the Bond thing. Uh, well, I, here's the thing. I you know I would go. You kind of have or, to go with an Irish warlock. No, Pierce Brosnan or Kate Blanchett go totally. Well, Kate Blanchett could do anything. Yeah, I mean, I totally I think it Brosnan. would be really I think it'd be really cool if you. Here's what I would do. If you're going to go the woman route, you have a woman warlock who is barren and she could never have children and she hates children because of it. And that's why she's driven to eliminate all the children in the world. Like she wants to get rid of them all. But how ironic would it be if you introduce the Myers mask into the Halloween three thing and then you have your favorite actor in the world, William Shatner, play Colonel Cochran. Yeah. <laughs> he would know. I, uh, yeah, and the mask is made yeah, no. from his own image to destroy <laughs> yeah. the children of the world. No, because he didn't. He, he he bolstered us all up. As when I was a child, William Shatner lifted me up, kind of like at the beginning of The Lion King. Held me up to the sun. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no. I mean, I think. Look, dude. I think oh, that. Um, do you like that? Um, it's lovely. Uh, I uh, look. I, I mean, I think this Halloween three. The only thing that I think that Halloween three lacks is the Nigel Neal of it all, and and going back and 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 putting a little bit more Quater mass in it could have been interesting. I think that was the problem. I think with the scripted thing was that Nigel, what they talked about, to see from what I just listened to. Is they said that uh, the problem was that Nigel Neal was very, very much he was very good at writing what he did with TV stuff and everything, and there and he was more interested in like the the uh, Stacey Nelkin and her father's relationship in the script, right, and not the Chalice Tom Atkins. You know, actually going off and 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 trying to solve the uh, thing. Do you have the novelization? I do. Three? Yes, so I do. do. I. So yes, do I. I, do. I have the I have the novelization for the first three. I only have. You know what? I I bought by Jack Martin. Uh, I have the novelizations of Videodrome and Halloween. By the way, where I the, wish I had. I wish where I the had. Fuck, the video. Can I just ask you, Dave? Where's my 4K Videodrome? Arrow's putting it out this year. No, like, it's it, it's, it's mine it's, shipped, dude. Shipped. Oh, why don't well, I'm, I'm the question I'm asking you, and you should answer this right. Tell me the answer. Why don't I have it? It was oh, shipped uh, by Zavi. Why don't Why don't I have my fucking Videodrome 4K disc? Tell me. You don't know. There's no reason you should know, but there, I can blame you bar, for it because you're a, here. There, there's a hole in the barge. Dear Liza, dear Liza, there's a hole in the barge. Yeah, that's that's everyone's excuse. Where is my Maria Hill hot toy figure that I ordered two months ago? I never bought Maria Hill. Do you want to know something? Hmm. I had to buy a Maria Hill figure. Why? Why? I can't tell you. What do you mean? <laughs> can't I can say this. I can say this. If you're hot toy collectors and you don't own Maria Hill... That figure is going to go up in value soon. Oh, okay. Maria Hill is <laughs> Nick Fury's little. Uh, buddy. She works for Shield. She's the little buddy of Nick Fury. Yes, she so is. She's gonna. She's gonna become something. <laughs> I wouldn't say she's gonna become something. I would say something else. Oh, they're gonna kill her. Didn't say that either. <laughs> they gonna mix a plicker. Would you like me to read the script pages? Oh wait, no, no. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll no, get no, de no, no. demonetized. Oh, hey, oh, Back to Halloween. Back to Halloween yeah. time and stuff like that. So uh Axel Carolyn got her Peter Cushing figure from Sideshow today. Oh, she did? She the waited a year for it. The quarter, the, the quarter yeah. scale. Yeah. 
It's a great figure. Did you get that? <coughs> I didn't, but I no, want it. because you had to get a Maria Hill figure instead. <laughs> uh, Good going, Rob. Yep, yep, yep. Priorities, priorities. Yeah, well. Peter uh, Cushing, Peter Cushing, Maria Hill. Cushing. Yeah, you know what? I, I was thinking about that, but I have my signed Christopher Lee Dracula Prince of Darkness poster when I was working on Lord of the Rings. That that's he what? signed that's for not, me that's to Peter Robert. Cushing. It's not Peter Cushing. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. I'm just saying. <sighs> well, actually, I think that Peter Cushing figure sold out. Probably is. It's, yeah. it, it looks beautiful though. It's uh, amazing, and that and, and it's got it's got a a, a um, Christopher Lee figure too, right? From Scars of Dracula. Yeah. Together. Well, let's let's see, Dave. Let's see. Together. Uh, the, the Peter Cushing time. figure. Let's look. <clears throat> let's 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 uh, let's see if it's if it's. Can you look for some Dalmatians too while you're on there? <clears throat> wow there's no they got them both they got the dracula and the peter cushing van helsing Ooh, i can't afford it can you order for me thanks man i get like it. i'll get, dude, you, I'll get you I, back i'm a house poor you, by the way you're, there's you're only 750 sweet, 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 of these there's only 750 of these mm -hmm. boy that's pretty amazing yeah you know what Originally, Mel Brooks was not considered for the role of Dr. Loomis in the original Halloween film, Tom Jr. Jackson. You're high as a kite. By then. It's way too early for you. Are you kidding me? Originally, Mel Brooks was considered for the role of Dr. Loomis. Are you insane? Christopher Lee was. He turned it down. There you go. I hate when that Tom <laughs> Jr. Jackson says nonsense, Rob. Wasn't Peter Cushing also offered Halloween? He was cons uh yes, he was. He turned it down yeah. too. Yeah. He was in uh, poor health. Yeah. It's true. Uh well, yeah, okay. Uh you know what? This Peter Cushing figure is dope. It's giving Rob a woody. <laughs> it is. It is. I'm I'm uh I'm tenting hard right now. It's, it's pretty got great. Real fur on the collar. No, I, I manscape. Not, <laughs> not you, the figure. Well, you know, <laughs> manscape. I'm glad James an laughed. Official manscape, an official sponsor of the John Campier Show. Watch the John Campier <laughs> Show Monday through Friday from ten thirty to twelve. <laughs> hey man, hey. <laughs> pays the bills. Actually, it, it being freshly shorn is quite nice. Do, I'm do a big you proponent. Get, do, you, do you get a whole Manscaped kit because of being on the John Campion? No, I had to buy it. Yeah, yeah I, 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 we don't get free shit. They don't. They cheap, never send us free shit. Cheap Canadian bastard couldn't buy you a Manscaped. He wants you to be all <sighs> fucking swarthy and hairy down there on the show, so he can be the only one freshly shorn. No, no, no. I always freshly shorn before I knew John Campion. That's true. It's part of the way <laughs> I live. I live my life. Too. I live my... Look, my gorgeous pink sack was always available, always freshly <laughs> shorn. What can I say? <laughs> Acorn like it may be, but still. It is wow. freshly shorn. Just Good saying. Goodness gosh. Rob, wait till you see um, later, uh, Lady Shatterley's Lover on Netflix here in a couple months. Or uh, oh, this oh, I heard that. Yeah, they were redoing that. Did you work on that? No, no, I saw it today at a, a PGA screening. Is it good? At a golf uh, course? That seems really weird. It's good. It something seems a little off. I don't oh know what, but it, it, it hopefully works close. Little, but... <laughs> well. The, the, yeah, those were off quite a bit. In there. <laughs> it is Lady Chatterley's lover, after all. Um, <laughs> 66 Starship Alien says, Rob's, Rob's only fans, only it, pays it pays the bills. The bills. <laughs> <clears throat> it's true. Does it, though? Does it? No, it really doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Does Rob, anything pay you, the bill? Rob, did you get a haircut? Did I get it? Yeah, the beard. I did. I got. I. 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 I am 
freshly shorn. Yes. Doesn't he yeah. look? Doesn't he just look wonderful, guys? <laughs> Why? Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. No makeup. I'm just me. You know. Do you usually put makeup on? No, I never put makeup on. Never Maybe do. You should. Oh, thanks. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, can you hear this? Can you hear this? Can you hear this? Do you want me to turn it up? Come on. Talking about dad joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm trying to think of this. Uh, uh, Christian Harloff told me an incredible dad joke on Tuesday, and I can't remember the punchline. <laughs> but it was a great joke. Okay, so there's this kid. He's driving in a car. Nah, no, hang on. I'm, I'm going to find it. You know what? I bet if I look it up. Hang oh, on. Yeah? Dad joke. Christian Harloff. Lame. No. There you go. Oh, there it is. No. Hang on. Let me see if I get this. Oh, yeah, I found it. I found it. <laughs> this is so terrible. I can't believe I'm going to say this. Uh, the following yeah. joke does not reflect the opinions or thoughts mm. of the Robert Burnett show. Um, what do it... Are you ready? Are you ready? By the way, Christian Harloff told me this. It's not... He didn't make it up, but it's a dad joke. It's mm. a dad joke that I actually laughed at. What do a tick and the Eiffel Tower have in common? You're not going to guess? They're both parasites. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. There, look, I, I, I did not have the opportunity. Thank you observations. <laughs> we will be off the air now. <laughs> hey, man, I, like I said, that wasn't my joke. But uh, I said it was a dad joke. I thought it was funny. That's kind of the – that's a Halloween dad joke. That's kind, that's kind of – that's kind of the, the – the, the humor and the joie de vivre that Robert Burnett likes to throw in. <sighs> Look, man, that. the people that watch this show for a long period of time, they know. By the way, Sonny Dominguez, our oh, friend. Oh, accident caller told me to get out, so I'm going to I'm gonna go. No, no you're not going to go. Are you going? No, Don't go. Sonny Dominguez, who made for one of the great episodes of Rob Observations or Midnight Metal, Midnight Musings of all time. Um, Sonny Dominguez says, I just came off an extreme shroom trip. Wow. At my friend's who works at Bad Robot, and though three of us had the same amount, I had the most intense visuals. Are you saying that people at Bad Robot, J.J. Abrams' company, does drugs? No, he's not saying that. Beautiful experience and much-needed spiritual and professional humblings. On I've been drugs? listening on and off. I'm offended. Dude, here's the thing. Like... Uh, what prescription drugs? Where are you going to draw that line? Well, probably where I have to sign my name to get the prescription filled. Yeah, Dumb well, ass. microdose. No, I. Uh, 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 <laughs> this this show this show I started out trying to do. By the way, at midnight. That was almost four hours ago. A classy, I, a classy show. I was too. Yes, I was, and now it's completely devolved. Pollutant. Pod my French, but you're an asshole. <laughs> anyway, hey, can you hold the fort for a second, Dave? No, uh, this is going to be James' special time alone with the audience, and he can talk to them for a minute because you and I are both going to do the same thing, just in separate areas. That's true, James. It's your show, Bear. <laughs> yeah, uh, James. Actually, let me ask you a question, James. Better make it fascinating this... and entertaining and, 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 and thrilled with, uh, with, with thrilling things. <clears throat> no, I would ask you as a production coordinator, yeah. and I wish I could hear this answer, what are some of the pitfalls that you wish people knew more about to make your job easier as a production coordinator? Can you handle... Can you... Uh, Regale yeah. our, by the way, our audience uh, is still quite large for the show. So uh, there you go. James is going to impart this knowledge to you guys. And uh, so as I walk away, I'll be right back. But please answer that question because I'm going to go look back and watch it and see what you had to say. Okay. 
All right. All right. I'll be back. Right. As a... Right. Uh, <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyone. As a coordinator, um, one of the things I wish um, the industry oh, understood man, or knew <laughs> is the fact that uh, usually it doesn't seem like everything is very last minute. So, for example, um, if there's a show that or a pilot that the uh, studio or production wants to make, everything is they want to save money. However, the problem is with saving money, you have to have a plan ahead of time. So um, usually everything is such last minute that you can't get a good deal on finances or to keep the budget low because you have to make it um, within a week or two weeks make something happen like a low budget uh, film that is on Redbox, for example usually they make those in a month but the prep time is two weeks beforehand and you're usually hiring a crew and um, it's not made up until the last minute. So you won't have your full crew until maybe two or three days before you start shooting the thing. And then um, my favorite, for example, on one of those films was in the, they shot portions of it in another country and then COVID hit. And then they had to regroup and bring it back to California. And one of the things the uh, director slash producer asked us in a meeting is when we thought the film I'm back but I have to uh move my discs it fell sorry cool and Oops. I remember thinking wait a minute here he's asking us when this film took place or where the story took place and when it took place yet yeah, they shot some of it in another country for a few days and now this question comes up so you would be very shocked and surprised at some of the things that come up <clears throat> in production at the last minute so um i'm back would the job easier for a coordinator because you have to scramble well that's uh that's good to know you finished thank you for that i appreciate that that you uh answered that question now Here's the thing. We've known each other. We met at an art show, I think, three years ago. That's correct, yes. Three years ago. And uh, you were very nice. You bought uh, some of Elizabeth's work. Now she's she's in, she's in been given two fellowships. Um, wow. Where, yeah, at uh, she, where she wanted to go. She was at Claremont. Uh, she finished at Art Center. And she's a, she works at Art Center, and she's at Claremont uh, getting her math, two different masters in museum mm -hmm. studies and fine arts. So you were an early patron of hers. Well, I want to buy more because I've seen more of her work. And, you know, I mean, I got to start working again, and then I'll buy more. Yeah, but, she's yeah. no, she's done some great stuff, and it's – it's uh, it's it's but, it, you know, it's it's interesting because that, that meant the world to her when oh. you bought – uh, one of her works at the uh, at the show. That was very nice. No, it was very cool. Um, that was that was most excellent. So well, it's an excellent piece of work. I still have it today. So. Yeah, it's good. Well, well, you'll sell it. Hopefully, it'll be worth tons of money. I don't know where Dave went. He'll come back. Yeah. Maybe unless he fell asleep. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> I did not expect the show to go on uh, past two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> to be honest uh but it, it's it's kind of fun you never expect anything that's that's what you do here on youtube these now, late night did shows you see far yet? the did i what Kate Blanchett movie no or i am dying I, I i first of all uh todd todd field um yeah. i'm a huge fan of his i i find it fascinating that you know he hadn't made a movie since 2006 yeah and he made this. Now I haven't seen it, but what 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 did you think of it? I it, it's excellent film. But going back to production coordinator BS, um, one thing he does at the very beginning, he puts the end credits at the beginning of the movie. So really? You watch, 
Yeah, so you see all the crew. Because at the very beginning, I was like, wait a minute, they screw something up, and then the movie begins after that. So he makes the audience sit through something that they would normally splitsville on. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. I wonder why he did that. Uh, probably because he felt they needed to be acknowledged. I mean, it. it's an excellent, excellent film. She's... If she doesn't win, well, her, I mean, she, yeah, she looks. I mean, it looks. She looks ab- absolutely incredible in that film. I mean, yeah, really it, does. It, and uh, but yeah, it's it, it's an excellent film. But yeah, because he brought Kate Blanchett earlier for Halloween three, and you brought up Weller, and I know Weller, and he's a. Weller's a good man, and I gotta watch um, that episode. Oh yeah, uh, he's he's in an episode of Cabinet of Curiosities. Yeah, and he just he's a fantastic man, and he is one of those those gentlemen that you always learn something new, and uh, just listening to him, a brilliant mind he has. Well, you know, you know, it's interesting, like when you watch him in a movie like the new age or something, I mean, he's so different than he is in Robocop and so different than he is. in. I mean, he's truly, he's a real cult actor. I mean, this mm-hmm. stuff he was, I mean, he was in Star Trek into darkness. Um, but, but he was in a movie called screamers that was based on a, yeah. uh, another sci-fi film. But, and, and he's also, I love the fact that he very, he went and got his PhD. Yeah, and that's you know, the thing. I like I met him when he was filming Star Trek in Darkness because he directed an episode of a show I was working on at the time. Yeah. And you know Dave, we're talking I, about Peter Weller. What happened to your hair, Dave? Like the Poland Halloween special, I'm full of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a deep cut. Who first national broadcast of kiss i think uh, yeah maybe they may have been on the midnight special before by peter the way weller, peter weller national have, have you seen he, this he's a charming fellow dave have you seen bullet train uh no i'm gonna watch it t- tomorrow i have to say it's pretty great i hear it's like a uh it's a lot of fun runner like a coyote roadrunner bug bunny yeah i think you're gonna dig things. it and by the way um can i just say watching things in 4k is my new favorite thing shocking i know but, but god damn you know i threw on the other night i uh, uh, but peter weller first of all national treasure yeah. guys uh, and a great director too great yeah he directed a lot of a lot of episodes of uh sons of anarchy and he was in sons of anarchy and so was stephen king stephen king did a uh, a little cameo in sons of anarchy yep <clears throat> um <clears throat> so uh yeah but i watched the original Halloween in 4K finally. Oh my god! That's just <sighs> yeah. It's it's in, it looks so good. It looks so good, and, and it's correctly color timed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> J- Dave, you're not gonna like this, but Joe Scan sends a super chat and oh. says, "Rob, you bring us Trekkies all together. Love your Picard season three pump ups." Or want to hear more about what Star Trek novels to read and anything else do you recommend? Okay. I, I will make this painless for Dave. Well, I want to say something about uh, Picard Season 3 is the new one coming up, right? Yes. A friend of mine. February Sean 16th. Tretta, a friend of mine, Sean Tretta, is one of the head writers on the show. So you can uh, also thank him. Married to the lovely screen, former Scream Queen, Tiffany Shepis. Ah. Well... Uh, as everyone knows, I mean, I'll fucking admit it. I've seen Star Trek Picard season three twice, all the way through, and I'm going to watch it again. Uh, uh, I love it. I've never seen such a turnaround. Everything about Star Trek Picard season three is different, except the first five minutes of the first episode. You'll be like, "Well, Rob, this looks exactly as no." They needed to to they they have one little wrap up. And I, I loved it. Now, here's the thing. Is it perfect? No. But you get, it's like watching a 10-hour 
great. It, it's a ten hour. It's the ten hour best Star Trek movie. Star Trek the TNG movie you never got to see, and it'll be your favorite. Um, cool. It's a lot but of fun. Rob, what is perfect? Yeah, nothing. Well, except the movie that uh, is based on the Rolling Stone article that stars John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, hey, there you go. Uh, uh, little, so, <clears throat> yeah, you like that? There? So, Joe Joe says, um, you want to hear more about what Star Trek novels to read and anything else? Okay, there there are... Death, Death Troopers. That's, that's Star Wars. Star Trek, that's, that's a good Star that's, Trek novel. Death that's Star, Troopers. That's Red, Star Red, Wars. Red, 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 red sun. That's Star Wars. Uh, that's DC. <laughs> no, there. Here, here's, here's, uh, here's some of the best Star Trek novels. If you want to read one of the best original series crew novels, Prime Directive. More, more trouble with triples. No, Prime Directive by Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens. If you want to read the <clears throat> ultimate crossover story between TOS and TNG, read Federation by Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens. If you want to read graphic the novel, the Transformers meets Star Trek. Uh, that's IDW, <laughs> and I wouldn't say that was one of the best, but it exists. Oh. <laughs> and uh, if you want to read, if you want to read a uh, 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 a great mirror universe story, read David Mack's duology about the mirror universe, uh, Rise Like Lions and Sorrows of Empire. Actually, it's reversed. It's Sorrows of Empire and Rise Like Lions. And if you want to read just a great Star Trek story that takes place. After uh, Deep Space Nine and the Dominion War, it's it's a great read. David Max Destiny trilogy, uh, it's fantastic. It's all about the boar. It's it's incredible. Mm -hmm. So those are just some to start with. Um, yeah. Powerful, Rob. Powerful. Go, going back to Halloween type uh, or horror films. Thank you. What you th now with <laughs> regard? In hey, this is somebody who asked our opinion. Asked I, my I, opinion. I paid good money. Yes. And I let I let you answer. Now, yes, what would, but it's not think, midnight metal, so you can't. That's right. What would you think is the scariest Star Trek episode that has horror elements? Oh, there. Well, uh, okay. There's there's actually t right away. There are two, and it uh, interestingly enough, I think the scariest Star Trek: The Next Generation episode was actually directed by Gates McFadden, Doctor Beverly Crusher herself. And it was an episode called Genesis, where the crew is devolving because of, and there's giant spiders and alien creatures, and it's really effective. And there's some really scary stuff in it. But Star Trek, uh, the original Star Trek, actually has a Halloween episode. Cat's by Robert Block. Cat's Ball, written by Robert Block. It has witches and all kinds of Halloween Aren't stuff. Aren't you impressed in it. that I knew that? Uh, well, no, because you're a smart guy. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I think you did? But I am it impressed. Turned, yes, but no. I mean, it turns out Kirk made out with some weird thing. Like when it, you you see her actual format. Oh, end. it's so Dude, great! It's so great. Will make out with anything with a pulse. Well, I think that's what the great lesson of Star Trek is. It doesn't matter whether it's Octurian. <laughs> oh wait! No, no, it doesn't That's matter. James it, it doesn't matter if it's male if it's Arcturian. Yeah, uh, no. It, I, I think James Kirk is a man. I mean, he's the original progressive. Oh, I don't think he's that progressive. <laughs> well, the James T. Kirk is. I don't. Oh my! Oh my! No, I think he is. I don't I think mean, so. I don't think so. Well. Uh... <laughs> So anyway, uh, yeah, you want to watch uh, uh, Genesis is great. It, Cat's Paw and Genesis are two great episodes of Star Trek. Watch them together. They're probably streaming on Paramount Plus. The thing that, but I wouldn't always... know because Paramount Plus, uh, their Twitter, their Star Trek Twitter feed, pre-blocked me. <laughs> pre-blocked me. Like I, I, I am a Paramount Plus subscriber. And they blocked me on their social media feed. Me, who is the why. one lone voice, I might have talked shit about all their horrible, god awful, bad robot. I mean, secret hideout, whatever. But I love Star Trek Picard season three. And you know what? 
none of the people that they uh, that subs- that they they can't hear me because I was pre-blocked by Paramount Plus. There's more people there. To put it, what do you think is the scariest hour of television episodic that you've ever seen? Oh, episodic. There's a couple. The X Files Home. Yes, yes. Yeah, Home was really Home was really um, great. The original, the original uh, remake, the original remake of the Twilight Zone. There's a couple. Yeah, uh, but th- that doesn't get. That's not episodic in the same sense. That's an anthology sort of show. So I don't know. If well, the, okay, that, but I was not going to say that. I was going to say in canon, like there's got to be a Night Stalker episode. Oh. Well, there's a. I think there's a. There's a lot. Um, I mean, cold. The thing is, I haven't watched Kolchak in so long. Even though they've come out, I haven't seen. But they're so good, man. Um, yeah, but um, you know what? I have to say that these Twilight Zone episodes because they're Hush is a very, a very creepy episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That Hush is. You're absolutely right. That's an incredible <laughs> episode of horror TV with the gentleman. Yeah, that that I remember being very scary. It's a very um, creepy episode of of uh yeah. Uh I mean, any of this new Dahmer series is pretty uh pretty fucking terrifying. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's really even, even more terrifying. Go watch the um Stone Phillips interview. Right. It's on YouTube. The Stone Phillips interview with Jeffrey Dahmer is fucking insane. It is so unnerving. Look, I would say this. I would say that half the episodes of Brian Fuller's Hannibal series right. is nightmarish. I mean, there, there's, I, you know, I can't, because it was, you know, it was an ongoing series, but there are episodes of that show that are really, really, really unnerving. Uh, you know, the, and the funny thing is, like, a lot of people are putting out, like, they owe Xanti Misfits, Night of the Masks, Twilight Zone, and, and uh, Outer Limits, and, and Trilogy of Terror. They're bringing up uh, Tales from the Dark Side. They're bringing up. But I always picked That's I all always, anthologies, like you said. I, I, yeah, not episodic. Not, James not like said that. episodic TV. He didn't say anthology. I'm sure there so. is a murder she wrote that will chill you to the bone, <laughs> but I don't know what it is. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's interesting. There, it's it's hard because there's a lot of TV shows that weren't, uh, you know, they just the, the anthology episodes that focused on horror are more obvious. Yeah, because if it, uh, I I don't know, um, I mean, Hush would definitely be one, but I know obviously there's Hush is be great. More I mean, modern, and that's an there's ongoing be more series. Modern ones though, there's got to be more. There definitely has to be. More. Well, I mean, I mean, you could say that uh, there's series now like American Horror Story. I mean, I, there's is... episodes uh, of Supernatural that are really freaky. Yeah, there's some yeah. really good, creepy stuff in there. I just don't, unfortunately, I I don't have off the top of my head those. I mean, now we have you we have if you talk about a series, there's that episode of The Haunting of Hill House where it's like one shot. Oh, the yeah, the the one that the it's the it's yeah, it's like six long steady. Yeah, shots. those are that that was creepy. I, I mean, there's some yeah, good I stuff mean, there. The, the, the first reveal of the hanged woman. Yes. Yep. the hanged woman oh. is really te- is really scary in 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 that series. Yeah, it's really good. Somebody brought up <coughs> uh, Joseph Powell brought up Carnival, the HBO series. You know, I haven't seen that whole series, but yeah, it's good. I, I, I want to. What about Twin Peaks? A- oh, there's yeah, there's Ooh. good episodes of that too. I mean, the reveal of of Killer Bob. I yeah. mean, of Bob. Uh, oh, oh yeah, uh, upstairs in the bedroom. In yeah, the I mean that's some that's some freaky ass shit. Yeah, uh, I like Jeffrey uh, Hem- Hemphill go- going Sleepy Hollow uh, was all spooky. I like I like the uh show sleepy hollow i did too actually it wasn't bad. um uh, uh, penny dreadful had some pretty cool creepy episodes oh, yeah. as well yeah i mean um, the... <coughs> no the the good stuff yeah um yeah, twin peaks i think is, is episode of the new twin peaks is it episode seven 
Is eight. that the one? Eight. 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 It's, it's the nu- eight. the nuclear eight. bomb yeah, yeah, episode. Yeah, eight. Yeah. Jesus Christ. That that. Was- <clears throat> no, that was insane. That was revolutionary. Yeah, it was really. I I remember watching that. I was actually editing, um, Tango Shalom, and I was. This was so crazy. So, I was I was editing Tango Shalom in. Uh, Joseph Bologna and Renee Taylor's Beverly Hills mansion. They had moved out of it because Joe Bologna was dying of pancreatic cancer. And they had moved into a really luxury, one of those very expensive Century City apartments where they had all the amenities and people could take care of them because they needed. Mm. So this mansion that used to be Shirley uh, Temple's in Beverly Hills is this gigantic house that they lived in for 50 years. This amazing. Wow. And nobody was in it. And it creaked. And it was huge. And right. I, I'm sitting there in, in Joe Bologna's. Basically, I was in his closet, his walk-in closet, where we had set up the edit bay. And it was so fucking creepy at, at night. And there was no one in this house. And um, that's where I started watching... Uh, Twin Peaks: The Return. Jesus, and and that's You're where butt. I watched a lot of things in that closet. And what was what was so crazy? I is, bet you did. Well, he passed away. He he never came back home. Oh, and and Mom. and and I know he never came back home. He he passed away. I mean, and I loved him. And he did see a cut of the film, but it was such a weird. None of them ever went back. And and it was it was so weird to be the last person to live in that house and that's where i watched the eighth episode of twin peaks wow and it was just it was so i mean that 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 was so that was so crazy Mm -hmm. it was crazy homo erectus says who's the next west craven uh good question no no one yeah they're gonna be the next themselves they're not gonna be the next west craven they're gonna be the next themselves there's no, there's not the next John Carpenter. There's not the next Wes Craven. There's not the next Toby Hooper. It's they're not the next George Romero. They're going to be their things. Well, the the problem you know, is the they're they're going to be you know they're going to be the Ty Wests, the Eli Roths. They're going to be their the new yeah. The business it, doesn't it, work. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's, it, yeah, and, and it doesn't work the same. The way. real the real problem is is all of those people <laughs> that you talk about, Wes Craven, John Carpenter. They all cut their teeth in a world where you could make a movie for a very little money and you were guaranteed a theatrical release. I mean, Escape from New York was a four and a half million dollar movie right. uh, in in eighty one, you know, and that was the biggest movie that Carpenter had made up up to that time. And he'd made Assault on Precinct Thirteen, he'd the made fog. Halloween, The Fog, and that oh. was his fourth movie. You, you want to include Dark Star? No, in that no, you can. no, and and Elvis. Halloween but, was but actually the Elvis the was movie. was TV. Yeah, that's fine. But you're counting what he directed. So well, I was thinking theatrical. Theatrical. But, so it was a song. Yeah. Okay. But but right, but right. but so like you know you you had all these directors had movies they made that were theatrically released. And nowadays, it's very difficult. The The filmmakers, it's in one ear and out the other. The real problem with filmmakers today is their work does not register with audiences as their work. There, No one knows. Like, we know who Mike Flanagan is because we're horror fans. But if you watch The Midnight Club... Would you go, hey, that's the guy that made Dr. Sleep? Or that's the guy that made The Haunted <laughs> Hill House? <clears throat> Nowadays, people, they don't know. And I'm not saying they knew knew back in the day, but the people that mattered knew. You know, nowadays, most executives, I mean, we we live in a world where the people that decide what movies get made and the actual people that make the movies yeah. are almost completely bifurcated. They have right. no, they have, they, there, there's no, you know, the only, unless, look, I don't understand, now I can go off, why every major studio does not have an in house Blumhouse. Why is it that the major studios are not, and they used to, like Dave and I worked for one, and Dave, I know, hold your tongue for a minute. What I'm going to uh-huh. say, is is Warner Brothers had a division. It was a direct-to-video division. 
and they they never they they never went all in on it because the studio didn't know what to do. We were the second people to make a live action film for that division. Mm-hmm. And what was really frustrating, what I thought when I when we first got in there, it took a long time. I thought, okay, we're now in a place where they're going to make they had a deal to make 10 movies. They were going to make 10 direct to video movies, which I proved that I could say I I went to them and said, "Hey, can we get our movie and send it to festivals? And they said to me, why would you want to do that? It's a direct-to-video film. And I said, yeah, but we made a genre film and there are festivals and we got to go to festivals. We got to go to Seattle. We went to Spain. Dave went to London. The, 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 because the people at the studios don't fucking know. And I'm not saying they're all smart. They're well, all smart people, like but they, they don't, don't understand. They, they don't know and they don't care. And, and, I had so much pushback when I asked to submit our direct, because they were just going to release it. By the way, most people don't know this or remember, but in 2009, when Hills Run Red was released, it was released the same time as Trick or Treat was released. The same 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 exact day. day From the same place, Warner Premier. And they got a Blu-ray right away. Well, yeah. And Bill Barclay, yes, Dark Castle. Uh, he has did Dark Castle do horror too? Dark Castle mainly did horror. Yeah. Dark Castle was called Dark Castle because they started out remaking House on Haunted Hill, which was a William Castle movie, and they had teamed up with Terry Castle, William Castle's daughter. They and, did that. They and did the f- Thirteen the f- Ghosts. The first movie in their direct to video thing was, was Return to House. On Haunted by, Hill by our by our my good friend and your good friend Victor, Victor Garcia, Garcia, who just had his new film premiere premiered at Sigis. Sigis. and um, so what they wanted to do, what Warner Brothers wanted to do with Warner Premiere and Dark Castle was they had a deal to make ten direct to video movies like Blumhouse and and I'll just say it, our movie was a four million dollar movie. That but I think, it wasn't, but it well, wasn't I really. think Silver really, Pictures the, took a million bucks off the top, and it was never four million dollars. It was probably two, two point five, maybe at most. Let's just call it three and say they took a million off yeah, the but, top. But okay. yeah, but you're right. So, but either way, what happened was there was even a third movie in in pre production called Cheerleaders in Trouble, and no, that was Cheerleaders Must Die. I thought it was called Cheerleaders in Trouble. I thought it was Cheerleaders Must Die. Anyway, I got the it's, a, it's, a cheer, it's a cheerleader, killer and, cheerleader and it movie. was deep into pre production. They killed it. Yeah, he was going to go, and not because of us, they just decided why do it? You know, why make Destroy movies for four deal. For, for two, three, four million dollars when, when they knew they could back into the numbers and you could make 20 million with, with uh, cable sales? And, and they figured, why? If why even bother if we're making a billion dollars from a Harry Potter movie? And my 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 rationale is, well, who's going to make your Harry Potter movies in thirty years? Why not have a now with the streaming world? Why not? Why why doesn't every studio have an an incubator where you are making what Blumhouse is doing five million dollar movies, and if they're great. You get a smile and you release it, or a barbarian and you release it theatrically. And if you don't, well, I think you, that's the thing. I think Roy, I think it. Roy Lee. I think Roy Lee is definitely like seeing that that upside there, that uptick. No, um, but but he is. I mean, uh, look, yeah, look, which is great. Roy I, Lee. I, Roy I, I Lee a is a hero for, of mine. I mean, I have he's a question totally for the audience, though. I have a question for the viewers that are watching, because it's Halloween and everything else, and I'm always curious about this too, and it, it, it helps. Uh, me gauge the 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 age range here um if you're into by the way there there are 209 people watching us right now which is amazing if if you're into the genre if you're into horror what was your gateway drug what was the thing that led you into it what was uh, i'm curious with you guys what was the thing that led you into it what what was that initial spark that got you fascinated in 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 the genre it could have been famous monsters it could have been you know uh, twilight's own it could have been you could rob you could have watched specter of the gun go that's kind of creepy no but no I'll, I'll i'll i know exactly what made me love horror mm-hmm. don't be afraid of the dark 
Okay. The, TV movie. The, the, the Kim Darby TV movie. TV movie. That was the movie. So I had uh, my mother, for whatever reason, got the most smoking hot babysitters ever. And, and I don't know why. And this babysitter I had named Debbie Black, Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, had already aired. And they would repeat these things on a late night TV. And it was the second time they aired it. And she said to me, because I like Star Trek. And, uh, the Twilight Zone's probably what really got me into horror. Okay, but the yeah. first horror okay. movie that I ever saw was Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. Which, by the way, was fucking terrifying. And when I was working at Warner Brothers in 1989 and 90, I worked for the senior vice president of feature production. I called, uh, I, I found the, who had the rights to it. I was looking to buy the rights to remake Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. People thought I was crazy. And I'm Dan Bob Carabar got it. Yeah, but this was 20 years later. This is, this is 89, 90. And Bob Bookman, mm-hmm. the, the guy who wrote Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, was he created the Waltons. And, okay. and I think it was the Waltons and I called, I called CAA. I mean, I later worked there and I was a reader at CAA, but I, I, I talked to Bob Bookman, who was a big agent at CAA. And then he, I got to talk to the writer of the original movie and he, he laughed. He goes, you know, I get, occasionally I get calls from people and, and it was, um, the, so this was me trying to get the rights and at the time I'm fucking 23 years old mm-hmm. trying to buy the rights of this thing and it was it was going well they thought it was funny and they were they were going to sell it to me for nothing and then all of a sudden CA said we're no longer interested in you having the rights to this oh wow and I and I'm like and I was trying to parlay the fact I work for feature production and Warner Brothers blah, blah, blah. no gone just they didn't – this is a funny thing, kids. They didn't know what it was. They couldn't even care – they couldn't have cared less. But once somebody showed interest, then they took it out. Right. Then they're like, hey, we have this property. They, they didn't tell anybody who was interested. They're like, um, we have some interest. And the people that got it were, were um, Morgan and Wong, Glenn right. Morgan and James right. Wong. And yep. they, 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 because the they also ones. got, they also had bad Ronald. Yeah. And they went and got those. And because, and what's, what's interesting is that uh, again, Warner archive has released both, but, but other people remembered it. And it was really frustrating because look, I really appreciate what Guillermo did with, with don't be afraid of the dark, but they really, missed the, I didn't like it at all. I hated it. I like the design saying, of pre- the creatures, but I didn't like. I it was they, it was over. It they was missed the, they the, missed the, the point. The thing that was scary was that it was a normal looking house. It wasn't this thing where you would think. That's exactly was. right. That's exactly right. And 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 here's here's the great frustration when you're working in Hollywood. There are things like "Don't Be Afraid of the Dark" that you just said it, Dave. The point is, is that it was in any neighborhood USA. Right. The fact that these fucking yeah. shrunken head apple creatures could come out. If you haven't seen the original, and by the way, if you watch the original now, it's silly. No, but when you're no, five or six still, years no, old, no, it, I think the original still has a creep value to it. It's creepy. It was, it, and when I watched the movie, the house that they lived in, I'm like, well, of course, some crazy shit's gonna happen in that house. <laughs> yeah. You're like, there's no way that that house is neither haunted or monsters living. It missed the point, and I understand what they were doing. The whole point about so don't be afraid of the dark. For those of you who don't know, <clears throat> was a TV movie, uh, and it, it's about a husband and wife that move into this nice. It's a big house in sub, basically like a eastern suburbia, wooded lawns nice place but it has two different chimneys one chimney is a regular chimney like in a house the other chimney has been bricked up and they get um what's his face from my three sons the old cantankerous <laughs> guy who's actually well, he's the handy he's the handyman and he won't he won't open it for him yeah and she, so Kim darby opens it up herself yeah and won't open this and and so underneath this house these 
shrunken head dwarven creatures live. They're like, you know, and they come out of the chimney and they fucking terrorize the fuck out of her. And like she has the, the, the great showstopper scene is they have a dinner party and these creatures are underneath the table and they're like using knives and cutting her her her. It's the fucking greatest thing ever. It's scary as fuck. When I was a little kid, I'm like, this is the scariest thing ever. And they did, and what it was at the time, because they didn't have uh, computer effects or anything else, it was guys in suits and oversized built sets to make them look tiny. Yes. Uh, Which I always always appreciate that type of stuff. Yeah, no, it was so... It's cool. James, have you heard of this? Have you seen this movie, the original one? I have not. Uh, it's a it's a it's a good one if you can find it for sure. Uh, a lot of people like uh, asking the gateway drug. It's nice, Rob, because there's people like go uh, King Kong or Godzilla or yeah, the which original is fine, Universal. Which is good. Mon- no, or the, no, this is all good. Or the 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 Universal monsters, or some are saying uh, magic. The poster to magic, the trailer to magic, the Anthony Hopkins movie freaked them out, and that was their gateway mm-hmm. drug. Uh, Demon Knight, someone just mentioned uh, Nosferatu, the ghoul people under the stairs. Some have more modern ones. It's cool that there's there's a really cool, nice diversity here of, of stuff. What's yours, Dave? Gateway? Uh, uh, it was it was King Kong. That the was original the original or the, the 76? Yeah, the, 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 uh, actually, it was the 76. I saw that before I saw the original. Yeah. I saw it in, the, I saw it in a me theater. Me too. And it made such a huge impression on me. And <clears throat> that, yeah, that, that one. That P- one you know, sure. it's funny, Dave. People don't remember now, but that was a fucking huge event. It, 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 it was pre it was. Star Wars. John Berkey did the painting of King Kong straddling the World Trade Center. I, you know, I have that poster. The, 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 the fighter jets, which weren't in the movie. But, no. I mean, it was it was a huge... I, as I was nine when that movie came out. And it was the same year as Logan's Run. And for me, the one-two punch of Logan's Run and King Kong solidified my science fiction, fantasy, horror... I mean, it was those movies both were huge. They were in the back of every comic book. They were promoted all over the place. Oh, uh, they had board. They they had a board game. It had uh, record tie-ins. There was so much stuff with 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 the seventy six Kong that they did marketing wise. Oh yeah, and that was and that was the thing. And there's so much of it. It's so funny because as it as I think I was four when I saw it when it came out. which still makes me old, guys. So don't feel bad. I was um, nine, which makes me older. <laughs> but but I, I distinctly remember uh, even then at that age, like uh, Jessica Lang is the prettiest girl I've ever seen. Ever seen. Uh, uh, the music is really amazing, and John I, Barry's I, score. I, and 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 Kong is pretty cool. I, I and I, and there was probably like fifty percent of the, the innuendos and everything else that was going on in the story that I didn't get, but I, I didn't care. And it's <laughs> and, then, and Jeff Bridges stars. Yeah, but then but then what was and great? Charles that, Grodin. <laughs> but that led me to famous monsters and Godzilla, yeah. and then seeing the original King Kong and and stop motion stuff and everything else. So you know it's it's pretty you know that that stuff was for sure harry housen stuff when i when i saw i think uh i think sinbad and the eye of the tiger was the first harry housen thing that i actually saw in the you know when it came out and that one um so that definitely all that clash of the titans perfect 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 example of like here's a horror sequence that's absolutely brilliant is the medusa sequence in clash of the oh, titans oh yeah oh yeah that was it's 81 absolutely- yeah, absolutely amazing. By the way, our friend Alexander Wilson goes, go to sleep. It's almost 8 a.m. on the East Coast. You go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, my, my fate tomorrow is I'll do a Let's Get Physical Media, but I also have to finish building our, our wall. wall. Mother, can you help me? Mother, do you think they'll drop the bomb? Come on, that's, that's the wall. That's the whole point. We got it, Rob. Got I don't think it. you did. Rob, I don't think, I don't think Bill you Barclay did. says, Rob, here's one for you. I own this on Blu-ray, Rob. 
Killdozer by Theodore Sturgeon. Dude, okay. <laughs> I I saw I had Killdozer the Marvel comic book tie in. I I saw when it first aired. I fucking loved Killdozer. Do you have the Blu-ray? I don't. I never bought it. From Kino. Uh, I never bought it. Kino. I, you know, I should get it one day. I, that's one of those things I'll get, you know. Kill. Just to, just to, it's, you know. I, but, but Rob's was the Bermuda Depths, guys. Dude. And I remember watching that as a kid, too, and going, I don't know what the fuck is going on, but Bermuda Depths, with Burl Ives, big giant turtle, there's something going on here. Oh, let me just tell you that. <laughs> come on, it was like it was it was a it was a co-production with Toho. They'd done the last I mean, dinosaur in the Bermuda Depths. It's like this is the thing, guys. You wonder why I'm such a hacky filmmaker. I grew up on the Bermuda Depths and shit like this, and it's like I would have been happy making that. <laughs> you know, it was like come wait, on. wait, wait, wait. Hang on, the Hills Hornet's Red's not hacky. Oh, it's. Totally my name's on it. It's not fucking it's doctor. He hacks fucking, people. He literally hacks it's not, people. It's not hacky. It's, it's well there. done. It's, yeah. <laughs> Come on, dude. Don't be don't be fucking dissing your work. No. I'm not. I'm stand I, up I'm for it. Honest. Oh, Duel. Duel's a great another super scary movie too. Yeah, I mean that was. I mean Spielberg is his finest. Uh, uh, again. Oh, back in the, I mean the, the the pilot of of Night Gallery, the Roddy McDowell episode with Ozzy Davis and Roddy McDowell with the painting still fucking creeps me. By out. the way, for those of you who love Night Gallery, have you have you got in on the Kickstarter on the new hardcover book? I don't. I can't afford the book. Well, it's only one hundred and fifty dollars, Gate. I can What would you call me? Dave, oh, it's only 150 uh, yeah. bucks. Dave. I can't afford that. That's too expensive. <laughs> uh, well, it uh, it's out there. I mean, it's you can get the you can get it, Dave. You can you can you can make it happen. But no, that book that book is fucking beautiful, dude. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I don't know if the I'm Kickstarter's still running. I'm surprised no one mentioned um, my gateway. Which was uh, Salem's Lot. Oh my God! The, the miniseries. Mark, open the yeah. window. Oh man, that shit was so fucking good. Yeah, it was so. It, it, it was. You know, you know what's really sad? I don't know if you followed it. They they've been remake. They they've been making a Salem's Lot feature yeah. that has been like delayed indefinitely. The guy. With the guy from uh, Top Gun Maverick as the as a lead as the yeah, actor. and and Bill they, Pullman's kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but yeah. But, but but that it's That's such a, a it's such a bummer. I saw the trailer at CinemaCon. Really? Uh, of yeah, what? Of, of Salem's Lot. They showed and it, and they're the last shot of the, it, the and is can you confirm? Is Sadler uh, Barlow or Breaker or Straker? I don't know. But he's in it. Yeah. He's one of them. Yep. Yep. He's not Barlow. But, but that fucking original miniseries, Toby Ober, brilliant. Well, that was, that was James's gateway. Oh. Uh, it was, I'll tell you, the, I, I, I was bummed out because there's a fucking, in the trailer for the, did that trailer never come out? It's was never it never no because they they've undated they've undated the movie right but now. we saw they showed it at CinemaCon yeah well I wasn't so, there no I know but I'm just saying the final shot in the trailer was awesome and it was it was so you're in the town like the 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 cameras panning around and and you see nothing like nothing on the street and the main character is like walking and then he comes out on the street and it's like one shot and the entire street is filled with the, all the townspeople are vampires. And it's just this, it was awesome. Cool. It was so good. And the guy who wrote and directed, I think he wrote it. Well, it's, uh, yeah. no, no, he didn't direct it. He wrote, no, he Gary, wrote it. Uh, he, he directed the third Annabelle movie. Gary oh. Dumb, Dumbardum. Or I, well, I, I, and I the problem, the problem is uh, it was apparently uh, the movie is not good. And, oh. and that's why they delayed it. They, they, they oh, they were not right. happy. As a matter of fact, I spoke with one of the producers. I and think that's a James production too. I think yeah, it's a, Wan, a James Wan production as well. Yeah, and that's why they. I mean, here. I mean, here's here's the thing. 
And and God bless anybody that can get to direct a film. God bless anyone. But he's already directed a movie that made a lot of money. With yeah, the but, third but, Annabelle movie. I mean, but I'm just here, saying. Here's here's the problem. Whether or not people are capable and talented enough to command a large here's it used to be that filmmakers would cut their teeth and make two, three, four. John Carpenter oh, yeah, yeah. made three independent m- movies well, well, before he did a four million dollar well, movie like Escape from New York. Nowadays, well, you do one movie and someone throws a hundred. They throw a hundred million dollars at you. He did. He did a TV movie also before he directed Escape from New York, and then he also did a a, a long form movie, a mini a two parter miniseries with Elvis. So he li- before he'd done Escape from New York, he had done five features we okay yes the the point well being, dark star no dark star assault in precinct 13 halloween uh someone's watching me elvis the I, fog and then so the escape from so he'd done six he but two of those are tv six. movies but yeah but they were feature length yeah and, yeah, and yeah. Elv- elvis was even longer Yes, but but the uh, okay, but the point is is that he cut his teeth making a lot of movies. Nowadays, yes, someone makes an independent movie like Colin Trevorrow, Safety Not Guaranteed for a million bucks, and his next movie is Jurassic World. I got and, a story on that, but I don't know if I should tell it publicly. <laughs> well, you Probably. should. You absolutely should. Okay, so the rumor is this. He he directed the movie, but didn't direct the movie. Some, you mean safety not guaranteed? Yes. Mm. Uh, someone else, because I'll just say this. That filmmaker's sentimentalities is very evident in that film and his projects following. And the word on the street is he actually directed the movie because Colin didn't know what he was doing. And then Colin gave a great pitch for Jurassic World, and then that's how he got Jura- the Jurassic World franchise. Like he gave a pitch that it, he was just in top form when he pitched it to yeah. the Universal execs. Dave, you guys continue. I'm hearing a dog barking. I'll be back. Hold on. Well, are you sure? It is quarter to five. Yeah, we'll finish in five minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> One thing, Dave, too, that John, you bring up John Carpenter quite a bit. The thing with Escape from New York, a lot of people don't realize is that movie flipped with regard to Union. Like a lot of the people that worked on that movie weren't in the Union yet. And then when they did Escape from New York, it flipped. And then almost all those people became yeah, Union yeah, after right illustrating even more how independent carpenter yeah. was yeah at the time but again you know it was like ah well we're doing this small and we're doing it out of california you know away from california because they didn't shoot escape from new york here yeah. um they saw it in st louis i think missouri possibly because there was a whole burnt out it section is. of the city yeah st louis um, yeah up. so uh so they were there doing that but uh, yeah i mean i think they were all happy that uh, i think at that time they were all happy they went <laughs> it was like hey medical benefits and residuals and shit holy cow yeah um but still it's amazing when you think about it, like you know uh doing that movie for four million bucks it's it's kind of amazing like you know they did the fog for like two million dollars. Exactly. You know. Uh and someone Mango Badger just said, got the fog on 4K. It looks great. It the transfer is pretty amazing. Uh on that. Uh yeah. Tomb of Dracula, isn't there a remake of Maniac Cop? Uh Nicholas Win what, what's his name? Nicholas Win uh, the guy at Refn, Nicholas Nicholas oh. Refn. Yeah who did uh, Drive was supposed to produce a TV thing of Manhattan Cop and nothing's ever happened to it. 
Um, and I just, you know, I, I don't think it would be anything like what Maniac Cop was. So yeah. Maniac Cop actually is a pretty fun little series that much due to uh, Larry Cohen's uh, writing on that series. I think it was a, uh, for what it was, it's a uh, Maniac Cop is, is fun. Yeah. By the way, I, I don't know. Have you guys, you guys know who Grant Morrison is, the comic writer? Yeah. Uh, so he had his first novel published. Yeah. It's called uh, L- Luda. 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 Uh, I'm a big Grant did, Morrison fan. I didn't know that it was his first novel. I, yeah. I've seen, I've looked at it. I've looked at it and thought about getting it maybe on Audible or something like that. What the fuck? I like listening to when I'm walking my five miles a day, Rob. I like to listen to books. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's still reading. I still read. Okay, you know, it's okay. You can read. Building, some of us aren't building a defensive wall to keep people out. Neither am I. Just saying. <laughs> I mean, I, I pretty cool. I mean, it's about no, a, it's about a, it's about cool. a drag queen. Cool. It's it looks pretty fucking good. Oh, that's why Rob got it. It's all the... I got because it, it was Grant Morrison. I don't care what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Come on, dude. It's a, it's a plus I got Cormac it's McCarthy's new book too. Yeah, yeah. How is it? I don't know. I just I literally just got it. It's right. I took well, a picture. Yeah, maybe if you weren't here for seven hours, you could have read it by now. <laughs> okay you give me a hard time god Don't i always yeah you do god damn it well look you know we that's got we got nine we're that's gonna what... we're gonna call this at five oh, but oh, i want to thank james i want to thank everyone you know for everyone for being on Every- this show everyone everyone <laughs> that's my gary oldman professional Dude. voice you're How many people do you want? Garage, you ain't gonna wake anyone up. Well, yeah, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> True. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm actually in a different. Like the dogs might hear me with my supersonic, you know, bellowing voice, but I wouldn't do that to them. Yeah. No. But, um, no, no. Dave, no. one day you've never even been here. You guys should come here one day. I know it's such a long drive. We're it's LA. Not that long. I know. Um, Hey guys, also I'm gonna give you a couple tips. If you really like, uh, there's 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 a few things, uh, a couple titles I want to mention, Rob, that that have become sort of my my go tos uh, right. for the Halloween season to watch. Uh, one of them is on Peacock right now, and I think it's also on Tubi if you want to see it for free. Uh, it is a documentary called The American Scream. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is about home haunters, guys who make their own little haunted mazes and stuff at their house for trick-or-treating. It's uh, very fun, funny, charming, and heartfelt. It's got a lot of heart. It's really great. We have a member of the post-geek singularity, Bob (coughs) Kowal, Uh who uh, he does it. I mean, he builds gigantic... If you go to the uh, Facebook page, Bob Kowal, I think it's K-O-W-A-L-L. or A- Every year he builds gigantic, his entire house is engulfed. I mean, he builds awesome. creatures. Go to his Facebook page, tell him I sent you. And every year it's a different theme. And he works on it for a whole year. It's uh, that's what this documentary is kind of about. It's really, it's really charming. It's really good. It came in a couple of years ago. It was from the guys who did um, best worst movie about Troll Two. Um, so that's very good. Um, another one which I believe is on Shutter now is it's not as great, but there's greatness in it. It's called the WNUF Halloween Special. Oh yeah, and it is—it's a lot of fun. It really—I mean, even if you have it on, just sometimes. What is, what is that? Things, what is it? It is a fake <clears throat> broadcast from the early '80s from a local television station doing a Halloween show, and their local reporter going to a haunted house and and with with psychics and camera people and stuff like that (laughs) and it's intermixed with a lot of local commercials 
and that's really that's really cool too. Wow, is that new? Was that made like recently? No, that was made about five, six years ago. They've actually now just finished and done a spiritual sort of sequel to it hmm. that is is um, sort of available now. I think through their site. I don't know exactly what their site is though, guys. So sorry, but the WNUF Halloween special. Um, it's similar in, in a way, but a little goofier. But uh, to Ghost Watch, that 1992 yeah. British uh, TV broadcast that the BBC did that freaked a lot of people out, which is also really great. Uh, by the way, we have more super chats, believe it or not. Thank Holy you. Cow. Holy cow. Anthony, Anthony sends in a super chat and says, Rob, it was the howling for me as a child. That is truly an underrated horror and werewolf film. The best. It also has Elizabeth. Was it Elizabeth Banks? Banks. No. Elizabeth yeah. Banks. Uh, oh no, my uh, God! Is it Elizabeth? It's not oh, Elizabeth Banks. Oh, Elizabeth no. Barrage. Uh, no, it's Elizabeth. Um, oh, wait, hold on. I'll get this. Elizabeth get Banks. This you know, my, I, me too. Uh, it's Elizabeth. Oh my it, God! It's a. It's with a B. Elizabeth. Wow. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, wow. That was her name. What was <laughs> her name? Elizabeth. Wow. Uh, hold on, I, I'm getting, uh, and she unfortunately no. passed away early from cancer. She did, yeah, yeah. It's not Elizabeth Barrage, Elizabeth Banks. She played Marsha. Uh, anyway, she, she was amazing. Marcia. The Howling uh, Robotine did the effects. Elizabeth Robert Brooks. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Brooks. Brooks. Oh, oh my God! She was the sexiest thing. I, I she she Dude. almost she basically topped Jessica Lange. I wish she topped me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, Anthony says uh, that uh, I love the howling. Let me give you a piece of my mind, and he pulls out the bullet. Eddie, Qu Eddie Quist. Eddie Quist. So good. Robert Picardo, the great Rob Bottin, doing effects. Come out. Came out the same year as American Werewolf, nineteen eighty one. Yes. The other. The other great werewolf yeah. movie. Both. Both now on four K. And, and, and yeah. And Dee Wallace, who was uh, E.T.'s mom. I mean, uh, <laughs> and, her, and her and her husband and her, and her husband at the time, Chris Stone. Chris Stone. Uh, Alexander Wilson. And 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 uh, uh, the. Who, the guy who became a director uh directed adam sandler movies dennis duggan oh yeah Den dugan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Dugan. yep dennis yep dugan. yep yep didn't he make problem child he did <laughs> yeah oh my god uh alexander wilson who who in his previous super chat told us to go to sleep says <clears throat> my high if school you just said it like fucking Sam Jackson, go the fuck to sleep. We might have listened to you. Well, no, I'll, no, I wouldn't say that. <clears throat> but this is distressing. You should have said it. To this us. is distressing. No, listen to this, guys. Alexander Wilson says my high school was playing LeBron's LeBron James's son's high school yesterday, and there was a fight in the stands, and guns were drawn. Pure madness, running for the exits. It was like a horror movie for a kids game. No, it's worse. It's worse. I mean, here's what I don't. Here's what what what. How the fuck do how the fuck do you? Uh, I mean, that's the sad part. Schools need metal detectors. How do fucking guns get in? But 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 the the fact that we now live in a world and I I blame I blame a lot of things, but the idea that that we have kids today that don't see the ramifications of their actions and like you can carry a gun, but no one is thinking that, can you imagine when you take a life? The, no, how it, can't. no, they can't. And how it reverberates. I can't, I, I can't ima imagine, excuse me, what it is like to take a life. <clears throat> All the people that, that uh, but, but they don't think about that. I mean, the actual, the actual reality. I mean, we live in a world we, you know, it's funny. There was a, I love to live and die in LA. And um, when Dave, when you and I did Valley Girl with uh, uh, Greg Carson, they asked after after I did Usual Suspects, we did Usual Suspects, and our, our yours and my work for the first time in 21 years is available on disc as of this week on the Usual Suspects. But because of what we did, you know, they offered us uh, other projects. We got to yeah. do Valley Girl, and the other one I asked for was. To live and die in L.A. 
And right. the reason we didn't get that was because Bud Smith, the editor of the film, had made a, a, a documentary called Counterfeit World, The Making of To Live, to Live and Die in L.A. And um, we live in I, – I didn't know what that meant. When I watched that documentary when the movie came out on, on uh, DVD – I didn't know what counterfeit world meant. What does it mean to live in a counterfeit world? We live there now. We live there where 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 the ramifications of people's actions are they they're not real anymore. You know, even even people like when you when you pull a gun at a high school sporting event it's not real. It's it's you. You're living in some fucking movie or TV narrative or or whatever, and the real life ramifications of what you're actually doing are lost on you because the world now figures well if I can put it on TikTok or shoot something or whatever it doesn't matter, <clears throat> and uh, it's it it's very scary and frustrating, and. Um, you know, to read like some kids pull guns at a high school game. I mean, to to what to to front somebody? You want to you want to what what are people looking to do? It's the same thing in Ukraine. You've got we were talking about this earlier before you got here. It freaks me out that that city blocks are being leveled in in a in a city where all, the people are just trying to live their lives, and you have politics being played in boardrooms or whatever and uh now an entire country the folly of one man's military action has become something where entire families in his own country are being ripped apart when men are being conscripted to go fight a war that should never be they don't even have the weapons to fight it and we live in that world now and the question is why why do we live in this world and I feel that 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 uh, between no one has their nose to the grindstone anymore. No one is going. What do we need to do to live our lives on a daily basis? How do people get food? How do people get shelter? How do people get education? All of that has been lost. We're we're now living in a counterfeit world, where where everything is unreal around us. All the important things we've been bamboozled to forget that what matters is sustenance and how do you make a good life for you and your family. I don't know, but we're not doing it. We are failing. Our planet is failing us and we're failing our planet. And uh, it's really weird not to bum anyone out, but... I mean, I think that's a a good message to to lead people on, and yeah. uh, and 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 very true to a lot of points. It's uh, it, but the thing is, you know, it's tough because you can't definitively answer any of these questions of why. Why are people doing this? Why are people doing that? No, we it, don't know. We we don't exactly know. Um, it it is but, frustrating, but, however, where <laughs> we we can talk about the things that we love. You know, like it's weird because there is su there's always been suffering in the world. But the fact is we live in a place where what we're talking about, that doesn't mean we should stop talking about entertainment. No, we should stop talking is, about storytelling. We should never stop talking about art. Despite no, the I fact the that, world's going to hell in a handbasket, we should never stop talking about what's good in the world because we have to do that too. And I think the thing is, and I didn't mean to interrupt, and I apologize. No, 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 no. Why no. well, you were trying to make your point? Um, I think the thing is too, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe I come off incredibly naive, and that's fine too. But I think if people concentrated on 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 celebrating the things that they actually loved instead of wanting to be celebrated, that we would be all better off. I agree. I mean, the fact I mean, is, I, I know, so many people they want to be the stars, and that's why people do nowadays. That's why people do the crazy shit. Oh, we're caught on the phone, or we're doing this, or we're doing this for, we're doing this for, for a, a click on a heart symbol. 
I mean, well, <clears throat> like, yeah. why don't you concentrate on the things that you love and see what happens and what nurtures from that instead of wanting to be celebrated or or publicly loved and just see what happens, you know? And that's the thing, you know, uh, you know, I think, and I think a lot of ways, I think the draw to watching scary movies and these, you know, and horror and these things is because there is so much real horror in the world. Oh uh, yeah, I agree. You know, and we need an escape and we don't have to have everything be, uh, shoved down our throat or thrown in our face in the entertainment sense it should be and I, I you know that's the thing it should be entertaining get thrilled be be scared all of this you know in a, in a safe space get some of this get some of this fucking you know angst and you know anger out of you cathartically by watching something scary well that's i think that's the whole point of horror entertainment the problem is i i think we now live in a time when the confluence, I mean, and, and by the way, this is not the worst period of time in human history. There's a lot of great stuff happening now. I mean, look, I mean, uh, civilized really ways, we're, we're not gathering, we, we have not regressed back to the point where we're gathering around in coliseums to watch people be killed by animals and each other. We're not there. We haven't regressed that. That's much. what video games are for. So we we are you know still in the the highest of, of of I mean because humans are savage, but we've at least gotten to this point where we're not as bad as we used to be. I mean, but we're on, worse. In the, we're, in, we're, the, in the old west, you know, look at someone wrong, you get shot. I mean, you could hear, but you have to like go look for it more. Where literally, you just be you know. You deal a wrong hand, you get shot. Look, I, I think what's really look, my last point of 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 the night is I really think that he, that we have become very especially in America, very complacent and lazy. And we've figured out ways to make our politics justify our laziness. You know, we're 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 like oh, I want to be this or I want to be that. Call me this, call me that. The, y you've obfuscated the actual what's really going on and made it seem. Look, here's the thing: life's fucking hard. You have to work hard, and um, no one gives a fuck ultimately about your identity or how you feel about yourself. They don't care. At the end of the day. What are you doing to contribute to the world around you? Don't ask what the world around you should contribute to you. We've all turned into a bunch of narcissists that are like, well, I want you call me this. I mean, I get it. I want people to be happy and feel the way they want to feel and, and, and feel loved and, and, and cherished for who they are. But you know what? That's a luxury. And you have to earn it. And, I mean, and, you, and our world, man, all of, all of the comfort of life, and that includes being called whatever you want to be called. You know, the idea that you can ask, that is a fucking luxury. And until we understand all the entertainment we have, it's all a, it's a luxury item. When and you it, think, when you think about the world where, you know, women who don't cover their faces are getting murdered. Yeah. And, and we in America are completely, 65% of our population doesn't even have passports. We right. live in a world where we are so detached from reality. That's why we're so far up our own asses that we all have to start asking ourselves, where are we? What are we doing? Why do we want to do it? And how can we help others? And um, it's it's a tough place to be. And, and by the way, we are going to, but it, it, it's going to come. I mean, I can't wait to see what's going to happen when the draft gets reinstated. And at some point it will. And watch the entire youth of America implode. Right. TikTok will not save you. You've been conscripted into the military. 
Now that's horrifying. No, it's not. It'll teach you some goddamn on, discipline Rob, that, that you don't a, have. Rob, I just set up like, and on that note. But on no, the, okay, we're going. We're going. You had to do, you had to do that. James, guys, Dave, it's time to go to bed. I got to get guys. up and be with Dieter Bastion. Thanks, By Rob. the way, um, hang on a second. Alexander Wilson goes on to say, they look like adults, and the games for today were canceled, and the promoter has to refund five thousand dollars worth of tickets. It's oh ridiculous. God. I don't know what he's talking about. No, he's talking about the fight in the stands. The fight in the oh, like okay. we we now we are living in the wild west where people are are like it's amazing to me that if you look at every single school shooting, the last fifteen school shootings, they all used AR fifteens. We're still taking our fucking shoes off because one guy tried to use a match to light his shoe bomb 20 years ago. And AR-15s have killed hundreds of people, and we still have them. Whatever, man. We should all stage a protest. No one takes off their shoes at TSA until AR-15s are banned. But we won't do it. It's fine. Great. Keep your guns. It's great. Why do I have to take my shoes off? I'm a good stealth traveler. I'm always ready to go. No one has to move my seat. When I show up at the airport, I'm fucking a superhero. And yet, I still have to take my shoes off. Because some douchebag 20 years ago was an idiot. And yet, I can still buy an air. There's a gun show in town here. On November 15th. Right here. I can go buy an AR-15. <laughs> I mean, no one's going to stop me, but wow, crazy. You, you, you know, let's stop people. Anyway, mm. Halloween, dude. That's what Happy Halloween's Halloween, all about. Folks. All, right. all right. James, I'm first of all, scared. I'll give you, yeah. tell I'm us, scared. tell, give the world, say goodbye to everybody. Tell everybody what horror movie they should watch tomorrow or today. If you go to theater, go see Smile. If um, you have Tubi, watch Peeping Tom. 1960. Hey, oh my God! Prow, Powell nice. and Pressburger. No, By the Powell. way, just Michael Powell. Michael Powell, yes, but Michael Powell is—it's uh, great. Yeah, it is. I have a giant poster for that movie. It, it's kind of relevant today, if you think about it. Oh my God, it's so relevant, Dave. Yes. You do. Yes. What should people watch? Give them, a, give them a final, uh, final say. Really? Watch Werewolf by Night. Watch my giant size man thing, man. Come on. Okay. Come on. There is nothing else. There is just Ted. There is just Ted. Uh, I would say, look, everybody dip into Netflix, dip into the cabinet of curiosities. The fact that Guillermo del Toro, you know, the man who made The Shape of Water, an Academy Award winning director, he uses his powers to get other directors' jobs to make something like Cabinet of Curiosities. Um, it doesn't all work. It's not all perfect, but it's so much fun. And it's so great to see a filmmaker using his power to get other filmmakers to make really cool shit. So watch that. Watch Cabinet of Curiosities on Netflix. Watch whatever gives you the Halloween happies. That's right. The Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. It's always good. It's it always is. Good. Maybe Lucy's you know right. Especially if your parents and stuff like that. Go have fun with your kids. That's what Halloween's really about. Watching them. I yes, I agree. And show them something scary and make them sleep in the dark. They yeah. have to learn sometime. That's the true. world is a make them watch a Night of the Living Dead and tell them, yes, kids, they really are coming to get you. Now sleep in the dark. And then wash it down with a little phantasm. To oh, really fuck there you up. go. It's true. Uh, Rob, Nor I want to thank you. No, wait. Norwegian Kryptonian oh. has been a member of the channel. Says, strangers passing in the street by chance. Two separate glances meet. I am you, and what I see is me. Okay. Mm. Love that. Deep. Thank you. Uh, it's time to go, gentlemen. Rob, I want to thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Again. Dave. Thanks for coming back so and jumping on. Awesome to be here. And this year, uh, way more uh, together and than last year. That was good. I feel the love. Mr. Wallace. 
<laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for uh, Thanks, chilling man. out. James, great to meet you. Nice to meet you, Dave. Um, really, a really pleasure spending spending this time with you here. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed it. I want to thank uh, everybody that's watching this. There's still 198 people here. I want to thank all of <laughs> you for being awesome. here. Uh, Tom Jr. Jackson, our great moderator. I mean, he's still here. It's got to be. It's 8:14 in the morning for him. So, Tom, yeah, thank you. You know, you toast a bagel, you're good. Yeah, well, yeah, you get some sleep. Norwegian right. Kryptonian says echoes Pink Floyd. <laughs> wow. Yes, I, I'm probably demonetized no, for e singing no, the wall. No, X hoes Pink Floyd. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Okay, X X. You're right. Maybe uh, X host. You're right. There. Well, he might have X and C are right next to each other on the keyboard. He might. I have like to think when it is about you, it's about X host. What are you saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, me personally being an X ho or the people I dated. I mean, is there any question? Yes. yes <laughs> to you, all right, to, gentlemen. To everyone else. Gentlemen, Guys, it's time for the show Halloween. to go. Happy Halloween. Celebrate with style. Go out there. Have fun. This was uh, Rob Observations episode 200 and remember, and or 813. In, and remember, if you're in Utah, November 1st, my short film Creek plays at the Film Quest Film Festival in Provo, Utah, uh, November 1st. I think you do very well there. Puppet Master Dr. Death, Full Moon Streaming, and and, uh, and, and the Hills uh, Run Red, and, available from Screen and, Factory, and, 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 and Hills Run Red, available on Screen Factory, and uh, November 4th, Chaosium, The Third Eye, coming out, available on all platforms, check it out. There is my little medal, and, and there is my little medal for the, for the night, man. James, where can people find you on social media, and what are you doing? Oh, looking for work at the moment, or waiting on a gig to happen. Uh, social media, you can find me, find my channel on YouTube. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram and uh, Facebook on the Post Geek Singularity. Under what name, James, James Wallace, or what? James Wallace on um, on uh, yeah on YouTube James Wallace and then uh, James Wallace twenty four on uh, Instagram and James Wallace on Facebook. So, right. All right, I am Robert Thanks, Meyer Burnett. This is uh, Rob Observations episode uh, eight hundred and thirteen. Thanks for uh, this is a great hybrid episode. There you go. I want to thank everybody who generously supports this channel via super chats, tips, and memberships. Uh, we will have a number, another member chat next weekend. And They've remember, been a lot of fun. The topics you come up with them. <laughs> well, yeah, the membership chats. Yes, it's true. Um, and all that, and all that, <clears throat> I would say thank all of you and. Um, I might be back later today. Dieter Bastian and I will have Let's Get Physical Media tomorrow or today. Actually, not just today. And it's going to be today in uh, hours. five hours or something. That's going to Rob be will well. be raring to go. I, I'm always raring to go. You can't do the time. You can't do the crime. Whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> something. I'll be here. Come He'll on. I'm wearing Zephyrus. the same I, shirt. No, I will not. I'll always glasses. wear a different shirt. Same well, shirt, probably the same, same glasses. glasses. Yeah, different I shirt, babe. Wearing, different shirt. Wearing Come on, the same shirt. Come on, guys. What do you want? I'm five not going to be wearing the same shirt. I, I, I'm saying five bucks. He's wearing the same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, happy Halloween. happy Halloween. It's only the thirtieth. That's tomorrow. There's a whole. There's there's days to come before Halloween. A day, gents. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right. 